open this public hearing. I have a couple things to say at the beginning. Um, so this is a public hearing on bylaws, oh, sorry. <laughs> 11, 2020, 12, 2020, and 13, 2020, the Oakmont Area Structure Plan and Land Use Bylaw Amendments, the second and third reading. So before we get into it, I want to make sure that today, given, given the intense amount of public interest, I wanna make sure that this goes very smooth by the book, no deviations today, because this, um, there's a lot of uh, passion on both sides of this argument. So. Uh, before I start, does any councillor wish to declare uh, pecuniary interest or conflict of interest with respect to this public hearing? I'll give you guys a couple of secs if you want to chime in. Seeing none. Okay, we're going to um, follow the public hearing um, process set out in the procedure bylaw. First, we're going to hear from administration, and then we will take uh, questions of administration. Then we'll go to the applicant and uh, he's allowed 10 minutes and we'll take, then we will proceed with questions of the applicant and then we will go to the public. Uh, I sent you guys an email um, to, to just to clarify and I didn't hear any objections. So we will hold off all questions of the public just like we do administration and applicant to the end. And then we can ask as many questions as we want. And then as per any other public hearing, we will go back to um, administration, if you have further questions, we will exhaust all your curious questions until you are satisfied that you can um, vote to close a public hearing and move on to the second and third rate. So that's kind of how it's going to be. Um, we, right now we have, um, we have 16 panelists. So that's the people you can see on the screen and plus some administration. And right now I see that we have 45 attendees. I think if you click on the panelists button, you guys can see that as well. If you click on participants, you can see the top panelists and attendees. So the attendees are the public and they can hear us. That's correct, Tamara? Okay, so, so they can hear what we're saying. They just can't, uh, they're not part of the conversation yet. So uh, Lej is going to be admitting um, one speaker and the next one on deck, they're changing them from an attendee to a panelist, so they'll be in, in with us. While they're a, a panelist, they can see everything in the chat. So uh, I would refrain from using the chat function if, unless it's absolutely necessary. And um, let's see, what else do I have? Uh, when we get to the public, I'm going to go through a, a couple more uh, rules. Uh, we're going to take a break at around 10.30, I think. I'm just going to schedule these in now so you guys can kind of know. 10.30, we'll take a 10-minute uh, health break. Um, is a half an hour lunch okay for everybody at noon? Or would you like a little bit longer? Okay, so we'll take a, right at noon, we'll take a half an hour lunch break. And then depending how this goes, uh, 2 o'clock, we'll take another 10-minute health break. There are 72, although I've crossed up two speakers, so that we have quite a few hours in front of us of public hearing. So uh, let's just take it slow. And I'm going to stick to the rules. When I, when I get to the public, I will explain to them. But if, for those who are listening now, um, the applicant gets 10 minutes, the public gets five. Uh, Ledge Services is going to ring a little bell at four minutes and 30 seconds. And then uh, the mic will be muted at five minutes. And I, I just really cannot um, go outside of that guideline because with all these speakers, first of all, it would take too long and it would, um, it would be considered unfair. Some people got more than five and others didn't. So it will be a five minute deadline. All right, so that's kind of the order that we're gonna to go to today. Um, Okay, so I think we're going to go straight now to Suzanne, who's been working very hard on this file. Thank you for that. And see the presentation from administration, and then we'll have questions. So go ahead, Suzanne. Madam Mayor, do we have to do the, uh, the agenda adoption? Oh, totally bypass that. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. I did open the public hearing, but let's actually do it, do that, and then we will, uh, I'll open the public hearing again. So calling the meeting to order for June 22nd, 2020. This is the first time we've ever had an entire council meeting dedicated to a public hearing. So it's kind of interesting and new. Uh, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Councilor Mackay. 
Oh, well, yeah, that the uh, June 22nd, 2020 agenda be adopted as presented. Thank you. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Uh, and then presentations, delegations, and announcements. Of course, that this is um, a public hearing, so that will be part of the public hearing. So I'm going to officially open the public hearing on these three bylaws, and now we can go to Suzanne. Everyone can see the PowerPoint okay? We sure can. Perfect. So good morning, Council. I am Suzanne Bennett. I am a planner with the Planning and Development Branch at St. Albert. This public hearing and presentation is for the application to amend the Oakmont Area Structure Plan and Land Use Bylaw. The subject site is located in the Oakmont neighborhood and encompasses 230 and 250 Belrose Drive and 300 Orchard Court. The amendment site is located east of Botanica Development on Belrose Drive, north of the Sturgeon River and locally is known as the site of the former Holes Greenhouses. For the Municipal Government Act, every landowner does have the right to apply to council for changes to regulations governing their land. The public hearing is a vital component of this process. Today's public hearing enables the public to provide input and participation regarding the application prior to council's debate and decision. The proponent's application includes the following amendments an area structure plan redesignation, land use bylaw redistricting, changes to the direct control mixed use district, which includes the addition of a new height schedule. To start with the Oakland area structure plan application, currently 230 and 250 Bell Road are designated for future commute commercial development. 300 Orchard Court is currently designated as low density residential development. The applicant is proposing to redesignate the future land use of all three lots for mixed use development. This proposal would increase the overall density of the Oakland neighborhood from approximately 21 dwelling units per hectare to 26 dwelling units per hectare. The applicant is proposing several changes to the land use bylaw regulations with this application. The applicant is proposing to redistrict the land use on the site from direct control to direct control mixed use district. This amendment from DC to DC of you would change the land uses needed to operate a greenhouse and farmstead to land uses that enable a mixture of commercial, institutional, and medium to high density residential development. In addition to redistricting the property to the DCMU district, the applicant is also requesting changes to the district regulations. These changes include reducing the commercial floor area ratio to 5% from 25, setting a maximum floor plate at 830 square meters, increasing the allowable building heights from 25 meters to 100 meters, incorporating a maximum building podium height of 25 meters and incorporating a minimum separation distance of 25 meters between the buildings. <clears throat> the applicant is proposing changes to the heights within the DCMU district by adding a height schedule. As seen on this diagram on your screen, the proposed maximum heights would range from 10 meters to 100 meters. <clears throat> Currently, the maximum height within the DCMU district is 25 meters. Brandon Park Village, located within the downtown, also has a height schedule specific to that site, which was approved by council. The maximum height in the Brandon Park Village development is 80 meters. If the proposed heights in this schedule are deemed appropriate by council, then the height schedule will be added to Schedule F of the land use bylaw. To ensure adequate public engagement, the applicant hosted two open houses. Members of the public who attended these events, along with people within 100 meters of the proposed development, were informed of the application and of the public hearing. In response to feedback from administration and from the public, the applicant made the following changes to the proposal. They reduced the building height from 45 meters to 40 meters for the building located nearest to Orchard Court, relocated a tower from the northern edge of the property to the center of the development, incorporated traffic intersection improvements formulated to relieve stress on the road system and identified construction phases to mitigate trades parking challenges. As part of major area structure plan amendments, a fiscal impact assessment is required. The FIA looks at the life cycle costs and tax generation to evaluate long-term financial impact to the city. This development does have a large capital investment, and at full build-out, the development is expected to generate $1.9 million per tax 
per year in net tax revenue. Based upon the findings of the FIA, this development provides an overall financial net benefit to the city when weighing the overall operational and capital expenditures to tax revenue. Based upon circulation comments from the engineering department, this development will result in intersection improvements at Boudreaux Road and Balmer Drive to support the additional traffic and maintain an acceptable level of service. This intersection of Boudreaux Road and Balmer Drive is near or at capacity during peak hours and these improvements will be cost shared between the city and the developer. And that arrangement will be done at time of development permit or subdivision through a development agreement. These improvements are necessary to improve, or sorry, to enable the proposed development. So if approved, it would require other city transportation projects to be reprioritized to accommodate this construction. From a planning perspective, administration is concerned that the height and height transition are not adequate or sensitive to the surrounding developments. The concern is that the height of the buildings is out of context for the proposed location within St. Albert. Uh, as well as concerns that the proposed height transition between low density houses in Northwood Court and the development is not adequate. The recommendation from administration is that we support uh, bylaw 11 slash 2020 to be approved to allow for mixed use within the Oakmont neighborhood. And that bylaw 12 slash 2020 be approved to redesignate the site to direct control mixed use. However, based on the height and transition concerns expressed, planning administration does not support the adoption of bylaw 13 2020, which contains text amendments and the height schedule. Therefore, any motions for second or third reading are recommended to be defeated. However, administration would like to note that council does have the ability to edit any of the proposed bylaws, including the height schedule, as you see fit during deliberation. That concludes my presentation, and I will take questions from council. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, just real quick clarification, the, the height schedule, is it the fact that it's not in meters, but in stories? Is that, is that because the applicant wanted it? In, can you explain that one more time? Uh, why we're not supporting it? Yes. Uh, it's not the fact that it's, it's in one metric or another. It's okay. the actual heights of the buildings themselves that we're concerned about. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've got a lot of questions for admin, but I will, <laughs> I'll, I'll let council start. Maybe you have some of the same. Who wants to go first? All right. <laughs> I guess I will. Well, I'll go, Madam Mayor, if you want. Okay. To. Uh, mine, mine's quite quick. I just want to uh, fair, uh, free to go. Sorry, I, yeah, go I can't ahead, see. Yep. I can't see everybody in the presentation as well. Oh, so you know I what, apologize. Suzanne, if you stop sharing your screen, that will help everyone sure. see each other. Yeah, we might need um, to come back to it, but we'll see. Yeah, I was probably going to suggest that. Um, I just just for the benefit of myself, and I read the Oakmont Area Structure Plan, the original one. Yeah, can you do a synopsis of the history as to how the development uh, went from um, the original uh, area structure plan that also included the whole greenhouses and then moved into the existing development that's there now on 100 and 200 um, and, um, and then move into what's proposed between the differences between the DC and the DCMU. Yeah, and I don't need the full length because obviously, but just can you give me a little, Timeline, is that possible, Susan? So, yeah, a little bit. Um, try and get the years right if I can. Uh, so basically, this site was already being used for agriculture purposes by the whole family, I believe, at the time that these lands were incorporated into the city of St. Albert as it grew and expanded and added some more land. So at that time, it didn't really fit the zones that we had, so it was a direct control zone in order to continue that use that they already had on the property. And then when the Oakmont Area Structure Plan uh, was amended for the expansion, that was when those uh, commercial and low density designations were put in place. And I believe those were early 90s, like 1990, 1991. And you also asked about the di difference between DC and DCMU? Yes, if you, do, if you want to give a brief, and then I've got, just got a follow up question with just something you just said. Thanks, Suzanne. Sure. So the direct control district is not a district that has any listed, permitted, or discretionary uses within it. 
all uses are at the behalf of council. So any development permit within a direct control district would come to council and any regulations for building on that site would be set by council within the development permit itself. Whereas the direct control mixed use district does have a list of permitted and discretionary uses as well as development regulations that can be uh, set upon a development and approved by a development officer where any uses outside of that would come to council for approval on the development. Okay, so going back, um, I think it was 2009 when the uh, area structure plan was amended in relation to the new Botanica 1, Botanica 2, and the shops on Boudreaux. Is that correct? Or was it previous to that? What year did you say? Well, Botanica? I, I'm sorry, I don't entirely recall. 2009, Madam Mayor. It was, it was. It was after sure. that because I believe both Wes and I sat in that public hearings and we weren't elected to 10, but I even think, Sheena, were you part of that? Okay, so sometimes between 2010 and 2013. Okay, so I mean, so uh, the area structure plan was changed from commercial low residential to a direct control, is that correct? No, so the commercial and low density residential is in the area structure plan and those have not yet been changed for this site. The direct control district is in the land use bylaw. So that is the zoning. Okay. So um, in relation to some of the environmental impacts in relation to some of the um, um, floodplain concerns and all that, are they, uh, where, where does the one to 100 year floodplain go into that area? approximately does it uh, does it cross the uh, yeah, the path that's being built or is it anywhere near there or is it still just in the river valley do you have any the, kind of an idea the edge of the one 100 year floodplain is within the city's properties within the er and the okay it's not an mr but it's a park uh property that's next adjacent to it so it doesn't go on to the subject site okay are there any other um I think there's um, further down towards uh, 300 Orchard. Is there uh, an outfall or an outflow from uh, the community into the Sturgeon uh, River Basin? I believe it's between, there's a slight ravine between 300 Orchard Court and Orchard Court itself. I believe the outfall runs through there. Okay. And is that a pickup from... Um, further up into Oakmont and up into uh, even uh, Aaron Ridge? Is that where that, would that pick up in there or is there other ways of that kind of getting diverted down into the river basin? I was trying to find that earlier and I couldn't. The full extent of that, I think I would have to leave to yeah. engineering. I don't know how far it catches. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. That's all my questions for right now, Madam Mayor, but I might have some more later. Oh, for sure, yeah. Okay, I saw Councillor Hansen's hand uh, pop up. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, for your presentation. Uh, in terms of Bylaw 12, uh, the redistricting to DCMU from uh, DC, was there any conversation um, as you spoke to the applicant around a different kind of district? Uh, can you explain how you landed on DCMU? Uh, because it's very broad. I guess I'll just tell you why I'm asking the question. It's very broad. It looks like pretty much anything could go into it. Um, and if for some reason this plan didn't work out, um, do we leave ourselves open to uh, new or different kinds of um, retail or commercial that we, that we might not want to put there. So I guess I'm trying to understand why it's DCMU and, and not something a little stricter. Mainly because the intent of the proposal that was brought to us is to have a mixed use site where commercial and residential intermix and this zone is what has been applied for um, based on it being the closest um, for, I guess, their, their ideas of how they want to develop the site. Okay, so I did read through the land use bylaw quite a bit yesterday, and um, I noticed, you know, and I'm not a, uh, an expert, but like I mixed commercial came to mind because I think there is residential in there. It's just that it's not enough residential in the mixed commercial or yeah. any comments on that? Uh, not 
particularly. We brought what the applicant is applying for. So they must be height scheduled. We brought the application as it was asked for. Okay. So no other uh, districts were really talked about. No, we did not negotiate on districts. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Who's next? Councilor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> so what we're uh, dealing with here is, is not really this proposal, but the, the three bylaws today. So what you're suggesting is the DCMU goes. Uh, so if we were to suggest and pass what you have recommended, um, would it similarly be then to what Botanica is? Is that sort of where we're going with this recommendation? Because the, the applicant has an opportunity to, to build in our community. The question is, is what are we gonna allow them to build? So if, if we were to take your recommendations, would this be uh, providing the opportunities to build something similar to Botanica, same height, same sort of, mixed use development that is, is that the intent here? Yes, I think it's uh, bylaws 11 and 12 were passed, but bylaw 13, 2020 was not. You would see a similar development to Botanica and shops at Vigro. However, without the height schedule being passed or changed by council, then the height would of the DCMU district would stay at 25 meters maximum. Which is how many floors again? I think it's about eight. Fair enough. Quick math. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right. Um, I, so I'm going to, along those same line, lines, um, I've got the land use file in front of me and, and the, red, the red line version. There's, there's several sections that mentions uh, building height. So when we get to the applicant, uh, I'm going to be talking to them a little bit about what they would um, what they would accept. So where, if council wants to do some amendments today at second reading, and maybe this is information for later on when we get there, but where text-wise are we making amendments? Is it? Is it? I'm looking. If you at, wanted to change the heights within the schedule. Yeah. So I'm looking at C two talks about. Um, the podium height of 25 meters, you know, and then it would not be within the text of the DCMU district. Okay. I think it would be a motion just like for the cross hatching section of map two schedule as to be changed from such and such a height to however many meters. You okay. Count. So it's schedule F is, is, is what we would need to. Yes. Map okay. two of schedule F. So not, none of the text. Okay. Correct. All right. Uh, I saw Councilor McKay's hand go up again. Yeah, sorry, it was just in relation to the other question. And when I was commenting, and maybe Susanna, maybe Adrian has this, but going back to the original ASP in 1997, and where I was kind of talking about some of the existing uh, topographical features uh, of that particular part of the river, um, you know, we it, it's a fairly sensitive area. And I noted in the original ASP, that there was supposed to be significant filling done around what was river lot 35 river lot 36 um that's really going back that only west would be old enough to understand river lots um but it's um around being the um the act that uh, the number that 2.37 hectares area that that uh needed to be filled along the flood fringe zone do we know if that was ever done it was issued but it, I can't find out if it was ever completed. I'm honestly not familiar with that, that filling regulations. I don't know if it's done. I see Christina's hand up though. Yeah. Go ahead, Christina. Uh, yes. Um, sorry about that. Just tried to get my mute. Um, there was fill put in for the development of the Oakmont area structure plan and the Oakmont community, which occurred East of the site where we're talking mm -hmm. today. 
So it was in, it was filled in that area where so I mean River Lot 35 and River Lot 36 is pretty much in that area that's existing now as Botanica and then into Orchard Park. So was that so from a from um, um, the natural features was that fill completed then? Um, I don't know how much it was filled to be honest with you um, as it predated predates me, but I do know that there are um, quite a few houses in east of the um, subject site, which are on fill. I would, um, I would say, Christine, I can tell you for sure because my house is built on fill. And they are outside of the, um, they are outside the flood, um, floodway as described within the land use bylaw. So they have been engineered um, so that they can be accommodated um, and to deal with the potential flooding impacts. What about uh, slope? Um, you know, that area is um, a potentially higher up on the river bank. And um, where I, I know a number of slope studies were done or were referred to in our background material. Um, when you have fill and slope, is there a risk that um, you end up um, uh, having challenges with erosion or other, uh, you know, you put a lot of development into onto fill and then potentially that's unstable in, in my thinking. Is there any danger with um, what's being proposed in some of the slope and erosion factors? I think a lot of that would be detailed because we do have preliminary slope studies on the site, but also when they get to the point of development permit is when they yeah. do detailed engineering and look at how their foundations must be anchored. So a lot of what would happen if if uh, these bylaws were approved, um, then it would just go towards the development permit and that would all be technical studies, additional technical studies would occur after that, correct? Yes. Okay. And where most of that bank is environmental reserve, you would require that their structure does not affect that bank. All right, so potentially that could be either drilling down further to bedrock or moving further away from the river. Correct. Correct. Not that I'm an engineer by any means. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, I have a, and Christina, it's good you're here because you've been working on the new MDP. My, I appreciate the fact that you uh, took this um, these three bylaws and proposal and evaluated them against the EMRB growth plan and our current MDP and some parts conformed and some didn't. Did you, I don't know if it was even possible, did you have an opportunity to, to take this proposal and put it towards our new MDP? Which is not yet approved, but at least we know the direction that the, the city was potentially going to go. We did. Um, it is a bit tricky because council hasn't approved the M new MDP. So yeah. we, it was difficult for us to um, ask the applicant to conform with the new MDP. Yeah. Um, there are aspects again of this application that would conform with the proposed new MDP um, as currently drafted. And there are aspects that would be a little bit more challenging. The site is is just outside of the um, 800 meters from both LRT stations. Um, so if it was within the 800 meters, it would conform quite nicely with the direction of the new MDP, okay. uh, but it is just outside of that. And I, I think it's by a hundred meters or so. Okay. And I assume it, the, the non-conformance is again around the heights? The, the heights and the, the general densities, yeah. Okay, appreciate that. I know that was not an easy question, but thanks for... Uh, is there any, is Dean Schick or anyone from engineering available to answer a question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Hi Dean. So big, big concern um, from, from a lot of uh, the conversations I've had is traffic in the area. There are some proposed uh, changes to the to the intersection. My, I guess my first question to you is: If this development was not to proceed, if this bylaw were defeated today, any of their proposed intersection changes would also be gone. Like, is the city planning on any of these changes? 
regardless? Yeah, through through you, uh, Mayor Heron, yes, there are improvements. Uh, the city recognized the intersection of Boudreaux and Belrose as an operational um, re an intersection reaching capacity levels and reduced levels of service, as well as safety. Um, we started to see higher trends in collision occurrences in our recent network screening. And as such, we just completed in 2019 an in-service safety review that landed on recommendations for improvements. And of course, uh, in line with the TIA for the development, a lot of the operational concerns captured um, at the intersection were also linked with the safety assessment as well. So there are proposed amendments or sorry, improvements to the intersection related to a city-led program with or without this development. Okay, so the two that I could see really helping the current situation is um, putting a second left-hand turn lane in. Is that part of the improvements? I'm seeing a nod, but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm losing a little bit of internet here. Um, but uh, yeah, two, two main focuses exist on the safety side is the if we consider Bell Rose uh, for the sake of everyone running north south okay. uh, and Boudreau running east west. So if you can, for a landmark, uh, RCMP would be on the southeast corner of the intersection. Okay. So southbound, we're looking at whether a dual left um, would be viable in terms of operations as well as accommodating for you know matching the, the opposite left turn movements and what signal phasing would result and how it could be addressed in addition to that um, uh, the northbound right turn uh, we've seen a lot of rear end collisions uh, occurring on that side and so we're looking at a redesign to a, a smart channel that lesser degree angle turn and uh, maybe a dedicated right turn bay is being suggested there as well so those are the two main improvements that ultimately actually influence one another as well with that southbound dual left turning into then that northbound right lane uh, or where the right turns would be turning. We're looking at investigating before any final recommendations are designed or addressed. Okay, so essentially a double left um, coming down Belrose and turning left onto Boudreau. Correct, correct. And the right hand, is that turning off of Boudreau onto Belrose? No, the right turn, both both movements are on Belrose turning on to Boudreaux. Okay. So yeah. southbound, and both actually making that turn to go from Belrose to the eastbound uh, direction towards Sturgeon Road. Okay, all right. But no um, plans if this development does not go through to extend the left-hand turn lane that no. exists? That's correct. There's That would be more of a storage uh, capacity yeah. um, concern relevant to actual um, development and growth. Well, and I drove by today, um, and I, there's not a lot of room to extend that left-hand turn lane because there's an intersection coming out of Shops of Bujo onto Evergreen or some. It's not that much room. Okay. So is that why we're proposing, this might not be a few, Dean, is that why we're proposing a cost sharing because these improvements are needed uh, regardless of the development or not? It's, I don't know who could answer that one. It's Fair. I mean, not to speak, Donnie may want to speak more on this, um, but it is fair to say that there's a component here that the, inter the improvements that we're looking at are relevant to existing demand and not relevant to any single development. So um, it, it's, it would be fair to say that there is a portion uh, that is, is due to existing circumstances. Okay. Yeah, because when I was reading this, I kept thinking that why would the city pay for any of this, but that, that makes a little bit of sense. Um, and then one last question, and this is for you, Mr. Schick. Any concern with people doing, there, you're, there's a proposed right in, right out, uh, further up on the Belrose Hill for this area. Any concern with people turning right, going to the top of the hill, then there's an intersection of Belrose and going into Oakmont? Uh, I'm, wor I'm worried personally about you two turns because people are just going to hang a UE and go back down the hill because there's really no reason to go right unless you're going out to Sturgeon County. So, yeah, in, in the short term, I think that could be a, a relevant concern um, and, and, a, and a movement that people could be making. Um, one thing, though, would be the long term and the future connection of 127th Street that overall in the, in the broad scheme of the network uh, becomes a viable uh, route and a desire. So um, short term, absolutely. I would I mean, just to your comment, that could be a movement, mm -hmm. but it also would be kind of relevant to the ease of making that movement and the delay that then people traveling through 
they have to come back through that intersection at Belrose yeah. Evergreen as well as Boudreaux and Belrose. So um, the benefit and any time savings may not necessarily. Okay. All right, that's it for me for a bit. Anyone else? Councillor Hansen, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So maybe this is for um, Mr. Schick or even Mr. Scoble or, or uh, Ms. George. Um, with the traffic uh, improvements, uh, if the development goes ahead, these improvements would need to be done sooner rather than later. Would it be fair to say that we would need to be reshuffling our uh, improvement priorities, uh, roadway improvement priorities? And uh, what would the timeline look like if the development went ahead as opposed to if the development didn't go ahead? So again, in terms of the, the uh, current work being performed by the city and so not relevant to the development, um, it's suggested that these are short-term improvements and within, within a two to three year time window. So um, in, in dealing with the, again, the mitigation of collision occurrences involving the north on right and the left turn operations that exist today, uh, the city would be looking to that and essentially be bringing forward it as part of uh, the engineering charter for intersection improvements for consideration during budget deliberation and where that falls it would have to go through of course the appropriate prioritization of the charters and, and whatnot and then be upfront for uh, consideration uh, and debate uh, for 20 for 2021 2022 uh, potential funding in terms of the development um, now, where it actually fell is that some of the short-term improvements recommended within the TIA, again, aligned to the safety improvements being recommended for the short term. So it's not a case uh, that they, they, they're the same recommendations, same identified concerns, uh, which is, is of course appropriate. Um, however, it's, it's two different aspects and how the recommendations were brought forward. So the longer term in order to support um, if the development were to go forward, um, this is where it's more aligned to the comments of the storage uh, left turn accommodation, potential concern and operations of the alternative intersection, which is Bell Rose and Evergreen versus the Boudreaux Bell Rose uh, intersection itself. And those would be relevant to the completion or, or uh, maybe triggers with the development itself or when they should or, or could occur. Thank you for that. That's all I have. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Just a couple questions. Um, so the setback at currently at 27 meters is um, considered too close, I understand by you. What would be the recommended setback for this height difference? So planning. Very good. Yeah, you go ahead, sorry, Suzanne, I'll, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at this one. Planning hasn't actually investigated what would be the exact um, amount of um, setback. Just as a comparator, we recently looked at cell 3L and looking at that one, there, is, um, there was a, a, a railway and a, a gas line that caused a separation between the development and the adjoining, and the, adjoin, the adjoining properties. And that one was 50 meters. And we were looking at about a 10 story building. For these, we are looking at um, about 14 stories and they're proposing 20, about 25 to 27 meters. So we haven't done that investigation, but that's just the scale and context that we're looking at. But I, I, I um, cause I'm looking at the, the slides and they have, Slight, they have nine levels coming and backing out of the house, not um, the higher number that you're referring to. So I'm just not sure if I'm reading something differently, but they're saying 927. The other one was 12 stories and 50. So I'm just trying to. Um, yes, sorry. Um, I'll let Suzanne speak to, we should probably speak in meters actually, because the stories get um, messed around a little bit. So Suzanne, do you mind answering that component? Yeah, of course. So. Uh, to Councillor Hughes, if I understand right, you're referring to the, uh, I guess, building three on the proposal that's closest to Orchard Court. Yeah. So for the setbacks, we haven't really evaluated how far those need to be, partially because we have not received a development permit at this time. 
Okay, so through the area structure plan and the redistricting, we don't really have a um, mechanism right now to set those um, exact setbacks unless we were to add them as tax to the DCMU as an exemption similar to the heights that are proposed. So with um, the recommendation to not support bylaw 13, the, um, the height still goes up to nine stories, I believe. Like you said, you said 25 and you said 45. So is it 45 meters in height for DCMU or is it 25? It's, I think it's 45, isn't it? The standard height for DCMU is 25 meters. 25, okay, sorry. Wrote down the wrong number. Um, so if they had 25, the nine stories would still be eligible. Let's let's just say that. So that the, the site layout they have right now with building number three is still complicit with our current DCMU bylaw. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, depending how they construct it. So some of the heights that we have here are a little taller, for example, than what you would see in the Grandin Park development, simply because they're looking for, um, I guess, like a, a higher scale uh, development where they're literally having higher ceilings within their residences. So that makes the, the spread between stories a little taller. Bit higher. So, oh. so because of that, you might not fit the regular nine stories if they're still building it. You know, got it. Okay. Um, the other question I had is so in Botanica One right now, like it's nine stories, but because of the slope, it doesn't feel like nine stories when you're looking at it anywhere except for when you're facing the river, right? Like so at the river, you're like, yeah, it's nine. But when you're at the shops area, for example, because of the slope, it doesn't feel like you have that kind of a uh, you you miss some stories. So yeah. on this development, do we have any of that same situation potentially occurring where some of it's lower just because of the topography? On some places you do, yes. And the maximum height is from the lowest grade. Yeah. As written in our building by level. I so understand that. Yeah. So buildings three and, and four would have have street grade would be different from the actual grade. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we know how many stories or what the difference is in the in the height from the bottom to the street grade, so to speak? Like, do we know that angle? No? Because that uh, would just I be, I don't know how many know. That's just helpful to figure out what the total impact is from the majority of what you, you would experience. Um, the other question I had, so are they looking at a lot of underground parking, I'm assuming, right, for this development? Do we know how many stories down they plan to go? I mean, if you're going 26 stories up, it's it's down, it's gonna to to go down pretty far. I don't know how far they were down they would have to go to fit their parking requirements. Okay. And the other concern, um, in some of the submissions, they had brought this up about the second turn lane. Um, and then they, there was concerns there may not be room to actually put the second turn lane. This may not be to you, it could be to Dean. Um, and I'm, although I'm, Dean's not on my screen, so it's so frustrating right now for me. I only have nine on my screen. Um, so if we do not have, do we have the room to put all of the configurations that we want to have, or is, is there a way to make room for all of the amendments that we need to make to these, uh, or improvements we need to make to these intersections? Thank you, Councillor Hughes. So yes, right now, in terms of the short term, um, the turn movements and, and lane designations, there should be adequate space to accommodate these. One of the concerns would be is the storage length. So if additional storage length, for example, for that southbound left turn um, between, for Boudreaux at Bell Rose, because of the proximity of the Bell Rose and Evergreen intersection, there may be very, very limited space to extend it. But the benefit then would be, and this is why the, the potential benefit of the dual left turn would accommodate that additional storage and capacity as well. So that might offset uh, some of those movements and allow for a greater volume of traffic to be stored, stored in those lanes. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed it, but did you give an actual, is this, is, is there any business cases for this coming forward in the next year or so just to address it period, just because there's a lot of complaints about that intersection? Is it planned to be for the next year or so? Sorry, yes. Yeah. So essentially, again, progressing from the, the in-service safety review that was performed at the intersection, we're looking into a more detailed design that can feed into, uh, take the recommendations that were made, investigate the actual constructability and get uh, co cost estimates essentially, and then build that uh, charter. Now, it's in the 
a scope of work of an existing charter. So it's not necessarily a brand new business case, but it would be within a capital growth charter for intersection improvements. It's relevant to, again, save, addressing safety and operational concerns of our existing network. Okay. And then the, the right in, right out. I understand that you're talking about long-term for solutions, but 127th Street may or may not occur during my lifetime at this point. There's no immediate plans for it. So to me, it's very long-term. So I'm just trying to figure out right in, right out for a complex of that size with all those people who are probably actually going to want to go left more than right in their lives. Um, I'm trying to figure out how this is going to help with traffic flow because it, like the uh, mayor's concerns about making U-turns, I can see people just continuously making U-turns because they don't want to go right 127th doesn't exist and they probably want to go into St. Albert uh, and not away from St. Albert. So I'm trying to come to terms with this solution that we're coming forward with because that doesn't seem like a really good solution. I know before there was a roundabout planned and now the roundabout's out and we have this and I'm just, I'm grappling with how this is actually going to work in the short to medium term, which would be the next two decades. Yeah. And, and, if I and could jump in. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go Sorry, ahead. No, I just wanted to um, add the point on the concept plan, um, Brandon, none of the subdivisions are done at this point, so we haven't received that application, but the concept is for the parking lots to connect over to Evergreen, or the, the part of Evergreen that connects to the Botanica development, so people could kind of come across and connect to that intersection as well. That might be an option for people living on site. So there's, they could, that lights that are there right now is going to maintain the ones that come out of Botanica, whatever, the current Botanica, there's lights. And so those lights will be maintained is what you're telling me. And they can make the left or that way. That's correct. So there's, there's two accesses or exits, I guess. Uh, the evergreen intersection will remain to provide an all access, meaning people can go uh, essentially right in, left in, and right out, left out. Uh, the right in, right out uh, is, is we did investigate that opportunity to provide an all access. But again, because of the curvature of the road of Belrose um, and sight line issues and whatnot, it, it wasn't recommended from administration. It wasn't supported. Uh, the thought, especially a, a general T intersection, uh, the opportunity to try to utilize a roundabout to mitigate some of those sight line concerns and issues uh, still didn't result in, in what was deemed as a best operational uh, and safety performance kind of design. So we, we recommend that. In terms of the right in, right out, uh, like in terms of moderate uh, time frame, of course, the annexation work and the future network expanding and a potential uh, other roadways connecting, say, for example, uh, with Neil Ross, Bell Rose to Neil Ross and whatnot. Uh, th those are, I would say, in, in a moderate time frame because development's going to start to happen out towards that northeast of the city of St. Albert. Um, and, you know, the network will have to service those new developments. They'll have to connect with the arterial network and provide, again, viable routes for people inclusive of this development. And, of course, 127th Street long term has perhaps more of a regional uh, impact and influence, but internal, um, those types of net network improvements uh, should be occurring in the moderate time frame. Okay, I'm, I'm still just, I still have a, that one intersection then is going to service both areas for all left turns. So was it checked to see if that one intersection to hold it would actually have capacity if 50% of both areas actually wanted to make left turns? Like I'm concerned about that one intersection now being backed up too far, if it's now the only left turn to get out for everybody. Yeah, the long-term in that build out, it does, there's reduced levels of service. I mean, that's, it does show that it can work. However, there's reduced levels of service and some movements. Uh, the intersection itself has a lower level of service, meaning it's just a, a level of service is, is quite simply just delay. It's, it's just a measurement of uh, performance measure, meaning delay. And an intersection itself kind of encompasses all the different movements. And so in terms of that, for example, coming out of Evergreen, that left turn movement may have a very, uh, a very close to failing level of service, meaning it could be, you know, 55 to a minute, 50 seconds to a minute for vehicles. Um, and it doesn't, in terms of the level of service of the corridor, the proximity of the two intersections, 
um, make it difficult as well because that storage that you take from Evergreen has to be accommodated then at the Boudreaux Belrose intersection as well. So the TIA itself uh, does show, although it shows reduced levels of service with the development, it does show that it, it can handle, it handles the traffic volume just at a poor level of service. Um, okay, so just one more question. I don't know, um, since your since administration is not recommending the um, approved bylaw 13, was there a comparison done to what the impact is at a traffic level between if it was maintained at the current DCMU level versus what is being proposed to up to the 25 stories? No, there there was no comparison to my knowledge in regards to what 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 would be outside of what was proposed with the actual development. The TIA essentially just is is representing what they're proposing for development, not a comparison. It, it compares what exists today compared to with the development. Okay, thank you. No more questions. <clears throat> All right. Any more questions? Go ahead, Councillor Watkins. Uh, yeah, it's, we've talked a lot about transportation, but there's a lot of people on this call and it'd probably be pretty useful to put a map up again. Could Suzanne put up the map that had all the improvements to the intersection there, please? And I had some questions on it. Okay, good idea. Okay, now maybe Mr. Schick can speak to this diagram so everybody can understand what he's talking about. Now, the first question was, you said you, there's a collision report that exists. And um, uh, there are already some improvements that are required at the intersection, irregardless of this project. So maybe you could talk about that and then tell me the service level that the intersections are presently operating at. Absolutely. So uh, in terms of the safety concerns, um, two of the larger, well, the largest was actually um, influenced with the northbound uh, so the bell rose right adjacent to the point, uh, use the pointer there and so everybody could follow along. Sorry, I'm not controlling the screen. So okay, <laughs> you had me there for a moment where I was pointing on my screen. And <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see that. Um, we're number three, maybe I can explain. So number okay. three uh, is the development of the northbound right turn bay. Um, and so we believe that it's, it is feasible to essentially dedicate a northbound right turn and you can see in that uh, southeast corner, there's a substantially a large pork chop island there. That's so what we'd like to do is uh, redesign that island to make it uh, more of a smart channel, similar to the right turn design changes that were done at San Bertrand and Boudreaux yeah. uh, to minimize the angle and uh, reduce um, uh, some of the, the, the collisions that are occurring there. And the other uh, operational concern uh, was with the southbound left again coming from uh, the evergreen intersection to make a left turn and of course left turns are, are safety concerns at any any given intersection and um, so what we look at doing is with the dual left turn it's largely operational and level of service so to address the volumes of traffic uh, it is a level of service right now that is during peak periods uh, D to E, meaning that there's in around 50 to 70, 75 seconds of delay potentially for vehicles at that, for that single movement. Mm -hmm. The intersection well, itself. Left turn on to uh, Boudreaux, as you're talking about. That's, that's correct. From, from Belrose turning on to Boudreaux uh, to essentially pass the RCMP building. So that's um, already failing at uh, D to E. That's correct. Yeah, during peak periods. So uh, during the AM and PM peaks, um, we, we see that uh, essentially that level of service is failing for that that movement. And just for everybody's understanding, can you maybe you explain AM, PM peak to people. Uh, so the AM peak uh, is typically representing that morning uh, rush hour, if you will, uh, representing typically it's, a, it's 6 till 8 AM. Uh, the afternoon peak period uh, begins usually around 4 um, 4 p.m. till 6 p.m. Um, we do see at this intersection, there's a little bit of a rush uh, with school uh, transportation services um, prior to the kind of formal uh, peak period of that, that commuting traffic, let's say. Uh, and so we do see that southbound left turn may be influenced for a longer period of time, uh, anywhere from 3.15 p.m., 3.30 uh, p.m. Till, till again when that actual 
intersection rush uh, peak period starts for that afternoon period. So, so one and three are the two projects you're talking about that regardless of whether this is approved or not, it's, it's we would have to do them anyways. That's correct. Aside from that as well, we do see uh, there's additional beyond this as well. So right. um, we're looking at some of the to mitigate some of the rear end incidents that are occurring on the eastbound movement. So uh, where the wording of the intersection is Boudreaux says Boudreaux Road on that that side, that direction path, um, looking at a potential increased uh, traction material to try and influence stopping distances. Um, better uh, visibility for the actual signal indications. Um, so it's the, the higher visibility backboard. So it goes beyond the intersection improvements. These are more relevant and shared improvements recommended with the TIA. Whereas, okay. sorry. And then, and then the, uh, the cost sharing, uh, the developer, uh, the extent, we didn't talk about number two yet. So is that the requirement uh, that is needed as a result of the project? That's correct. I mean, to be very uh, upfront, there is the what essentially happens is under today's circumstances, there are periods where the southbound left turn uh, extends st the storage expands into that through lane, so it impacts the, th the southbound through lane. Right. Um, however, it's anticipated that with the dual left, you're addressing that storage and you're addressing that conflict. So, one technically speaking, one and two may address help one may influence and address number two however with potential uh demands of development and increased volumes that that benefit may be lost with increased volume so your potential then of needing additional storage mm -hmm. would still likely occur mm -hmm. and, and that would be more so relevant to development not under current conditions mm -hmm. and then uh what is the what is the time frame for development because uh, we, we have to understand that, uh, you know, if this is approved, there's not going to be two 26 story towers and all this built in one day. This is going to take years and years and the traffic is going to gradually um, increase, I guess, over time. So maybe you could just comment on the time frame and like, if this, is approved, if this is not going to happen next week that it's going to go to a different service level. No, if they could get all this done in a week, I'd be extremely, I'd be jealous of their construction periods. So uh, if um, uh, it to be in the TIA, Essentially, it looks at a timeline, I believe, of 2034, 2032 or 2034 is for the traffic projections. Okay. So that would mean a little bit in terms of time for actual That'd build. A good question for the applicant too, Councillor Watkins. Okay, so that's out to 2034, you're saying, the TIA. Correct. Suzanne, Very did good. you want to jump in there? I saw your hand go up. Yeah, so the applicant was proposing that building three, the uh, 40 meter building closest to Orchard Court, may be constructed within the next year, but yeah. full build out will probably take about seven years. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I think those are my questions. Oh yeah, one other question. Um, the, uh, there was a um, geotechnical report submitted, is that true? Yes. And the geotechnical report, uh, does it support the height of the buildings? At this point, yes. However, they will have to do a more detailed study when they right. start knowing where they need their foundation. Right. And then uh, there were concerns talked about uh, stormwater management and discharge into the uh, uh, Sturgeon River. Uh, that is dealt with at the development permit stage and is controlled by Alberta Environment. Is that correct? I believe so, yeah. Kate popping on. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can't see Perfect. It, but... Actually, uh, that's weird. Can you... Hmm. Potentially yeah, my camera's yeah. having problems, but I can give you the answer. Um, so actually they have gone through and done most of it here um, right now. It is generally supported by the city um, from a design stage and they just submit their applications to Alberta Environment. So it is dealt with at the municipal level. Um, there is currently a 1050, so approximately one meter diameter size outfall that supports right now the Evergreen and Everest little development just north of this development, it can handle some additional flow. And then they've proposed approximately 1400 meters cubed of either rooftop or underground storage to support the additional runoff that would happen during a major rainfall event that would then release in a slower capacity into the outfall. Okay, okay thank you. Those are my questions. All right, um, any more questions from council? 
Suzanne, can you bring up Schedule F? I'm looking at my agenda package for today. I'm on page 484 of 862, which is, an, it's called Schedule A of the bylaw. And that's a Schedule F. That is Schedule, that's Schedule F. Okay. I was also looking at, um, at the end of the track changes on the LUB, uh, there's, a, there's a more colorful graphic, I think that Arc Studios had supplied, that, that's not Schedule F. Nope, this is Schedule F and it'll be added just behind uh, the Grandin Parks development height schedule. Okay, so Schedule F um, is not, when I looked at the track changes for the LUB, I can't see the existing Schedule F anywhere. Oh, do you have that? The track um, yeah. We'll do the very quick version so you can see. Okay. <laughs> this this schedule or this map does not is actually not um, existing within the land use bylaw. So That's this is why there's no track changes. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to compare what I'm looking at. Okay. All right. Just in case we want to make any uh, changes, this is where we're we're looking. Yeah. So even though it says Schedule A, and then underneath it says Schedule F, and then there's another, then there's height schedule. Yeah. So it's Schedule A to Bylaw 13 slash 2020. Right. But, but then would be schedule, schedule Bylaw is amending Schedule F of the land use bylaw. Okay. Just making sure that's clear. All right. Okay. Uh, Councilor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> so should the uh, bylaw 13 be approved, all we're doing then is changing the height. We are not buying into this particular map, are we? Explain that. Uh, to me, I understand that we're just changing the bylaw, the heights permitted and, and stuff like that. We're not buying into a particular development proposal. Is that correct? Partly yes and partly no. Because the concept plan that's given as the site plan is still a proposal. However, if you approve this height schedule with the heights that are shown on the right-hand side there, um, if you have a permitted use that falls within that height, it becomes a by right development. My point is, is that the blocks that are 100 meters are not necessarily married to where they are on this particular map. Is that correct? Yeah, they're as close to the location as could be estimated. But as you can see, there's no dimension saying it is specifically this many meters from the property line. So, so explain to me the process. So we, we, Say we pass this, it comes to a uh, development permit time. How close does it need to be to what is proposed today to what is proposed at the development permit stage? Or can it be a completely different proposal? Just I don't think it can be line. completely different. Um, how much the development officers will vary from the locations on this site, I'm not particularly sure, but I think they would try to keep as close as possible to the locations of the height listed within, within the height schedule. Uh, if I can, if I can add to that uh, answer, Mayor Heron, um, particularly in a case where it's uh, technically a, a, con a direct control type of a district, uh, the development officers would be very reluctant to do any sort of variation. So they would really want to see that as Suzanne said, while there aren't dimensions here, that that the actual development did, in fact, align very particularly with what was um, approved here. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so, so what we're saying then is that if we change the bylaw thirteen, this is sort of where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay, and just for clarity, because you've got the height schedule on the screen, um, the current uh, land use bylaw would allow up to how many meters? 
25. 25? Yes. Okay. I so. do have a version of this that has the proposed stories to, uh, by the applicant included for context. Would you prefer to see that instead? No, that's okay. Because uh, okay. I think what Councilor Broadhead was trying to get at, we're trying to keep married to the actual policy changes that we're doing and not a conceptual plan by the applicant. We have to, you know, remember that, yeah, it look can look beautiful, but this is what we need to focus on. So I'm looking at, you know, you've got the dotted area of 10 meters, the lined area 15, and the cross hatch is around 20. And that's about, that's about as far as our current bylaw would go. Yes. The, Full gray and then the full dark gray, the 40 and 100 are not allowed currently. Currently, no. Okay. And just for some context, these are maximum heights. Maximum heights. So, so technically, the applicant could come in and say it's in the 100 meter blob. Mm -hmm. They could come in at 75. Right. And that would be enabled. Is there a similar height schedule to what I'm looking at right now for the Amicon? um development right so you know they they're allowed to go higher than 25 meters because they have their own schedule yeah. right they actually have a minimum and a maximum schedule i think in the between the darp and the land use bylaw darp gives them the maximum uh between darp has minimums and maximums and then the land use bylaw actually approved the maximums overall maximums okay so if we wanted to today we could we could do minimums and maximums if you want to. <laughs> this is going to get confusing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm still looking around council. Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. I think that was that was where I was going. So I mean, we could take this height schedule and um, take away the 100 meter portion of the height schedule if we wanted to and approve that today, if we were not comfortable with that height. Process-wise, I think we need to be clear, though, and maybe Mr. Lafleur can jump in. The applicant has submitted an application, mm -hmm. and you know they're the landowner, and we we don't want to approve something that they completely disagree with, right? Because that's not what they asked for. So right. I think Mr. Lafleur, do you want to jump in? So we need to ask the applicant when we get there. But Mr. Lafleur, you can probably go a little bit further. Yeah, uh, just uh, I could go into more detail and in camera if you wanted to, but for purposes of the public hearing, it's very safe to say that it is uh, very much recommended by me as your lawyer that if you're thinking about changing maximum heights uh, with before what's before you, bearing in mind that it is the applicant's proposal, when it comes time for the applicant to make his presentation, you should put to the applicant what you have in mind and see what his reaction is. Okay, thank you for that. And I guess um, just a, a question in terms of meters. The current Botanica um, buildings, uh, at least number one for sure, I think is nine stories, three are below and six are at street level. Is that, um, what's the meterage of the six that are above street level? They might not know that because they do the measurements from grade, but okay. Yeah, but yeah. I'm sorry, Councillor Hanson, but it's been a while since I've measured those, and it was on our spectrometry server, so it might not be exact. I think okay, I was just thinking. Pull up the development uh, to find that. Okay, I was just really trying to uh, get a comparison, a visual um, for that. So it is nine stories, but three are, are um, below street level. Okay, that's great. That's all I have right now. It's, it's actually a really good question, Councillor Hansen. So maybe Suzanne, Christine, or Adrian, we could get that information for later on. Can we, is it, can we access it somewhere? Uh, yeah, I'll see what I can find during the break, maybe. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll, ha we'll have it in a bit. Okay. Sorry about that, but it might be important. All right. Council, any more questions? Okay, go I'll ahead. I apologize for letting you go over. Pardon? Pardon? Say it one more time, Councillor Watkins. I just had a question about where grade will be measured from on this site because it's sloped down to the river. So where does the, the land use bylaw define the measurement of grade at? So where are you gonna measure the height from? I guess is the question. 
sorry, I was still muted. Uh, so grade on each separate building would be at its lowest point, its lowest elevation. Okay, that thank answers you. your question? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, anyone else? Go ahead, Councillor Mackay. Yeah, sorry, I was talking over Ray. Again, with the shared screen is hard. And I apologize. I guess uh, I appreciate all the questions and I know for time here, but we have to get it right. Um, so some of the concerns in the administration's report um, are to speak to, of course, um, the EMRB and our existing MDP. But the EMRB growth plan, I mean, certainly there's some concern that it um, doesn't follow at least a, one of the principles and maybe some of the policies. Uh, Madam Mayor, is there, what's the ramifications if a uh, community doesn't follow the MRB? Is there any ramifications? I mean, I would, that's a good question because it, it generally conforms to the growth plan, and especially when it's, the growth plan was written really around trying to encourage density and trying to use existing infrastructure and trying to prevent um, urban sprawl across good agricultural land. So this this development does that, but it doesn't, we weren't required to actually do a comparison to the MRB because it's outside of um, the parameters. Christina, do you wanna? Yeah, sure. Uh, we don't have to submit this one to the EMRB because it's outside of the 800 meter referral. Um, and to your point, uh, Mayor Heron, the proposal itself does achieve a lot of the very positive things that the EMRB growth plan is trying to do by increasing density and by um, getting us to grow up versus out. Um, it's just um, a lot of the focus regarding that is has been assumed to occur near transit stations and transit orientated development. And this one's just a little outside of the general collector walk shed that you would normally find. So, so we're not in any, be, just because it doesn't meet that piece, we're not, I mean, we're not breaking even the spirit of, or the intent of the MRB then? No. Okay. All right, thank you. Part of the EMRB uh, growth plan also has um, aspirational uh, targets for uh, infill, and this would probably assist the city of St. Albert meeting that aspirational target. That would be correct. Okay, any questions from council? And don't worry, there's lots of chance to ask more coming up. So I'm looking at uh, 10, 12. We have time to bring um, the applicant in. So Tamara, I, I think it might be you who is moving people over from uh, attendees to panelists. So I don't, how many applicants do we have presenting? Just one? Okay, who is it? If I may clarify, there have been a couple of people who had registered just as, as a member of the public speakers, as it turns out, were part of the applicant's team. Right. On the call. And so if the applicant, uh, either during their presentation, Mr. Brasso, I mean, wants to bring them in, that's fine. <clears throat> if uh, in, in response to counselors' questions, he wants to refer to their particular expertise, that's fine, but they're no longer going to be speakers in their own. Right. Oh, and it looks like they're in a boardroom. Yeah, so. exactly. I think they're okay. all there. So one, one screen, multiple peoples. All right, I'm seeing that. And uh, just before we go to the applicant, uh, Tamara, I noticed you in the chat are trying to get um, the public's names matched up with who registered. Or do you need any help with that verbally right now? Okay, all right. Okay, welcome team. Uh, so you guys are allotted 10 minutes according to our procedure bylaw and then there'll be um, unlimited amount of questions so there will probably be lots of time to, to, to for us to communicate. I'm going to suggest that we do the 10 minutes now and then at 1025 I'm going to let council have a bit of a break because I said it, we would take a break at 1030. So why don't we take your 10 minutes now 
and, uh, and then we'll take a quick break. All right. All right. That sounds good. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to present. In the interest of time, we have recorded our presentation, so we will play that for you now. Rep. Are you seeing that? Developing the tenant that has given us an inside perspective into what is important to our market. From sweet design to customizations, amenities to use. We have used our experiences and lessons learned on this project to help build the vision for Riverbank Landing. Like the bottom of a well going Riverbank Landing is comprised of six buildings on 10 acres. Commercial, professional, and retail space is typically provided at grade, contributing to street life and animation, with residential spaces above. The site has a combination of above ground and underground heated parking for visitors, tenants, and owners. Variety and proximity are essential in making mixed use properties attractive, with housing, workplace, dining, and recreation all close to each other. Riverbank Landing, together with its neighbors, are providing what the market is proven and seeking a convenient, well built mixed use community. Our focus on very specific retail and restaurant users will help create a vibrant destination that appeals to all walks of life. Blue Hill Communities is in Riverbank for the long haul, and we're prepared to invest in its success. It has been said that you need uniqueness in restaurant ventures, and our 100 seat high end restaurant certainly fits the bill. Fantastic River Views, located next to nature with underground parking for those cold winter days. What could be better than fine dining on an intimate patio, nestled in a natural ravine complete with river views? Or how about accessing the second floor banquet room? What a great space to have to get together with friends and family. If it's street life you're looking for, with two unique patios, upscale lounge, and signature cocktails, this purpose built restaurant will be an asset to all of St. Albert. Often sites for amazing condo sites or the great commercial sites. What makes Riverbank unique is that its proximity to the river, strong site access, public transportation, and large size make it perfect for both. Two public plazas are provided. The larger patio of approximately 10,000 square feet is located on the banks of the river and offers terrace views to the southeast. We have found with Botanica that many people are moving back to St. Albert from different parts of the country to be with their families. Family-centered activities are planned for the plaza, including kids' play areas, performance stage, seating areas, outdoor fireplaces, food trucks, special venues for celebrations, activities, outdoor living, or just spots to hang out. The steep topography of the site presents some unique opportunities for changes in trail elevations, new platforms, architectural interest, and terrace landscaping. The entire site has been carefully planned to be welcoming to the community, encouraging participation in all amenities offered. Riverbank Landing is all about keeping people and families together and connected. People will have a connection to the outdoor landscaping all year round. Pedestrian walkways and hiking trails flow in and out of green spaces, public squares, viewing platforms, adjacent to natural areas and waterways, taking you away from the frantic day-to-day -day activity or bringing you back into it. Studies are showing that walkable, amenity-rich environments where there is a sense of community are becoming increasingly sought after by people of all ages. Our Riverview patios and trails would be a great place to enjoy that morning cup of coffee. In order to ensure sufficient demand and vibrancy for River Bank Landing, we are targeting many diverse markets. Our markets will span from the young professional who is seeking the modern urban lifestyle, the growing 55-plus demographic, We've also experienced a large market in a 65 plus who are looking for maintenance free way of life. Commercial space will focus on boutique retail and professional space providing a high level of personalized services. Riverbank Landing intentionally integrates plazas, parks, sidewalks that foster interaction among community members and visitors. Interaction that wouldn't normally be possible in a traditional car central design model. Our focus on very specific retail and restaurant users will help create a vibrant destination that appeals to all walks of life. Boutique and owner-operated nature of this scale and type of realm supports a greater sense of community where residents get to know their local shopkeepers. Anchored by wellness professionals and boutique retail, surrounded by quality, diverse residential, Riverbank Landing creates a unique community culture that people are looking for. 
a people-oriented community providing shopping experiences where you know the local store owner. We think we all want to live in a livable city. And by livable, we mean a place that you can go to the local butcher store, the local fish market, the local cheese store. You can go to restaurants or walk to work. And this is exactly what Riverbank offers. The tower draws its divine inspiration from the banks of the Sturgeon River, mimicking flows and undulations as it wanders through the valley. Our skinny towers reduce the shadow and assist in the fast shadow transmission across neighboring properties. Riverbank Landing, together with its neighbors, offers a large, diverse community, resulting in a more attractive, stable retail environment. In order for Riverbank Landing to thrive, it requires a harmonious balance between density and amenity, with exacting standards for quality and outdoor space. When all these elements are combined correctly, a unique master plan community emerges where people know and support their neighbors and are proud to call home. Riverbank follows the very latest in healthy living and environmental design principles. It is also supported by Alberta Health Services. There are many benefits to mixed use communities. However, they are more than just pleasant amenities. The walkability of cities translates directly into increased home values. Being able to walk to work, shop, or fine dining fosters connections and helps us all thrive in this new normal. Studies have proven that houses with the above average levels of walkability command a premium ranging from four to $34,000. And walkability is designed right into the nature of Riverbank Landing. In order to expand this walkable community, it is extremely important to ensure traffic to and from this development works efficiently. In order to accommodate this, we need to make a few upgrades. First, we need the artificial intelligent lighting installed by the city on 11 intersections along Boudreaux Road to be fully commissioned. We also need to increase the length of the current left turning lane from Bell Road onto Boudreaux and make the center lane a second left turn. This will double the volume of flow from Belrose onto Boudreaux Road. Expanding the AI lights from Boudreaux to tie in the Evergreen Drive intersection will allow synchronized timing to the entire network for all traffic going from the site up to other main traffic routes throughout the city. We have also added a new right in, right out entrance at the northeast corner of the site to provide an alternate way to enter and exit. The artificial intelligent lighting system is very important as it has been proven across North America to reduce light wait times by 40%, reduce journey times by 25%, and reduce emissions by 20%. The benefits of this development model reaches further than providing a healthy, rich lifestyle. It will also become a key economic driver for the city of St. Albert. Riverbank Landing will generate over $2.6 million a year in new property tax revenue. After removing capital costs, it will provide the city with $1.77 million a year in new net income, or 1.6% of its current operating budget. Included in the capital cost is a new $135,000 a year that council can use to maintain or purchase new infrastructure, like fire, police, transit, and parks. The current zoning for this site would allow for approximately 20 single-family homes and 88,000 square feet of rentable office and retail space. This model would only generate a little over $500,000 to the city, which is $2.17 million less in revenue per year. The large revenue numbers generated by Riverbank Landing are due to the site density and the amount of infrastructure and maintenance that we as Boudreaux are responsible for. It's going to take a few large-scale projects like Riverbank to effectively kickstart the economy after this COVID pandemic. Boudreaux is poised and eager to work closely with the city to be a big part of this recovery. We continue to contribute to the local economy as we have spent over $500,000 in the development of this application. The overlapping stage construction of this project will immediately bring 175 direct jobs and will create 28 temporary jobs to support the trades. It will also create over 55 new long-term medical and professional jobs and over 95 long-term service industry workers to run the boutique shops and restaurants. These jobs will provide over $40 million a year in wages to local workers and will contribute over $240 million to the local GDP. Supported by the Chamber of Commerce, the Riverbank Landing is more than just an economic driver. 
It's designed to enhance daily lives, to keep families together, to um, do the live, work, play environment, the type of lifestyle that everyone's seeking. Um, we're proud of our application. We've put a lot of work in it. We feel it's the best use. That's good. All right. I had 10 seconds on my timer, but thank you. Oh. I mean, you did great. Thanks. Okay, so council, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. I see 1025 on my um, clock. So let's be back in our chairs at 1035 and we can uh, ask uh, Robert's team um, any questions you want, All right? 10 minutes. Um, we are now opening it up to questions of uh, Udro Developments, and uh, I'm going to start with the first and one that is obvious that you know I'm sure is coming. Schedule F is the height schedule, and as uh, we heard earlier, uh, our legal advice is to ask um, you know, what would be the minimum height that that you could live with. Oh. I know it's a hard one. It is. Um, so the reason we struggle with this is we need the right amount of residential to have things work for all the retail. Um, we anticipating this question, obviously, with some of the earlier comments. Um, we believe we could do, and correct me if I make a mistake here, Rob, 86 meters for the tower. 89, 89 meters for the tower, sorry. That's a reduction of 11 meters. And for building three, which is the nine story building adjacent the single family homes. 33 meters. 33 meters we could look at doing. 33? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I think you said it in your presentation uh, that you prefer the higher heights because it's a slender building. Yes. So if the heights get reduced be you know lower than what you just suggested do you have the opportunity to build more of a wider pedestal to get the residential numbers we, we do and that is always an option um this site right now is 46 percent patios and green space it's great it's inviting it's got all the walking trails i think one of the things we could have done better with botanica is um is not wall the river off so we're trying to avoid that um, if the towers are a real sticking point, and we obviously want to work uh, with the community, if the towers are a real sticking point, we could maybe look at doing a further reduction on the towers if we take the, um, the hatched area, which is the pedestal of building two, which is right now at, I'm um, looking at schedule F, it's at 20 meters. If we took that to 25 meters, we could maybe drop the towers a little more, eh, Rob? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to open it up to council for questions. Wow, it's a quiet group. Go ahead, Councillor Hansen, then Councillor Mackay. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, um, where was I going to go with this? I have a lot of questions in my mind around when we talk about the, the uh, relationship between um, community, amenity, and density in this uh, particular project. Are we? Are you taking into consideration then? Then more than just those who are living there will be contributing to the economy of this retail space. Um, in case you know, because market's going to drive what you can sell, and if you can't sell enough, you're going to need to, I guess, rely on the greater the greater community to uh, keep things moving. And I just wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how you um, how you uh, come to this threshold of a, a, a storied building um, supporting retail amenities. So what we've done there is we've looked at other successful uh, mixed use developments predominantly in Toronto and Vancouver, because there's not a lot of examples in the rest of Canada on these, and used a similar ratio for on-site density versus retail that they have. I think it's the best metrics. Certainly the community will support it. The shops at Boudreaux are doing very well. Um, so as a comparable, we just kind of did what they did. Uh, 
you know, if we look at it really carefully, I had confidence in that because it's a proven model. So I had Councillor Hansen. All right, Councillor Mackay. Uh, thank you, and I apologize if I have technical difficulties. Uh, Mayor Heron took my computer. Um, the um, <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation, as it's just been previously said. Can you kind of outline for me? And I recognize that the development that we have in, in front of us is concept only, and that there's lots of uh, things that could change if these bylaws were approved. Could you could you address some of the environmental issues? We we talked a lot about traffic, but what about some of the environmental impacts? How would you handle stormwater? How would you handle some of the concerns that residents have around the uh, environment uh, close to the uh, a pretty precious resource in our community, the Sturgeon River? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, let's go to the setbacks, the setbacks if you don't mind, Rob. Um, so we have generous setbacks on the site, and then between us and the environmental sens uh, sensitive area, there is that strip that's a utility corridor. It's not our property. So that is brings us further back. We've hired Spencer Environmental to review our application and make suggestions on how we can maintain the environment. Um, so on, you can see the strip on here. I'm not sharing. It's, okay, it's just not, yeah, it's, yeah, I just need it shared there. Sorry, yeah. um, Robert, it's not go. being shared. Okay, so there we go here. So we've hired Spencer Environmental. They have reviewed our plans. Um, they indicated that there's currently wildlife corridors that are being pinched. With our plan here on this site, uh, we're relieving some of those pinch points. They're happy that the wildlife continue to move. The strip that I referred to between us and the environmentally sensitive area is right on the bottom of the page. You can see that um, this chunk of land here. Mm -hmm. So that's an additional buffer for the environment. Our setbacks from the top of bank are quite generous as well at uh, 16 meters. Yeah, 16 meters back from the edge. All the stormwater on site will be held on site and filtered before it's released to the river. The outflow is on the left hand of our site there, but we will have to have on site containment and filtration. Um, Rob, do you wanna talk about the letter from Spencer Environmental? Yeah, absolutely. These are a couple of the key points that came from um, the review that Spencer did. And you talked about the pinch points for the wildlife. Uh, the stormwater is an important part, obviously, of making sure that the water going back into the river is being filtered and taken care of, and it goes back at a proper rate of release. Um, the, the retention of the large trees, and we we're talking about slope retention. So on the outside of the site, all of the existing trees are being left. Uh, that helps sustain the slope. It also helps with screening and adds to that nature feel that we're looking for the site. We also had Spencer take a quick look at the existing zoning versus our proposed zoning. And the feedback that we got from Spencer was that the environmental impacts would be very similar. We also feel with having the density and the larger scale project that we can invest a little bit more than we could on the current zoning with that filtration and different things to help the environment further. Uh, we do plan to continue engaging Spencer as we go through the development permit process uh, if we get approved today and continue monitoring all the environmental impacts with them. So I'm sure I don't think they saw that. Thank you. Um, actually, can you go back to the actual site uh, concept plan there that you had with the buildings on there? Um, and also, uh, and while you're doing that, when you're sharing, could you outline, I mean, there's the right there, there's, that's one of the disconnects we have in the Red Willow uh, trail system. And I know some residents, one in particular, who's very keen on seeing if we can connect uh, both sides. I mean, that there's that gap um, in the Red Willow uh, trail area, right approximately from where Botanica two ends, yes, correct, all the way up. Is there any, uh, uh, ability uh, in your design to connect those uh, that trail system or is that just because it's on environmental reserve and really uh, up left up to the city or is there some way of a compromise in your concept plan yeah it's certainly the ability is there you could see that we could run it behind botanica too and tie it into the orange which are internal trail systems mm -hmm. but it does run through alberta environmental reserve so mm -hmm. we have it at this time 
drawn it, we would be um, amenable to it. We would certainly support it, but I don't believe mm -hmm. that uh, we have the authority to say it can be done. Mm -hmm. What we are doing is, um, if you look on the right-hand side of this drawing, in our internal mm -hmm. trail network, you see the orchard court. So you can correct, connect through there, and that will get you to the footbridge across by the botanical gardens. All right, thank you. That's, um, I appreciate that. So building three, while we're over there, some of the concerns um, I have and some of the things we talk about, and I think it's identified in the backgrounder is the transition between uh, the, the site and into um, residential in Orchard Court area. How, like, why does building three need to be on the site right there that close? And do you think that that meets the, adequately identifies a proper transition from, um, even a commercial or a higher density area into a, a residential area? It's, um, we do have larger setbacks there. That's one of the things we've wrestled with. So the traditional development model would put, um, let's say three stories there or four stories, and then you would bump up. Uh, what we decided to do was increase the setback on that and leave a lot of the mature trees in the area. So our setback from property is 27 meters. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, from the house. We're nine meters yeah. from the property. Um, do you have any comments on that, Nola? Or? Yeah, um, in a lot of municipalities, a one meter per story setback is generally used for mid-rise buildings. So we're, we're achieving that with a nine meter setback for a nine story building at the highest point. The darker gray portion of building three is the, the taller portions and it, and it steps down um, as well as the grade, the grade flows down as well. So. There are a few homes that you know are slightly more impacted, but generally speaking, it's quite a quite a generous space. And with the grade changes between both sites, um, it's even less impactful than if it was on your typical street. So it's so, not exactly an apples to apples kind of comparison to a normal single family home next to a nine story building. So um, when we were talking, just talking about the heights, when you were talking to Mayor Heron or answering Mayor Heron's concerns, was building three, was that one of the ones you were looking at right now as maybe reducing to 33 meters? Is that what you said? Yes. Correct. Yes. And 33 meters is the equivalent to approximately how many stories? Uh, it's so hard to say because it's, we're not sure what the market wants for ceiling heights, mm -hmm. um, but building three is one of those buildings that's one story down. Mm -hmm. So um, we're already sunk one down. So as it exists, it's eight up. The 33 meters would be from the lowest point measured. So I think it would be mm -hmm. safe to say we would pro we would go up about 29 meters okay. above grade. And and that area right there, you I noticed that your setbacks are about what 14.5 meters. You're so you're a little tighter than the to the bank right there. Is, and no concerns with that. I know you the design as proposed in the concept is a step down. Any concern in relation to that, or we? That, I guess you'd have to do. You, did you get anything back from Spencer Environmental in in, in relation to that, or no? Uh, not in relation to that from Spencer, but it is part of the slope study. So the slope okay. study is what gave us these setbacks. Okay. And those are to maintain uh, that distance from the top of bank to take yeah. care of the river valley. Yeah. So, I mean, and this is just, I mean, and I'm, please forgive me, I'm not a land planner and I'm not a, certainly a designer. And um, when, you, when you're looking at transition between something uh, potentially in concept form like this and into a residential, why would you have your buildings up against uh, the trees? Why wouldn't you build in like a buffer area? And, and please forgive me at my, um, kind of not understanding why. I mean, I'm trying to think, why would you not have a, a park or a kind of an access area on on the other side of building three and move building three more into the building? Is that just, just the way the site developed or how is that determined? Yeah, that is part of it. I mean, I guess we do look at these existing trees and there's also a fairly large ravine coming through the site here. I have a, an image that I can pull up here that shows, uh, can you see that? Yeah. So Thank that you. shows the existing tree screen um, that exists between the single family and the, the proposed building. And within there is also the ravine. So we looked at utilizing the existing vegetation as that transition. And so like you said, 
Councilor Mackay, it can go from lower to higher density, but we decided to leave the trees and utilize that instead. Yeah, I, I, I realize that's just a visual and optic, but to me that looks pretty tight. Um, and, and I realize it's just concept, but yeah. I, I'm just wondering why you wouldn't, why, why, I guess you just want to contain it interior, like a more of a, the village square concept and the plaza internal to the design of the buildings rather than on the outside. But I just think there's an opportunity that you could have built a buffer zone that would have dealt with some of the concerns of the residents there. So we have there's on this site, there's a couple of limiting things. So on the west side of building two, there is mm -hmm. that stormwater outfall that goes from mm -hmm. Heron Ridge. So yeah. we can't build on top of that. No. And we want to keep that village square as large as possible. And we have some great challenges. You can see, again, on the west mm -hmm. side of building two, the lane goes in. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little tricky to get that figured out. So that was a fixed point for us. And so we tried to do the best we could there. Okay, no, I appreciate the comments. I, I realize the site, but um, I mean, to me, that's part of my concerns in relation to the concept is, is um, so when you were doing your presentation, you said that you needed the building heights, I guess maybe even in response to uh, Mayor Heron's concerns around the heights, you needed the building heights to support retail. Is that correct? So yes, we need a certain amount of customers on the site. Um, but there's some assumptions we've made too on how much, how high does the market want the ceilings? Uh, a lot of times we're repair, uh, compared to, to Grandin Towers, they have shorter, shorter ceilings. It doesn't appear to be well accepted. So mm -hmm. does the customer want a nine or a 10 foot ceiling? All these things affect the height of the building. Okay, fair enough. But I mean, the idea would be you would have commercial on the first floor, Four floors followed by what 22 stories of residential or thereabouts depending and I realize again it's only concept is that what that's kind of the plan right now yes very much so uh, residential professional on the main floor with residential above okay um, and, and build out time approximately nine ten years you said 2022 to 2030 ish our our optimistic is seven years and um, 10 years is um, given some market cycles, real estate swings. So I would imagine you're going through construction fatigue right now um, with everything happening around finishing off Botanica 2. Um, the residents certainly are. Well, how do you address some of their construction concerns around all the activity in that area for ongoing for now since 2009? Yeah. So we've learned a lot on the construction, on how to mitigate it. So one thing we should be clear on is if this goes to 10 years, that's not 10 years of construction, though that would be gaps because we haven't sold. So uh, constant construction would probably be somewhere in that five to six years of, of hammering nails. Um, we're going to do a number of things. Uh, first, we're going to have on-site pipe parking for all the trades. The entire site is going to be fenced off. Uh, we're going to have Texas gates on the entrance, so it knocks the mud off all the trucks. We're not doing the street cleaning. The noise, uh, when we did building one, we did driven steel piles, um, kind of rattled all of St. Albert. We're not doing that again. Um, I think we've gotten better at building as we go along, so there's a lot of mitigation areas. As we start to build our way out of the site, we will truck the workers in, uh, so we're not plugging up the streets with parking. Okay. okay. Um, Madam Mayor, thank you very much for your answers. I guess I got a motherhood kind of question. What what attracted your company and your development into St. Albert? Oh, uh, I, I love architecture. I just love it. So we started looking at the original project and I just, I fell in love with the river and I fell in love with the people of St. Albert. They're a very, um, it's a very educated group. You get very articulate arguments from them. You get a lot of buy-in. So we had a chance to create architecture that changes and shapes people's lives. I think you're gonna hear from some of the residents in Botanica on just how happy they are and how we've got mothers and, and daughters living together. We just sold a unit and we're selling units through COVID. We just sold a unit yesterday to a mom. Her daughter lives in phase one, she's buying in phase two. Um, Winston Churchill said, we shape our, our architecture, thereafter it shapes us. This is an opportunity to create a lifestyle that I don't think is seen anywhere outside of maybe Cole Harbor, Vancouver. Um, we are so excited to do this project. I can't wait. And so if you bear with me 30 more seconds, sure. I think there's some 
there's possibly some skepticism that we're not going to do this well or we're going to sell it. If you look back to the early renderings of Botanica when we presented to city council, I know some of you were there at that time or at that meeting. You look at our renderings and you look at what's built, it's very, very close to what it is. We view this as um, it's a long-term project. It's difficult to get done. We've been working on it for a year already and bought the land, no returns. But develop this quality and this lifestyle and it provides stability. So um, hopefully that answers your question. I, 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 I love this project. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I've dominated. Okay. Uh, we can come back to you if you need be. I saw Councillor Jolly put her hand up and then Councillor Hansen. So that's my order now. Can everyone hear me? Just to double check. Yes. Yeah. Um, so my question, um, so to, to Rob, so if, if you can't get the approval for that maximum height that's in there currently, um, or, you know, or something close to it, do you still want the rezoning to DCMU or is, is DC preferable just to leave it as is? Sure. Um, so originally when we came in with the pre-application phase of this, uh, we had looked at just the direct control zone. Um, administration advised us to, to go with the DCMU uh, zone um, because it, largely, I think, because it was a bit of a staffing or time issue, but um, the DCMU zone works quite, quite well for, for what's being proposed. Um, the combination of the, the text changes that are in that track changes document and the height schedule, um, I think provides the development officer with enough control that what is presented in our renderings will be what will be built on site. Um, in addition, there are a number of uh, requirements in the DCMU zone that the DO has control over. So we have to provide architectural guidelines and controls, specifying quality, construction materials, um, architectural style. So that'll be another large step and a large piece of work that will need to be done. Um, so I, I, think, I think we're preferring to stay with the DCMU at this point, given that there are all these control points in place for the city and for administration. Sorry, I'm not sure if I was clear. So if we say if we say no to 100 meters, you know, maximum 40 meters or something like that, do you still want to switch over to DCMU? We really have to crunch the numbers on that, I think. Um, we have a vision. We don't want to stray too far from it. We'd have to analyze if we could do it in 40 meters, I think. Okay, so the answer is you don't know. <laughs> is that, is I, can, that... I can tell you after lunch, we can run some numbers if that helps. Okay, that probably will. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Councillor Hansen. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, if you could uh, share the screen where you, you've got all the buildings there and and we can see a visual of that again. Site map, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm focusing in on building four and building three for this question. Um, and building three is um, for seniors with some commercial uh, on the bottom. Is that correct? That's what yes, the focus sir. is? Yes. And so, um, and building four is apartments, um, just for general public, no demographic focus? No, there is a demographic focus on that one. So that is a main floor commercial targeting like a coffee shop. And then the units above are loft units uh, targeting a young urban professional, uh, sort of the 25 to 30 year olds, the units will be um, about 600 square feet and an open loft and two stories of windows on front. Okay. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering in terms of, uh, especially the seniors, um, is there going to be an affordability piece that, that you foresee on this? Um, I mean, there will be some seniors that can afford um, the bigger units 
and the ones that overlook the river a little bit more. But is there going to be um, a variety of starting points for seniors moving into that building three? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we need to, in order to have this project work, we need to hit all the market segments. So um, in Botanica, I think one of the rumors that we often face is it's so expensive, I can't live there. Well, we've got units, uh, I think our units started at 269. We sell lots of units in the 300,000 point. So we will have the a complete blend of uh, units available in building three. Okay, that's great. And, and you foresee building five, if I'm getting my notes right, as um, sort of a health center or, or the kinds of things that would um, be good for seniors who are experiencing any health issues or is that the idea? So that, yeah, it would go down to the main floor, um, building six in particular, mm -hmm. but okay. also the main floor of building five. Okay. Yeah. Great, and, and in terms of the village square, um, in, in front of building three, that's gonna be focused for seniors or general public or visiting, it's for everybody, accessible. All it, of this I'm assuming is ex, um, accessible. It, it's absolutely accessible. Um, the Village Square is, is designed to be a meeting place for all of St. Albert. So um, lots of parking, uh, outdoor activities for kids. There's um, a jungle gym for kids there. We'll have an outdoor fireplace. Uh, amphitheater where people can either sit or they can, uh, um, you know, sing and perform. We've got an area for food trucks that can come so we can do little festivals and activities. So that is really, a, it's a focal point of the community. And, 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 and so parking for the seniors uh, for building three is, is below, I, I'm guessing? Yes. Typically on the school site, we have either two or three stories of underground parking. Uh, we have public underground parking as well. And that one, um, we, we spent a fair bit of time on uh, because we needed to make it inviting. So we um, uh, modeled that after the brewery district downtown where they have public underground parking. It's high ceiling, bright ceiling, the door is fast. It's very inviting to go in. Okay, thank you very much. That's it for now. I want to leave this one up, this parking question, but where do, um people in phase two of Botanica enter into their parking garage? Can they go in off of Boudreaux, like under phase one and access all the way over to phase two? They then, can. Okay, so they can also exit that way too. They don't have to go through some of the surface um, exits on site here. Is that correct? That is correct. They have the entrance onto Boudreaux Road, and then they have the entrance here onto Evergreen, and all of the levels of the parkade are full connect, so they're okay. going to go in or out both sides. Okay, but that's not proposed for this new area. Full connect over to. No, the parkades will not be connected to to the Botanica parkades. Okay, and can you tell me again, um, how much? What's the percentage of open space on this? conceptual plan? The buildings cover 25% of the site plan. 46% okay. is a combination of sidewalks and green space. The actual green space itself is 35. 34, I think. 34% yeah. is dedicated green space. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, there was already a question, but I just want to hear it again about parking for uh, construction workers. Did you say you had on-site? Yeah, so we have, a, we have a construction phasing plan. So the entire site will be uh, fenced and then we'll have parking on-site and we'll move that parking as we progress. So you can see um, on phase one, it'll be fenced and construction working parking is under the mouse. And then as we go to phase two, and these phases are rough, right? Uh, it's market demand. We have designated parking on all the phases. Last phase, we will truck them in. Okay. Um, I think Councillor Hughes years ago actually passed or put a motion on the floor that required you had a parking plan with your development permit so that that you will probably have to submit if this goes through that you would truck them in because it has been a constant um, problem for uh, people in Evergreen across the street and, and some areas of Oakmont with the construction workers for years. So thank you for that. Uh, and then you just 
mentioned something about market justification and market demand. So is, is phase two Botanica pretty much um, sold out now? We are about 82% Rob. Yeah, in building two and I think 92% for the entire project. Yeah. And, and both those phases were, were essentially very high end um, condo units. So you still, you still feel there's a demand for the high end uh, condos? It's high end is such a term. Yeah, um, it's probably, yeah. They're well finished. <laughs> um, but we have smaller units. The one we sold here yesterday was 400,000. Um, Botanica was designed so that if you, if you live in a, a smaller house, you can smell that, sell that house and move into a similar smaller unit in Botanica. If you have a big house, then you can move into a big unit if you want. So it's more of a lateral, lateral trade. But what they're picking up is lifestyle, family, and then the quality of steel and concrete construction. That's very appealing. Um, we're selling units through COVID. Uh, we believe there is a strong market demand. We've also engaged uh, CBRE to do a market study for the seniors building on the catchment area of St. Albert. And they believe there's a demand for uh, that building. I remember in the public hearing in 2013 for phase one, there was a resident very nearby that said, we need more million dollar condos in St. Albert. So there, there was obviously a void um, in the St. Albert market that phase one filled for sure, but this one will have a, bit of, a bigger range in, in price points. Is that correct? That, that's correct. We really want to cater to lots of different lifestyles. We want to draw a lot of the younger people, give them a place to live and participate in this. We need them to give the life to this development. Right. Okay, I'm going to allow Council to jump in. Who's next? Councillor Broadhead and then Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Been struggling with how to ask this question. Um, it's a very uh, well presented uh, proposal. Uh, certainly, um, you know, the dream, if you will, of what you've got here is uh, if it's anything like Cole Harper in Vancouver, uh, it'll be a great problem is, is that we're not in Cole Harbor, Vancouver. We're actually on the river bank of Sturgeon County in, uh, in or Sturgeon in St. Albert a community that has always spoken to this um, family development, small town feel, high quality, all of that sort of thing. So how would you respond to the residents that if we were to pass these bylaws, that your particular vision would, uh, would maintain that that uh, aesthetic that St. Albert is well known for. The, when we did Botanica, uh, everyone came and said, you can't build a building like that. It's going to change St. Albert. Look at the tenor. The tenor um, had troubles and we don't want another tenor here. And we didn't build tenor, we built Botanica. Um, the residents that have moved into Botanica by and large and by like 90% in large have come from this area and embraced it. So I believe that they enjoy the lifestyle that's there. This is, um, these buildings are tall. There's, there's no doubt about that. But we believe that St. Albert is the botanical city. It's about walking trails and green space. So we've made the decision to put them higher, increase the green space. I think incorporating the values of St. Albert in here, not subtracting from them. Okay, fair, fair enough, and I and appreciate the comment. Uh, you do recognize, though, that with this, it's a significant change to the community. Um, and, and I'll leave it there, because this is what's mulling through in my mind. It's just that at the end of the day, a council is being asked to, to make a decision around three particular bylaws. The bylaws enable this particular development to take place. Um, it is the impact of those changes to the bylaw that we are trying to measure here. And while your proposal is, is beautiful, there's no doubt about it, probably be there myself. The, the point is, is that it's 
it's the value that we bring to the community. It's the shift in the community that I'm wrestling with right now. And I'm not saying, quite honestly, I don't know how I'm even going to consider this. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful per proposal. The question is, is whether I believe that this community is ready to embrace it. You said uh, they've embraced Botanica. And so there is perhaps hope. So in any case, I'll leave my question there. And uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay. Councilor Hughes. Thank you. So the one thing I'm trying to grapple with right now is that Botanica 1 and 2, which by the way are very high quality developments. I'm very impressed what you've done to date. But Botanica 1 and 2, you were able to get the residential sufficiency with just nine stories. And yet this other one, you're claiming we have to go much, much higher to get to the same level. So I'm trying to figure out why it was feasible in one and two, and yet you're saying in this second section, it's not gonna be feasible at nine stories. Yeah, good, good question. Can you stop sharing the screen here? Um, so what we've done with Botanica one and two, uh, the density is similar really to what we're proposing here but we've walled off the river. So we've created the river as, um, as a benefit to the residents, but not all of St. Albert. So what we envision on this side, and we think is better for all of St. Albert, is to take Botanic and sort of squeeze them and make them a little vertical. And that gives a lot more access to the river valley for everybody here. Um, could we take Botanica? Oh my goodness, I'm gonna get in. Could we take Botanica and could we put it there and would it be successful? It probably would, but it would continue to wall off the river. We would have more projects um, like the one closer to Canadian Tire or even Canadian Tire on the river. And to me, the river is a resource for everyone. Adding these trails is a resource for everyone, not just the residents that live there. Okay, because the, what I'm thinking of is that Botanica 1 and 2 have been generally well accepted. Um, and that even the numbers, a lot of people who use those shops don't live in Botanica. Like, I know a lot of people that go there fairly frequently um, and they don't live anywhere near Botanica and so and drive over. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm really grappling with the height difference. I understand the intention is to squeeze it up and go higher, but, um, and your rationale behind it, but it is a dramatic change in the landscape um, to see 26 stories come up, especially when there's nothing else even close to that height nearby. So I'm just, I'm really, so you're telling me that it's possible if we were just to flatten and spread out that you could actually also achieve the same goals that you're looking for for sustainability? Because I'm, I'm just, that's where one of the bylaws is to change the height dramatically. Um, and I'm trying to really grapple with the necessity of doing that. I totally appreciate what you're trying to do for your vision. And I think that what you're bringing forward is going to be ultimately a high quality product. There's no question about that to me at all. You guys are beyond um, standards. Like it's one of the best quality developments I've seen in a long time anywhere of what you've done to date. But that height difference does change a lot when we're looking at that. And we had, don't actually have, even Brandon has not yet built any of those towers in the downtown area for us to actually see the change in what happens when you do build 26 stories when nothing else is anywhere near that height. So I'm just trying to really figure out if, if like, cause that's one of the questions they had um, earlier was if bylaw 13 doesn't pass, can you still somehow make it work um, with that? I realize it'd be dramatic changes in how you're, everything you've done to date, but I'm trying to figure out why the 26 would actually be necessary other than just it has the height as opposed to just doing it and having potentially less negative feedback from the community because they wouldn't have the same shadowing concerns. Yeah, um, so, so you've, raised, you've raised a few points there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll deal with, if it's okay, I'll deal with height, retail height and then shadow. Okay. okay, so what we would lose if we did a botanica style is we would lose a lot of the petite retail. Retail nowadays is really under fire. Um, you got the big box stores and you have Amazon. So what survives is those unique little cheese shops. In order to draw people there, there needs to be um, something special to come there. They need to be able to buy their cheese, get their coffee, and then wander out and use that patio and sit on the edge of the river. Now it's a whole lifestyle experience. If we, if we shrank the height, 
and um, built over it, we would have a successful condominium project, but we wouldn't be able to provide this level of retail at all. Um, it, it's the moving around in the lifestyle that uh, is important to us. That being said, we, you know, we'll look at giving some um, to keep the vision, but I wouldn't want to duplicate Botanica itself. Um, the next one was um, Shadow, I believe. So what we've done, oh, actually it was, yeah, and then I'll get to the third, the community embracing. So the shadows come up a lot, and I get that. They are tall buildings. What we've done is we've retained the services of, uh, of ARC and Stephen Boyd, a certified architect, to do a differential shadow study. I don't believe anyone's ever done one of these before, but it was really enlightening to me to see the impact on the community. So if it's okay, I would let Stephen present the differential shadow. That's okay. All right, thank you. Stephen? Are we sharing the screen yet? Uh, okay. You guys aren't seeing the screen? Not yet, but no. it is right now. Great. Thanks. Okay, now. You got it. Okay. I'm going to roll through what we had done. What we, what we tried to do here, we did understand the question and the concern. So as, as Dave has mentioned, we actually took a look uh, at the entire area. And in this case, we actually modeled an excessive amount of the surrounding area. So what we did do is we extended our model into Erin Ridge and Oakmont and represented the, the community as it is today, representing the trees and the houses and everything uh, accurately to what's, what's actually being on the site today and what's there, mainly so we can understand the differential shadow as we go through it. What I've done is we've taken the, we've got all the different seasons and the times of days I'll walk you through the winter solstice, which is one that arguably has got some of the longest shadows and the biggest concern, so you can see. Everybody you can see this image here. This is at uh, 12 noon on winter solstice, which is December 21st. These are existing shadows through the neighborhood at 12 noon. This is without the Botanica proposed development in the site right now, and you can see how the ground plane currently is shadowed. What we did, and then we did take, and when we put the development in, we can see what the, then the net differential is, what you see here. So what we did is highlight in yellow the differential shadow. And this is at 12 noon, again, on, on the winter solstice. From that, we actually were able to show the other times of day. So this is actually typical as 9 a.m., where the entire ground plane is in shadow. The sun is up at 8.40. And then this is at 3, sorry, 3 p.m., the differential shadow on the neighborhood, again, indicated in yellow. The blue is the actual project site, so you can see where the smattering of the new impact is over the existing area. What we've got here is the typical times from 9, 12, and 3. The one image on the right. So on the left is actually the existing condition with, without, the, uh, without the development in it. The center line is with the new development in. And then on the right row is the uh, differential with the yellow. That's winter. Here's summer. We went through this and studied it all the season. Summer solstice, June 21st. It's coming upon us here soon. Yesterday. <laughs> oh, it was yesterday. I'm actually behind. <laughs> Um, the differential shadows is what we focused on here. This is at 9 a.m. This is at noon. And this is at 3 p.m. And then the spreadsheet showing them all together. And then we went to the equinox. So this is more average. This is in spring and, and fall. This is at 9 a.m. The differential shadow across the community. This is at noon. And then this is at 3 p.m. We do have as well, which I could bring up, is a, a video showing you the time and how the sun shadow moves across the entire subdivision and, and uh, neighboring community. 
if, if that's something people would like to see, we are able to put that up. A lot of sure. nodding heads, so let's yep. see that. Yep. Okay. okay. And then you see the time indication on the right. So every half hour, how the time is moving. This is on March 21st equinox. This is summer equinox. Fall. You'll notice at the beginning, at the end of the uh, the numbers and the way that the shadows move, because of the plane of incident of the sun breaking the the uh, horizon, it appears to move faster. It is moving faster because of the incident way the sun is actually coming up off the horizon or falling off the horizon. So we haven't sped the video up. The half hour increments have been consistent through this. And then this is winter. Some of the longest shadows we see. What you notice the ground plane is typically in shadow very soon. That's it. And then the, the third thing um, was, will the community embrace these towers? And um, I, I mean, obviously I know about the online petition and, and we're wondering if what we're doing here is, um, is right. Like, is this actually going to be embraced? Um, our response and the people we talked to seem to be okay. So Saint, uh, the St. Albert Gazette uh, three days ago put out a poll. Now the online petition against it doesn't have a spot to vote for it, obviously. St. Albert Gazette put out a poll three days ago the numbers I just looked at it are 430 people in favor of this development, 81 people in favor of this development, but would like it in a different location, and 130 people against it. So to me, the online petition doesn't, it doesn't maybe reflect the whole heart of the community. This was open, done in St. Albert, and 430 people think it's a good idea. Um, I think this is the next evolution. I believe the first tower that was done in Edmonton was controversial. And it's time for St. Albert to decide, do they want this modern urban lifestyle at this time or is this just too much? Um, we believe this is a good proposal. I think it's the best that we can do. We will do this if successful. This is not a shell game. We have that reputation. Um, and what we see is it will be embraced. Rob, you met with uh, Realtors uh, Friday. And uh, can you tell me their feedback on demand? Yeah, the realtors are excited that the market's starting to turn around, uh, obviously, these days. But there's a lot of interest from the real estate agents into the loft units and to have the diverse options. I know one of the two, actually two of the agents came to me after our introduction of the project, and they each have two parties really interested in the lofts, younger professionals wanting to move here and have that active lifestyle, maybe even have their office here and just live, work, play. Okay. Thank you. I was on you. Do you have any more questions? No, the only thing I would comment is that I was watching those poll results over the weekend as well. And it seems, I'm just looking at them now. And it just seems so strange because when I looked at them last night at like even 10, it was a 38% in favor and it suddenly shut to 67, like literally in the past 12 hours. So, and it was consistent about 38, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and suddenly at 67. So that just seems a little odd. I don't know what's going on with that. 
Um, but no, that's it for my questions. Thank you. All right, Councillor Watkins, you're next. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just had a, a couple of questions. Uh, did you say that like 90%, 92% uh, of the entire project is uh, sold to people who live in the area? Yes, that's correct. Um, either uh, Sturgeon, no, the Sturgeon County or St. Albert, absolutely. Okay, and then uh, the price uh, range of the uh, senior units. Rob, do you wanna take that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, we'll obviously be monitoring the market closely and working with those real estate agents that we met with last week. But we really do want to make sure that we can open up to everybody. So we'll have some smaller units at a lower price uh, and some bigger units at the higher price. Yeah, so we'd be looking at starting somewhere around that 250 mark uh, for some smaller units. And their, their ownership, not rental, is that correct? Very likely ownership. Um, we have considered rental, but there's been a considerate market change in rental now post COVID and ownership seems to be really resurging. Uh, you know, we have an issue of affordable housing in the city here and there, uh, I sit on the seniors committee and the youth committee and both of those uh, groups have expressed this concern. Is there any way we could get any market affordable housing in this project? Or would you be willing to commit to a, any kind of multi market affordable housing? This is a question that I've been asked. Um, I would think for a seniors population, that's something that we could look at. And then uh, my other question uh, about the, uh, I looked at the sun sh impact, sh uh, I was watching those videos. They were, they were very, uh, very insightful about how the shadows actually moved. And it seemed to me that the most impacted houses would be those directly to the west of the project. And the shadow that would last over top of them could maybe be an hour and a half or two hours max because the shadow's moving. Is that correct? Or I would say max. The most of ours are finding that the tip of the shadow is moving off of any property within 15 minutes to a half hour. Okay. And at the, yeah, you see, it's at the max, it'd be about an hour. So it's not casting a shadow over any house for three or four hours. It's kind of moving. no, no, it's not. Okay, and then um, there, there seems to be a lot of concern about the, the towers and the height of the towers. Uh, would you be willing to phase the zoning and, uh, and go with phase one first, which is the seniors building? Or do you require all of it zoned at once? Yeah, I'm waiting list too. Um, you can make, maybe you want to answer that yeah. later. Or <laughs> think about it. Yes, yeah, we will think about it. Another option I'd like you to think about too is if you want to think about that is maybe going back and taking a tabling and going back and, and looking at the project just once more and bringing it back. So those, those are my questions and comments. Thanks. Councillor Watkins, are you suggesting like the redistrict just the phase one, kind of like what we did with the midtown? I'm just asking if they'd be open to that. Yes. That's correct. what yours. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Councillor Broadhead, you're up next. Thanks. Uh, just a, a follow-on question. Uh, environmental impact. Are you looking at things like green roofs, solar, maybe just speak about your commitment. You've talked about your environmental commitment to the river. What other initiatives are you thinking about? Uh, our uh, One of the partners in this project is uh, very much involved in solar panel and solar distribution. So he's very interested in putting that on. Uh, so we're dealing with him. The design criteria, Stephen, as far as protecting the environment go is, I believe, LEED certified. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, we will look at the project through a few um, different programs. LEED is one that would be the leadership in energy and environmental design. We are looking at some of the design options there, whether it goes for the full certification, but at minimum, we'd be uh, reviewing it through the process to know where it would sit we'd be targeting probably in that lead silver at a minimum, probably lead gold um, with, the, with the system. But I think one of the biggest environmental benefits of this type of development is a similar development with uh, as much retail and um, standalone traditional urban sprawl housing would it cover approximately 40 hectares. We're taking four, that's a big savings. Appreciate that. Thank you very much for the comment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right, any more questions of the applicant? Go ahead, Councillor McKay. Uh, yeah, um, 
So what do you, I mean, let's go back to the uh, public's opinion that you're, or the feedbacks that you're getting. So how do you respond to the residents who spent their life savings moving into Orchard Court or moving into Oakmont based on what they had planned? I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, plans change. The world changes. We just, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And like I've said numerous times, there's no playbook for this, but for a lot of residents, the home is forever going to be their biggest investment. And many people in St. Albert stayed by in St. Albert and then progress up the housing ladder. And, um, and, and so a lot of the feedback I'm getting is, um, I, I bought into Oakmont 20 years ago. I bought into Aaron Ridge. I bought in along the river based on that. And, and how do you, how do you respond to that when you want to change the zoning now and build something that is significantly different than a single family residential? How do you respond to that? The Open Values Report tomorrow. The, um, things do change over time. When, when they bought their house, at one point that was, was farmland. One of the things that I'm being, or the comments that I hear, is that we're going to negatively affect their home values. And um, that just, on all the research I've done, that hasn't been the case. Riverbank is providing a walkable community. Um, according to Redfin, there's a direct tie-in between increased in walkability score and home values. The premium for every point of walkability score goes up um, in Atlanta, it goes up 1.69%. It varies in San Diego, it goes up 0.5%. But we are increasing a walkable neighborhood. In Toronto, it goes up 0.9%. So I believe we will positively impact the value of those homes. It is not the single family development that um, St. Albert has traditionally done. And I would say that St. Albert can't continue to do that for three reasons. One, I believe this is the market and the upcoming lifestyle that people are looking for. Two is just don't have the land, four hectares versus 40. Rob, can you um, talk about the financial difference in the application that was made? Absolutely. We did a, a cross check to the Riverbank Landing mixed use development to a more traditional single family. And what are the economics around that to the city? And uh, I just have a little slide here just to give you guys We'll walk through it just quickly. So we looked at the North Ridge traditional neighborhood application and we utilized the numbers from the financial analysis report. Um, our report and the North Ridge report were both done uh, last year in 2019. So the Riverbank site is four hectares. The North Ridge site is 25 hectares in land. Riverbank is 466 units and Northridge is 544 and it's primarily single family with a little bit of mixed use. Then going over to the income comparison on gross tax income to the city, Riverbank is $2.6 million and the Northridge generates 1.6 million. I think where you see the biggest difference is the cost it takes to maintain a neighborhood of a traditional design after the operating costs and the capital costs are removed from Riverbank, we're still generating 1.7 million, uh, where the single family has a loss of revenue or cost the city uh, 298,000. I think it's important for the future expansion and growth of St. Albert to be looking at the different mixed use designs. Yeah, it's towns just, they evolve and development has evolved. Right, I appreciate that. I mean, and hence we're going through that with Flourish, going to 100,000 people. So, I mean, we're 100,000 people. We're not like Atlanta. We're not like San Diego. We're not like Toronto. We have quite a few differences. And like you've identified, people move into our community for significantly different reasons. Um, I just got to go back to the, uh, to the traffic again, just once more. And I, and um, you know, it's, it's going to be a major concern. You put you put this much, like you've identified, down into four heck. Like, I mean, you're really condensing it. And I realize a lot of those people are gonna maybe get rid of one vehicle. They're not gonna be driving multiple vehicles, um, but it's not, it isn't near a transit oriented uh, development. 
Um, people are like you've identified in your background material, you're going to have to potentially walk 10, 15 minutes to get to something like, like that. Um, how, like, I mean, do you, like, I, I still, that's one of my challenges I'm going to have. Like, how do I, how do I wrap my head around that? I mean, I, I don't travel that as often as many people do because I don't live in that part of the community, but it is significant. And I, I don't know whether or not what we can do will address it. Like, like, how do we get over that hurdle? Yeah, I mean, that's something that um, we were worried about as well. Traffic has to work or we won't be able to sell the units. Um, so obviously we had our traffic study done. Um, the traffic study was peer reviewed by, I believe, uh, third party to the same, city of St. Albert, uh, just to make sure that there's no errors there. Um, what really made it all click to me was the AI light timing and the, the fact that we're on two major divided arterial roads. Um, are you okay if we played a two minute video that it just all made sense in my mind? It's up to the mayor. Anyone else want to see it? I'm seeing thumbs up and nods. Sure. If it's only if it's only two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, two, two minutes, 26 seconds. Riverbank Land is strategically sits next to You have to share it. Sorry, it's not going through. Yeah. The button got away on me there. No problem. That happens at my age a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think you should be seeing it now. Yep. I lost the sound though. Uh, yep, yeah, you guys muted. Yeah, don't hear that accident. I can't unmute them. Can you guys hear me? I can okay. hear you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I know. I just thought I might because I was making sure they know. Okay. You need to unmute yourself and then come back to this. You you lost audio, did you? Yeah. We could see it, but we couldn't hear it. So why oh, start? Oh, that's not going to make any sense. All right, okay. we'll just be right back here quickly. That's about right. Okay. Strategically sits next to two of the city's main divided arterial roads. These arterial roads provide access to St. Albert Trail, Ray Gibbons Drive, and the Anthony Handbag. Traffic during peak times can back up far enough to affect the flow of the Evergreen and Bellrose intersection. Vehicles queued to turn left onto the road often overflow the turning lane, causing a large area of the center lane to no longer be useful. Pedro Communities is proposing a solution that would implement real change by increasing vehicle queuing, doubling the capacity of vehicles turning, and having the traffic lights intelligently working together. By extending the left turning lane and making the center lane an additional left turning lane, we will maximize traffic flow, still leaving a full lane to allow for westbound through traffic. Now that we've effectively doubled the vehicles turning on each green light, we need to ensure the lights can talk to each other. This is where the St. Albert's new artificial intelligent lighting comes in. This AI light timing system was installed in a series of 11 intersections along Boudreaux Road and has been proven across North America to reduce wait times by 40%, reduce overall journey times by 25%, and drop emissions by 20%. It does this by monitoring the current live traffic load at each intersection and modifying the light timing all the way up and down the series of intersections. When we add the Evergreen and Bellrose intersection to this series, we can ensure the traffic from Riverbank Landing, Botanica, and the shops at Boudreaux all flow efficiently. With the development of Riverbank Landing, our proposed solutions will maximize the traffic flow of these vital intersections, creating new efficiencies to other major transportation routes within the community of St. Albert. It, this development does sit on those two major roads. And to me, I'm not sure where else we could situate it. Um, it's good access. There is a bus stop right out front. Now that is a, it's a bus that runs around, but it also runs up to the hospital. We anticipate a large number of our, our tenants to be nurses, doctors. Um, so it does meet the public transportation and the traffic, um, we've reviewed it lots. Um, I guess the only assurance I can give is if the traffic doesn't work, we won't be able to sell the units. If we don't sell the units, there won't be traffic. 
Well, that's one way of thinking about it. That's, I guess, <laughs> rever reverse engineering about it. But um, all right. I, I, um, I mean, I think you've heard some of the concerns that I have in, in, in this one anyway. So thanks, Madam Mayor. All right. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Hughes, then Hanson, then Watkins. Thank you. So there's just one thing also that's bothering me is my understanding from administration when they gave the summary was that we are also looking for a decrease between building distances, so the building distance separations. And so I'm trying to figure out why that would be necessary when we have so much green space and only 46% and of it is not, you know, is not building. Why would we actually have to also put in that parameter to decrease the separations? I don't believe it. Yeah. I can answer that. Um, I don't believe there there is a minimum separation distance in the DCMU zone. Maybe administration can can verify that. Um, we put in the minimum distance between the towers specifically, as that's a known best practice for for tower design, just to ensure there's sufficient light um, and spacing between between those taller buildings. So there isn't a because I I really I wrote down minimum separation decrease between buildings was one of the changes. So yeah, we, we included that just as a precaution because I, I know that often a concern of councils is that well what what happens if this developer sells um, sells the property then mm -hmm. what assurance do we have that um, you know this kind of development will still happen not somebody else's vision so those kinds of parameters put in some constraints on on us to to ensure that uh, what's being presented is what gets built as well. What is the actual separation distance is quite a bit greater at about uh, 50, it's close to 50 meters between between the two towers. Okay, so between and between all the buildings, the minimum is at least 50 meters. Is that correct? What's the closest that you have between any building? I think between closest would be maybe no, it's more than that. It's more than that between buildings. Um, yeah, because that setback is nine meters, so it's it's more like. 20 and minimum 20 meters wall to wall. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. I think that um, minimum separation is just for the buildings over 45 meters. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, okay. Councillor Hansen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wonder if you could comment some of the submissions that came in uh, who are opposed to the project will argue that we're a winter city. We're not um, always a walkable city. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on the trend of becoming a walkable city as a winter city and, and, and how that is unfolding across our country and, and maybe others. And um, we need to understand that a little bit more because it's a good argument. Uh, a lot of people in St. Albert use their cars and are, aren't walking. Um, but we, if we're going to invest in this, we need to really understand what that lifestyle is about. Sure. Um, I can speak to that. I actually, before I worked at our studio, I worked on the winter design guidelines at the city of Edmonton and wrote the bulk of that document. What this is really focusing on is contact design. Um, we also looked at the very start of the site concept, uh, how these open spaces and the spaces between buildings work together with shadow um, creating microclimates where you get maximum solar gains on the south and west sides of buildings. Um, that's why the village square and the plaza are placed as they are. So a large part of that winter design aspect is um, how do you maximize warmth? And so that's with open space, which we've provided here. Um, if you look at the difference between Botanica and the shadow that would create because it's sort of, you know, if you think of a, a freezer box versus a, you know, a taller um, straw almost, <laughs> you've, got, you've got quite a different shadow that stays throughout the day and creates an uncomfortable space. Whereas when you have fast moving shadows, you create more opportunities for people to enjoy those outdoor spaces. So maximizing solar gains is one major aspect of winter design. Another is uh, wind comfort. So creating those comfortable places for pedestrians to be seated. So your napkin's not flying off your, your bistro table or your cup's not flying off or your child's hat's not flying off. Um, another aspect of all this is how do you create outdoor spaces that are comfortable for seniors to walk outside? So having a space that's mixed use and privately, um, privately owned and managed 
you get a lot quicker responses to snow clearance of walkways and maintenance, um, creating fewer slip and fall hazards for, for seniors or people with strollers or children, um, which can be quite a daunting reason why people don't go outside more. So those are a few of the things. Additionally, there's use of color and materials. So using colorful materials, um, colorful landscaping. Um, so you don't have this kind of gray, you know, gray and white sort of dreary experience, um, as well as using creative lighting and architectural lighting to help illuminate those spaces because we have a, you know, barely five hours of sunlight on those days. So there's a there's kind of those five key things of um, you know, solar gains, wind protection, uh, use of landscaping for color um, and for on buildings and uh, creative lighting as well to help create that kind of nice environment for people during those colder months and the shoulder season as well. Where, it, you know, if you're in the sun um, in the winter time, it's actually 10 degrees warmer than, than if you're in the shade. So sitting outside is pretty comfortable at around zero, even if it's around minus 10, which is kind of the average temperature in this region. The, um, it's often- Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good, that's all the questions you had, Councilor Hansen. Uh, yes, although I think Rob was gonna say something else. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say, it's often said that um, perfection is the enemy of the good. To talk about how it becomes walkable, we have real illustrations in Botanica. When we were selling and people were new and moving in there, we didn't have enough parking stalls. There's a demand for parking stalls. Now that they've moved in and live there, they're getting rid of one car. They still keep a car, of course, but they're getting rid of one and we're actually starting to have surplus parking stalls. So um, it's actually happening. Councillor Watkins. I uh, just had a couple questions. What was the maximum the height of the existing Botanica buildings now? We said it was uh, 77. No, that was from grade. So 10, 10 stories. 10 stories, yeah. It is. We'll just look that up for you, just one second. And then just, just a second question while he's looking that up. The, the maximum height presently allowable at the uh, uh, far end of the site that abuts a single family is what? Was it 25 meters or 20? Yeah, that's right. 25 meters is what's allowed right now. Okay, and you want to go, you said that with a reduction, you would step down the seniors building to what height? 33. 33. And the seniors building, uh, is that a step down building? It looked like from the, uh, from the drawing that it, that was the maximum height, 33, and it wasn't as, it wasn't as high in other parts. That's correct, yeah. It has a lot of articulation both in and out and up and down. Okay, so, so the maximum height would be 33 meters. Uh, what would be the lowest height of that building? Would it be 25 meters? Probably be less than that. So, so in summary on the seniors building, there are parts of it that are higher than what's maximum allowed now, but the majority of that building is less than what's allowed now. Is that true? I would say one third is less than what's allowed now. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, thanks. And the height of a tent. It's 128 feet. It's Botanica is 128 feet tall or 36 meters. 36. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's, and that's from grade, 36 meters. Correct, from the back, yeah. From the back, from the lowest point. At 10 stories. And that was uh, built under DC? No, it is, yeah. I might have to ask administration this one because it's funny that you get 36. Botanica yeah. apartments are R4 and shops at Boudreaux are C2 commercial. Okay. <clears throat> that helps, okay. All right, all right, because the whole area is too different. I'll get to administration on that. Um, council, any more questions? Okay, we have about 10 minutes before noon, so we can go to some of the clarification. Did he go ahead, say yeah. one, did you say one third of the building is below the Yes, correct. All right, uh, okay, let's, let's see what we can get through, maybe two members of the public and then we'll take our lunch break. 
So, um, Tamara, are you doing the moving from attendee to panelist? Yes. Okay, and are you sending the, them? Oh, go ahead, Mr. O'Fleur. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm required, I'm required to give you some information at this point in the public hearing. This is pursuant to the procedure bylaw and to the resolution you passed specific to this public hearing. Is this the summary? Yeah, I'm required to give you the numbers as to uh, the, uh, the written submissions received. So up until the deadline that we had posted in our, in our uh, public notice of this hearing, which was at noon last Wednesday, uh, we had received um, 51 written submissions that spoke in favor uh, of, this, uh, of these bylaws being passed and 225 that were opposed. And I should also point out, although I haven't got the precise number, a significant number of those opposed did say that they were opposed to the, the bylaws as presented, but would be willing to soften their position if they thought that the height limits would come down somewhat. Uh, then uh, since that deadline passed, uh, there have been some additional submissions received. Those, of course, would not go in your council package because they came in late, but I'm required to summarize them for you. And here's what happened. In the time since last Wednesday at noon, we have received 12 written submissions in favor of these bylaws and 42 opposed. There was also one that we received that for some reason we just couldn't open. There's some kind of corruption in the file. But uh, apart from that one, again, 12 uh, in, in favor, 42 opposed. So the overall grand total uh, is 63 in favor, 267 opposed. And again, I would, say, I would point out that even of those that came in late, there was a certain number of those, uh, I can't say the exact number, I could get it if you wanted to, but a certain number of those saying they were opposed also said they don't mind like this either in a different location in town or with a lower uh, maximum height limit but they are opposed to it as presented. So there's my, my overall kind of high level summary. So you know what the basic numbers are. Great, thanks. Councillor Hughes, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mary Heron. I just thought of one more question just for comparison's sake to the developer, if, if I can. Uh, yep, we, there's okay. gonna be lots of chances. Question your Yeah, I just, quick. just occurred to me. So you're proposing 500 and change units in this new proposal. How many units are currently in Botanical 1 and 2 combined? Yeah, so we're proposing 466 for Riverbank and Botanica is 252. Okay, so just almost not quite double, like 80% more, so 75% more in comparison. Okay, yeah, and the, the, land, the land area in Riverbank is substantially larger than in Botanica, if I'm remembering correctly. Can I look yeah. it up? Yeah, Botanica sits on four acres, Riverbank is 10 acres. Got it. Thank you, I really appreciate that. That's it, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Councillor Watkins. Um, I just had a question of uh, Mr. LaFleur. Did you say of the 225 opposed, the majority of those said they would soften the position if height was reduced? Uh, to Councillor Watkins, no, not the majority. It was a, oh. it was a significant number, but definitely majority, uh, the, definitely a minority. Or oh. I could put it another way, the majority of those who said they were opposed were just what I would call hard opposed, just opposed without saying anything about, you know, compromise. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, um, you know what, it's 11.53 and I feel like it's almost awkward to let one person speak. So I actually have a quick question for administration. Uh, couple actually, and then we'll take our break and I'll come back and we'll go through some of the procedures for the public. So is Kate still around? <laughs> or any engineer, I, I actually um, had a question about the stormwater filtration. So Jason, thank you. Uh, so the applicant, mentioned in their presentation that um, they were gonna build on-site stormwater storage and uh, they would filter it before releasing it into the Sturgeon River. 
is that a requirement that the city of St. Albert has for, de for developments such as this, or would this be going above and beyond what's required? So uh, on-site oil and grit separator would be requirement. Um, there is existing capacity in one of the storm fall outlets that Kate had alluded to earlier, but the oil and grit separator is sort of the big piece there. Kate, okay. did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, so I can add to that. Sorry about that. Um, an ODI, so an oil and grit interceptor, is kind of a standard requirement in all of our um, mixed use or uh, developments that have commercial involved in them. Um, so it is pretty standard. It would be sized for the capacity that they would be outflowing at. So it would be a bigger one from kind of the sizing that we're typically seeing, but it's not above and beyond. Um, and then they would be using the existing infrastructure, which is a good practice because it just keeps the overall um, cost of operations down and just optimizes the use of what we have in place today. Okay. I, the question occurred to me because I know the city has spent literally millions of dollars in the last five to 10 years installing um, grit separators along, along the river. And so that's just now become standard expectation as opposed to the past. All right, and Christina, um, quick question, because we keep com coming back to comparisons between this proposed development and Botanica. So I just want to be clear and tell me if I'm right or wrong. When we refer to the Botanica, we are talking a residential district and the shops of Bujo are completely separate. That is correct. Uh, the, res the, the Botanica residential portion is our R4 zoning and the um, commercial is our regional commercial zoning. Okay, so when, um... You know, when we hear that Botanic is four acres, it's just pretty much where the, the two residential buildings are. Okay, and then- I do have an image of it if you'd like. Sure. The densities, if that helps. And that, that was gonna be my next question. So we're looking at 135, I think I can't remember. Uh, in 135 uh, developable units per net residential hectare in the, in the proposal. And then what is the Botanica? So Botanica phases one and two on their own property are 191 dwelling units per hectare. If you combine the Botanica apartments and the shops that we grow, you get a 3.6 hectare area, which combined makes a density of 79.13 dwelling units per hectare if it wasn't all in one mix you say. Okay, so the residential itself is much more dense than this proposal, but when you combine it all in, and that's kind of what we probably should be looking at is 79. So the proposal is a little bit more dense. Is that right? Like, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna write that down. 79. Okay. So the proposal density would have been uh, 135.5 dwelling units per hectare. Okay, awesome. Okay, it's just about noon guys. Let's uh, take a break. Write down your questions you have for administration because we'll come back. You can ask more of the applicant later, but I think we'll probably go straight to uh, some of the public. And uh, yeah, half an hour, so 12.30. Enjoy your break. I'll move on to, sorry, does anyone have any questions for uh, administration resulting from, um, hold on, Christina, resulting from the applicant's presentation. We could go to those now. Ken, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, just something you were touching on just as you were ending um, just before lunch, uh, and I'll be quick. Um, I just want a clarification. So the the shops on Boudreaux were initially in land use planning under commercial. The actual Botanica were R4 at that time, and subsequently now the whole entire site is DC. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. Christina, I think it remains that. Yeah, sorry. I misspoke um, when I answered before about the zoning. The current zoning isn't regional commercial. It's general commercial okay. on the, where the shops are. And then R4 residential where the um, apartment buildings are. No okay. longer under direct control. And it's none of it's direct control. They're in specific zoning. 
Okay, so but so right, so that's 100 and 200, right? Uh, or uh, like um, the um, addresses, right? Correct, Susan. Okay. Is that why you had your hand that's, up, Christina? That's the correct. I think that's. I think those are the correct addresses. Yes. Yeah, the, 100 and 200. Yeah, okay. the the buildings that are built right now, right, and are being built. Yes. Okay. All right, and the but the um, the changes in the bylaw are for 200, uh, 250 and up to 300 and they're currently DC. Yes, correct. Okay, now I'm, I'm good. I'm sorry, you had me a little confused in your previous question. Sure. Thank okay. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to I'm not see any more hands up. So I'm going to go to the public presentations now. So um, I'm just going to read some procedural things. So there'll be no debate on this matter during the public hearing. Submission by presenters will only be for the purpose of providing information or stating the position that the speaker takes on this matter. Debate will uh, occur in consideration of second and third reading. And so it's nice, honestly, that Sandy Clark is our first speaker, friendly face, because this will be the first time I'm actually timing speakers myself. So she's our test subject. So <laughs> we're going to be, um, as I said earlier, really sticking tightly to the five minute allowance uh, for the members of the public listening. I only see 49 attendees and they're more than that that are registered. So I'm not sure exactly sure how that's gonna work, but um, I, I don't think I'll be able to repeat this. So uh, either Tamara or Cheryl, I can't remember which one has a bell and they will ring the bell at the four and a half minute mark. Uh, it will be my responsibility to mute. We did not wanna put that responsibility onto our administrative staff. Uh, I'll get to you right away, Renee. Um, and so I, I have a timer on my screen. It might be slightly different from Tamara or Cheryl's, but it will be as close as we can get. And then I can hover over your face and push mute if the conversation is still going. So um, council's gonna hold questions to the very end of all the public presentations. So council, if you have questions for specific uh, presenters, write down their name and the question, and uh, we can come back to them. Uh, so, and I just want to remind everybody that the public is here to not, uh, to give um, their opinion on this. They're not here to be asking questions of council administration or the applicant. This is council's time to ask questions, not vice versa. So we will not be taking questions from the public. So, you know, if you want to ask a question in general, you can say uh, during debate, I would like to hear a counselor's position on this. But you know, the specifics and the technical are, are not for council to respond to and not for administration. There's been there's been months of uh, opportunities for that. So, and then if I, we're gonna hope that the presentations don't become too repetitive, we're looking for honestly your, your position opposed or against and, uh, and maybe any new information that we might not have considered. So Sandy, since you're the first one, you know, all information is new. <laughs> so it will be when it gets near the end uh, that, you know, some of it can get a little repetitive. So I'm just going to try to ask the members of the public to, to try to listen to the people in front of you so we can try to make this um, as streamlined as possible. Council, before I go any further, Renee had her hand up and then I see Councilor Hughes. So Renee, go ahead. I just wanted to let you know that I, I have the bell. Okay, she's the bell ringer. Okay, and Councilor Hughes. Um, yeah, I know that since we're asking for questions at the end, if it's possible, if the speakers have an issue with height, because I'm just predicting that they some may, if they can let us know what a height would be, if it's more acceptable to them, so we don't have to go back and ask them later, okay. that would be helpful. That's it. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm seeing no more questions. All right, so Sandy, let's give this a try. Here are my first. Uh, presenter in this public hearing with me somewhat in control of, of the technical side of it. So I'm going to start the timer at five minutes. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Councillors, Administration, and fellow St. Albertans. I thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue today. When we moved to Oakmont in 2014, we did our due diligence. 
If this amendment is allowed, that governance has shockingly failed in St. Albert. The developer has shown us glossy photos, stated what their vision might be, made empty promises that do not have to be kept, like renaming and changing access to 300 Orchard or building certain types of residential buildings and profiles. Developers come and go, developers' visions change. Boudreaux's proposal has changed at every turn. These proposed amendments will back our community and our development officers into a corner. The unintended consequences are huge. The current C2 commercial designation at 15 meter max heights already allows this developer to do all the things he plans. Restaurants, retail shops, professional offices, which I believe this community would embrace. Everything except the residential. This community is speaking out loud and clear on that change. With this DCMU, the proposed 500 units could become 1250. Access points could move to see all of the density empty onto Orchard Court directly into the Oakmont community. Three towers may become numerous low profile residential buildings with thousands more residents. In September 2019, Dave Hout said, and I quote, we have a choice. We could do lower, longer, big buildings that cast bigger shadows and take up more scenery. He confirmed he has choices if this amendment is allowed. The community will be at the whim of the developer if he is successful in getting this amendment. When asked if he would live on Orchard Court, he said, and I quote, I don't know. You've got this tower overlooking you. We will do what we can for privacy and everything else, but let's face it, it's a tower. If this developer has so little faith in his development that he won't live here, how can he expect support for this? If asked the question, what is your vision? It is the, that the current ASP and land use bylaw remain unchanged. During the last several weeks, my partner and I have visited over 160 homes in Oakmont to discuss the developer's proposal. And we spoke with more than two thirds of those residents. No one is in favor. Some asked if they could sell, should sell before construction begins. A lot didn't believe their voice would matter. Many are angry. Some can't speak out because their jobs preclude them from making public statements. Many have sent emails and letters in opposition weeks ago. I don't see some of their letters in either package to council. Realtors we met have serious concerns about the impact this development will have on selling homes. One said he currently can't sell properties on Orchard Court because of this proposed development. The appraiser's report in Mr. Barclay's submission says that the Oakmont and Aaron, that Oakmont and Aaron Ridge will be negatively impacted by this development. The report done June 15th anticipates a five to 9% decrease in property values if this development proceeds. Is that what city council is going to allow to happen to this community? The impacts of this proposed development are so far reaching. Property values, shadowing, traffic, privacy, and so much more. I also note that the sunshade study doesn't speak to the March through uh, September timeframe, five to seven uh, in the evening. Google Maps tells me that it takes nine minutes to drive from my home to service place for a 645 workout but I leave my home 45 to 15 minutes early to get there in time. Six to eight lights while I sit wait, waiting north of Evergreen. The cause, traffic congestion at Belrose and Boudreaux. And that's before the doors of Botanica 2 opened. Is it reasonable to take nearly one hour to make a nine minute drive? My neighbor tells me that he travels through Sturgeon County to his workplace in Campbell Business Park to avoid the traffic congestion at Belrose and Boudreaux. This proposed complex, while it may be the developer's vision, is clearly not my vision or my expectation. I thank you for listening and I hope that the impact of the presentations of each and every resident in opposition today will resonate with this council in making the right choice, and that is to say no to all not just some of these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. And you did a great job of keeping it under five minutes. Excellent. And then council, just so you know, uh, uh, Tamara is letting in the next speaker kind of in, in a waiting room. So I think the next on my list is Jessica. And I'm gonna say this right now to every member of the public, if I uh, mispronounce your last name, please correct me and I 
apologize ahead of time, but it looks like Car Carnival, which is kind of a cool last name. So is Jessica in the waiting room, Tamara? All right, go ahead. Uh, she seems to have dropped off, Mayor Heron. Okay, why don't we, um, can, you, can you send her a message and we'll go to the next one for now? So Donald Thompson. I see Donald there, but I don't see a video turned on. Donald, can you hear us? Hello? Hello, Don, how are you? Oh, sorry for all that. I, I'm very sorry. That's okay. You might have a another device on with this meeting, maybe YouTube or... I, I don't know. I, I'm ready to go. No, that's, that's perfect. Okay, so you have five minutes. Go ahead. I'm here to state the firm opposition of my wife and I to Riverbank Landing, a mega proposal of environmentally sensitive area of the Sturgeon River and on top of and looming over a mature community. We are opposed to the three bylaws that are in front of you and ask council to vote against each of these three bylaws. In purchasing our home in Oakmont 14 years ago, we were comforted by the city's commitments made in many documents from the Oakmont area structure plan to planning and strategic documents. The Botanic Art City has consistently told us that it valued and sought to protect and improve the character of the city and the Sturgeon River and its valley. Indeed, Mayor Heron, in the city's most recent strategic plan, you stated that everything in that plan would be accomplished, quote, while protecting the natural environment that is such an important part of our heritage and our character. This commitment reassured us yet again that protection of the character of St. Albert, its small town feel, and the natural environment running through it was the overriding caveat on the city's planning. But in our view, Riverbank Landing makes a mockery of the city's past planning commitments. Now, there are many development issues, but I only want to talk to two. First is the lack of good faith on the part of the city. People, including ourselves, bought property in St. Albert because of the strategic and planning commitments made to us with respect to future development of the surrounding lands. Riverbank Landing flies in the face of those commitments. Nobody can honestly say that Riverbank Landing would not negatively impact the character of the city and the Sturgeon River Valley, or that is consistent with the past commitments made to property owners. In our view, City Council owes its fiduciary duty to the current taxpayers and property owners, not to future ones or to land developers. It is patently unfair to property owners to change an area structure plan and supporting bylaws to this degree and this far after the fact. Indeed, allowing this magnitude of the change would remove the ability of anybody to rely on area structure plans in the future and would demonstrate lack of good faith by this council to its current taxpayers. Secondly, impacts to the river valley. The Sturgeon River and Valley bisects the city and is clearly the environmental and scenic backbone of our heritage and our character. Certainly nobody can accept that 69 stories of development, restaurants, offices, a conference center, residences, smack on the riverbank would not permanently and adversely impact the environment of the Sturgeon Corridor. Beyond this, the magnitude of the proposed development would visually overwhelm the river valley and be incompatible with the existing developments. This proposal is grossly out of character and out of proportion with both the Sturgeon River Valley and the surrounding existing developments 
incompatible with the many promises the city has made to protect and enhance the River Valley, the most recent of which was made only weeks ago in the Sturgeon River Watershed Plan. As current taxpayers and property owners, we're requesting you show your good faith to the existing property owners and taxpayers, honor your longstanding commitments that you have made in your strategic plans, area structure plans, land use bylaws, Sturgeon River watershed plans, and simply do as you say you will do. Protect the crown jewel of the city, the Sturgeon River corridor. We are asking you to vote against each of the three bylaws that are in front of you today. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And I'm going to guess uh, the next person on the list is Marion Thompson. That might be your wife. Hello? You've got to start your video. Hello? Hello. Hello. Hello, Marion. <laughs> We're yeah, good. It is husband and wife. My turn. Okay. So, can you can you see me now? I see a little um, muppet. Okay. All right. Okay. There we go. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I too am firmly opposed to the three bylaws that are here in front of you today. And I ask that council vote against these three bylaws. Uh, my husband and I started looking for our retirement home about 15 years ago. We crossed many places off our list. Not until we came to St. Albert did we truly feel we'd found a home. Green spaces, the river in its valley, the trails the lack of congestion, high rises, noise, the small town feel. Wow. We did not mind paying two and a half times the taxes we paid in our last location. We were paying for the location. Over the years, we have paid many tens of thousands of dollars of extra taxes to live in St. Albert. We had no problem with this. But St. Albert is slowly but surely drifting from its roots. Riverbank Landing is yet another slap in the face to the promises the Botanic Arts City has made to its taxpayers and property owners. Promises to protect and enhance the river and its valley and to protect and improve the character of the city. We already have condos and shops where the beloved Holes Greenhouse used to be. The second Botanica building is already far too close to the river. And now the Rotary Mega Seniors Development by Canadian Tire is also pinching in on the River Valley. Traffic, congestion on the roads and trails, noise, these are now all part of St. Albert. This is enough. Riverbank Landing is simply too big and it is squeezed into a mature area. Shops, restaurants, a convention center, high rise condos. My head aches thinking of the mega traffic, parking and congestion this will bring. Riverbank Landing will force an entire section of the city to endure at least 10 years of construction, add a significant volume of traffic through an already overcapacity roadway, cast shadows on citizens' homes, bought based upon their understanding of the then approved development plans, create a demand for new supporting infrastructure, create vertical sprawl. The proposed oversized towers are overwhelmingly out of proportion to everything around them and will negatively impact the Sturgeon River and its environs. The fact is that this proposal is simply out of character with St. Albert. So I ask the council vote against each of the three bylaws before you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion. All right. Um, Tamara, do we have Jessica? Mara, you're muted. We have Julie is next. Jessica okay. hasn't come back. Yes, okay, so all right, is Julie in? Yeah. Julie, can you hear me?
Hello? Hello, there she is. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, go ahead. Hello, Mayor Heron and Councillors. My name is Julie Dekowicz, and I have been a proud resident of St. Albert for 35 years. I am opposed to the three bylaws that are in front of you today. I hope council votes against these three bylaws. When my husband and I got married, we started looking for a home to begin our life together and raise our family. In. We found exactly what we knew we wanted to stay in St. Albert as we both grew up here. We found exactly what we were looking for in the evergreens of Erin Ridge. We knew Holes had planned to move and the land they previously owned was to be sold. We did our due diligence by asking our realtor to look up what the land was zoned for so we knew what would be eventually built there. According to the ASP, the land was zoned for low density housing and commercial. I would like to point out at this time that the developer was also aware of what the land was zoned for when they purchased it. We chose our house because of the location, paths, parks, access to the river valley, and most importantly, because it was in an established neighborhood. We value our quiet streets, our neighbors and spacious lots. We chose to invest our life savings to purchase a home in a quiet, single family home community because that is what we value and what we want our children to grow up in and experience just as we did. I'd like to show you two pictures. <laughs> These are our children. We want them to enjoy the St. Albert. Both my husband and I were incredibly fortunate to have. One of my major concerns is traffic safety and density of vehicles on Bell Rose. My son attended kindergarten this past fall at Neil and Ross. With little to no traffic, it'd take me about five minutes to get there. Now, thinking about traffic in the mornings around 8 a.m., of course that time would maybe double to 10 minutes if the weather's good, as it is when most people are commuting to work. On average, it took me 17 to 22 minutes to drive my son to school when the weather conditions were good. I would be stuck at the intersection of Bell Rose and Evergreen Drive for three to four light changes. The traffic coming down the hill is so dense that even if the light is red for the people on Bell Rose, I am unable to turn right on a green light because the traffic is sitting at the red light at Bell Rose and Booth Road. I've read over the traffic studies and recommendations and I'm not satisfied that the problem of traffic volume will be corrected with the suggestions. Different times or AI lights extending the turning lane, turning lane light, late will not ease the congestion of this area. The road was simply not designed to deal with such heavy traffic. I would like to point out that traffic volume is heavy and phase two of Botanica hasn't even opened yet. In speaking about this proposed development, the developer house was quoted by the Gazette in an article published Wednesday, June 17th as saying, given the size of it, the complementary uses that are already developed adjacent to the river and the two major arterial roads in St. Albert really create this unique opportunity. The problem is, it may be on the corner of two arterial roads. It's only accessible by one. Back in 2014, my son was three weeks old and he began to choke. He turned blue, then white. His body was limp. Within four minutes of calling 911, a fire truck and ambulance arrived and they were in my house, saving my son's life. I'm incredibly grateful that they were able to get to my house as quickly as they did. Now, heavens forbid I need to call emergency services between seven and nine and four and seven in the afternoon. The intersection of Belro and Boudreaux is so congested, they would not make it to my house in such a timely manner. In conclusion, I am opposed to the three bylaws that are in front of you today. Please listen to the residents. I hope council does the right thing for the future of St. Albert and votes against these three bylaws. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. All right. Um, I'm going to keep, Tamara, I'm going to keep checking if Jessica's back in. No? Okay. Ken Crutchfield is next. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Come on, video. Oh, wait. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Heron and Council, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I will be speaking today on behalf of my wife, Valerie, and myself. We are opposed to the development as proposed by Boudreaux Communities Limited. Consultation has set the foundation for what we see in the design and quality of our present day community. You are stewards for ensuring St. Albert is developed in accordance with the vision set out by the residents through consultation. These visions have been set out in a variety of key planning documents that are regularly updated to reflect societal and market changes. Let me begin by saying that we are not opposed to commercial development like the shops of Boudreaux and development of residential buildings on the targeted lands. But it is conditional on the provision of wide setbacks from the adjacent Red Willow Park and Ravine Green Space, as well as fitting the scale of development to the surrounding community. These public hearings highlight a clash of visions. Boudreaux Communities Limited is wishing to pursue a radically different range of development that deviates in scope, scale, and siting from surrounding development and directly imp impacts these adjacent uses. Various St. Albert plans reveal the subject lands are outside of the 800 meter radius of a potential future light rail transit alignment along St. Albert Trail and does not conform to present municipal development plan plans for transit oriented development. The existing municipal development plan future land use map clearly delineates that in intensification should be directed to regional and district shopping centers, transit oriented development and urban village. The targeted lands and associated botanica and shops of Boudreaux commercial development are not uh, identified as a site for uh, intensification. Those intensification zones are associated with the downtown core and transit oriented development. From our perspective, the current land use zoning is appropriate. 230 and 250 Bellrose Drive are presently zoned for commercial use and merit consideration for mixed use. 300 Orchard Court affords the, an opportunity to build a transition between commercial and adjacent single, single use residences. Superimposing an expansion of development possibilities for all three properties is not in the best interest of St. Albert. A projected increase in residential tax revenue is not a windfall because it does come with service obligations. The proposed land development is not a cash cow and should not be the objective Council weighs heavily on in making its decision. This council, like others before it, has an overriding duty to honor the longstanding direction residents have supported for the development of the Oakmont neighborhood. Council should not, on the one hand, extol the merits of public consultation as a pillar in framing the current municipal development plan update, and then choose to ignore that advice once it has been accepted. Council needs to safeguard the trust that residents put into elected officials and the staff that support them to ensure St. Albert is developed in a fair and pragmatic way that will benefit residents and businesses into the future. In conclusion, we offer five positional statements for moving forward. They include, one, we are in agreement with administration that the targeted lands are not suitable for the kind of proposed development associated with the application. Two, we agree with administration's recommendation that council unconditionally reject proposal bylaw 13 2020. Three, we are supportive of bylaw 12 2020, provided Schedule A only identifies a rezoning of 230 and 250 Bellrose Drive to direct to mixed use. On amendment, council should also direct that the development officer ensure development and building setbacks from the Sturgeon River break are in the order of 30 meters and building heights are restricted to 15 meter maximum. Four, 300 Orchard Court should be removed from the rezoning under bylaw 11, 2020 and continued to be identified as a res residential zoning in schedule A under bylaw 12, 2020. Finally, point five, amend the Oakmont area structure plan to include completion of a public trail on public lands along the north side of the Sturgeon River. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Ken. If you've been here before, you know how to keep it under five, so appreciate that. Okay. All right. Now we are going to Anton Kalishchuk. Hello, 
Was. Did I say that okay? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Mayor Heron and Councillors. My name is Anton Polishak, resident of Orchard Court, and I'm here today in opposition to propose changes to the three bylaws that are in front of you today. I hope that Council votes against amending these three bylaws. One of the main reasons our family moved to St. Albert and chose an established neighborhood was to get away from the concrete jungle with its busy streets and never ending construction. Purchase of a home is a lifetime investment as well as the most expensive purchase we had to date. Proposed development will negatively impact the values of neighboring properties as per Gettle Appraisals LTD value impact assessment, which projected losses within five to 9% range. Above document was submitted to the city for review. Owners of surrounding properties could not have anticipated the possibility of proposed changes to Oakmont area structure plan and a construction of such magnitude when purchased their homes and would not want to live in a mega construction zone for the next decade, nor incur a financial loss if proposed development is approved. Residents will be entrapped by this development if forced to sell under current marking conditions, in addition to five to 9% loss, or endure 10 years of construction and then still sell at a loss. It raises a question, who will be accountable for our losses? I'm curious if those voting in favor are acting in the best interest of tax paying residents. And I would like to hear an answer to that during the debate. I would like to also emphasize that we are not opposing a proposed development in general, but we are strongly against the location and the proposed magnitude. We are confident that there are better suited places for such a development where it will not pose a myriad of issues such as traffic, shadowing, privacy, over intensification, and further elimination of the green belt along the Sturgeon River, which will permanently impact wildlife and have an adverse environmental consequences on the local ecosystem. Proposed development, if approved, will forever change San Albert skyline, converting a well-established neighborhood in the heart of the Botanical Arts City into a concrete jungle, which in turn will put an end to the small town feel our city is well known for. Such a development will have a fear, such a development will have a far reaching implications on infrastructure, safety and diminished quality of life. We all love and enjoy St. Albert and everything it has to offer today which is a result of a long-standing collaboration between the city and the residents. Today, T8N has come together to say no to mega towers. Are you with T8N? Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Tamara, is Jessica here? <laughs> okay, and just so everyone knows, I, I did skip um, number six on the list. I think it's pronounced Owen Merck, Merky, Merck, that I, I was sent an email that they were part of the development team. So they already had their opportunity to speak. So in case you're wondering. Uh, and the same with uh, Steven Nutzenberger, which was number eight. So if you wonder why I skipped over though, that's why. So now we are on to Chuck McNutt. Hello, Chuck, thank you for joining us. Hello. Um... Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, make this presentation today. Uh, I've been a long time resident of St. Albert for almost 50 years now. I've been a developer and a builder and a professional planner for uh, over 30 years. I've seen the proposal for the development on the whole commercial greenhouse site. And I'm here in opposition to it. I have also previously submitted a letter of opposition a few weeks ago. Although there are many reasons why development of this magnitude is inappropriate for the whole site, as a planner and local resident, I'm mostly concerned about the building heights being requested and the changes to the neighborhood character that will, will result if this development proceeds. Impacts such as sun shadows, pedestrian level winds, traffic, and those affected by the river valley are significant and will likely be addressed by others, but I will limit my remarks to my area of practice as a professional planner. Now, as such, I'd like to touch on a couple of topics being the public consultation approach, some planning policy implications, the neighborhood character, 
livability and maybe a few remarks at the end. Um, basically, I think that there is five general accepted levels of public engagement in more, most planning projects to inform, to consult, to involve, collaborate, and empower. Um, and I think that uh, this one really had the, the first one in hand, basically informing. Uh, they had a presentation. It's really a one-way flow of information. Um, they went back. They asked a little bit more questions. They, they didn't really uh, end up doing a whole lot. I think they could have done a little bit more by maybe having a focus group, maybe some design meetings, that type of thing, and, and asking a little bit more input into the design. I attended the open house in September and again in January and noticed the obvious and overwhelming opposition to, to, to the proposal. What I saw was an open house with a presentation by the developer followed by overwhelming opposition to huge towers and traffic. I think that response should have triggered a different approach instead of a second open house with no presentation, no response to the concerns that were expressed from the first open house. I think more engagement was uh, appropriate for a project of this significance. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about planning policies and principles, uh, particularly with respect to the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Growth Plan. Um, intensification is identified in Objective 4.2 to enable growth within built-up urban areas. And specifically, Policy 4.2.2 reads that identification will be directed to rural centers, sub-regional centers, urban centers, which is St. Albert's downtown, TOD centers, Metropolitan Core, Edmonton's downtown Brownfield and long transit corridors at a form and scale appropriate to the community and corresponding level of service. And they went on to identify those in schedule two on page 27. So for section 4.1 of the policy implementation or identifies policy imp implementation and offers specific direction and clarity on how to interpret the growth plan. All instances of the word must, shall, or will are elements that municipalities must conform with through their statutory plans to fully implement this plan. Section 4.2.2 states intensification will be directed and at a form and scale appropriate to the community. The proposed ASP amendment to direct densification to an infill neighborhood directly conflicts with policy 4.2.2 of the growth plan. S section 708.12 of the MGA bars a municipality from adopting an ASP that conflicts with or is consistent with, inconsistent with the growth plan. So I really think that council actually lacks jurisdiction to adopt the ASP on the basis of the municipal growth plan. In terms of the MDP policies, um, there's nine guiding principles um, that direct the development of our city. And five of those nine guiding principles directly or indirectly affect this development. One of them is our small town atmosphere and a quality of community life. Our St. Albert strengths talks about the downtown as the traditional heart of the community, the beauty and nature, feeds people's souls from natural areas, including the river valley, parks and trails. The Red Willow Park is a gift that we need to, um, to treat with care and respect. And St. Albert needs a safe, efficient flow of traffic while maintaining the serenity and safety of our neighborhoods. I think the, the uh, section on the um, future land use policy, section 3.1 is also in confliction here. Uh, map two of the future land use policy depicts the area as residential. Amending the Oakmont ASP to include a mixed use with commercial is inconsistent with the future man use, uh, land use map. Um, it identifies as residential and would need to be amended. Um, the policies 4.10 talk about low density infill in existing neighborhoods and suggest that they need to be compatible in height, scale, and design of other buildings in the neighborhood. You need to have continuity with nearby streetscapes and lotting and compatibility with surrounding land uses. And section six on the downtown is basically devoted to the downtown to encourage the growth in the downtown. Um, I'm running out of time. So I will just sum up. Yep, that I've got you at five minutes now, Mr. McGuire. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that's my timer. All right, thank you for coming. Um, I see Mr. Mike Gillick already ready to go. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Mike Killick, and I'm opposed to all three bylaw changes being considered today. Uh, but first, I have a process concern. Many of I know many of the written submission have the sender's email blacked out uh, in your uh, council packages, but their phone numbers are still shown. And I believe this does not uh, follow the FOIA Protection of Privacy Act. I am opposed particularly due to the traffic issues, loss of privacy, shadowing, 
change to zoning in an established ASAP, ASP. During other rezoning applications, I've heard council comments about shadowing saying we don't own the sky, but we do share it. These two 26 story mega towers would block out the sky from being shared by existing homeowners. I've heard comments that we need densification. However, leaving the current zoning as, as is already achieves the housing density target set for the Oakmont ASP. I've heard that traffic is already an issue. In the developer's document, it shows that the right in, right out uh, road is in fact a public road. I believe this shifts the burden on any future traffic problems to the city and city taxpayers to solve. I've heard comments that St. Albert needs more business tax base. Well, the current zoning already supports more commercial development. And the developer has just said today that the current commercial is already doing very well with the existing uh, residential density. I've heard comments that this might be just NIMBY. I'm very concerned that this was to be approved, but set a disastrous precedent for rezoning of any land in St. Albert. This is just not an Oakmont backyards, but could be in anyone's backyards. Just three possible examples come to mind or along our beautiful River Valley. The Red, for example, the Red Willow Badminton Club could move to another location and apply to rezone their land for high rise towers. Canadian Tire could move to a new location and apply to rezone their, long, their land along the river for high rise towers. And the old standard general site could also apply to rezone for high rise towers. I've heard council say change is always hard when it comes to rezoning, but what's actually hard is to say no to a developer. However, interestingly, many cities have, have done just that. Hamilton restricts rezoning to protect views of Lake Ontario. Montreal restricts heights and rezoning of buildings to protect views of Mount Royal. And Vancouver has 27 restricted view corridors, corridors where building heights are severely restricted. These have been in place since 1989 and were based on input from residents. One of these, interestingly, is actually mentioned by the developers along False Creek where they've re severely restricted high rise towers from being built to block existing residents view of False Creek. Vancouver Council has stated views, has stated, and I quote, views should be protected and are not for sale to the highest bidder. Vancouver Planning Department has, has said, and I quote, allowing tall towers in these restricted areas weakens the character of urban planning in these zones. The height restrictions must be maintained so everyone can enjoy the views and quality of life, not just the tower dwellers. And allowing tall towers in these zones undermines the city's ability to resist other developers who might want to do the same. I've heard it's hard to say no to a developer because they own the land. Well, the developer knew what the zoning was when he bought the land and base this purchase and investment on the existing zoning. So council should feel no pressure to change any of the zoning. I also note that the developer mentioned the Gazette poll. Well, it's not a scientific poll in the paper. They actually, um, anyone can vote multiple times, any device that can access the web. For example, I have five devices in my home and I can vote five times on any one particular item. So the St. Albert Gazette poll that was quoted uh, should be viewed with caution because it can be very easy to stack the deck in either direction of that, uh, of that poll uh, in the Gazette. I also find it quite ironic that the developer used the quote today by Winston Churchill saying, we shape our buildings, afterwards they shape us. Mr. Kill, I apologize, the five minutes is up. That's my timer. Now we have Audrey Marples and she's here waiting. Go ahead. Okay, Audrey, 
I'm going to pause the timer for two secs because although it doesn't appear that you're muted, we cannot hear you. So I don't know if your mic is not hooked up correctly. I'll give you a chance to figure it out. If you go and hover your mouse over the mute button at the lower left hand corner, you can click on it and then you can there's there might be different choices of microphones, you could try selecting a different one. I think I hear you now say. Nope. Oh, brother. I, uh, I hope that doesn't happen to me. Shit. I can hear Tom. Tamir, can you make sure everyone's muted except for Audrey? Thank you. And Audrey, don't panic. We can come back to you. Okay. Okay. Why don't we go to um who's next tony audrey has sound now mayor heron oh say something audrey can you hear me now yes we can okay oh great i'm so sorry about that oh. it's not your fault. that's not your fault this is everyone's first attempt really at a public <laughs> hearing with zoom so i i will totally restart your timer and okay. can start now okay thank you very much good afternoon madam mayor city councillors and fellow st albert residents I'm trying to adjust um, my speech a little bit. I probably won't take my full time because there's most of my points have been raised and, and really well by the uh, previous presenters. Um, I would just like to say I'm opposed to all three of the bylaws. Um, I've been, I'm a resident of Erin Ridge and I grew up in St. Albert and my husband Stan and I have raised our family here and we love St. Albert, we love living here. I am a supporter of development and local businesses and realize that in order to move forward and grow, we must be willing to accept some change. I think the Botanica and shops of Boudreaux have turned out quite nice and are a great addition to our community. The architecture is well done and the project overall has turned out quite well, despite taking years and years to complete. Having said that, there has been a significant amount of turnover in the small shops and the commercial buildings and spaces are still empty after several years. The residential buildings have taken a very long time to build and from what I understand are not completely sold out. Despite these factors, I still believe this is a good project for our community as it brings services closer and more residential options for St. Albert residents. However, I must say I strongly oppose the Riverbank Landing Development as currently proposed. I believe these would be the tallest towers in St. Albert, centered in the middle of significant existing residential properties. They would be more suitable in downtown Edmonton. Obviously, this is a change in use and requires a zoning change, so I suggest you consider this long and hard. This is in my backyard, which makes the situation personal to me, but consider if it was in your backyard. Um, in normal times, pre COVID, I would often wait 20 minutes to come down the hill on Bellrose Drive. And I think that um, the suggestions from the developer for traffic would help the current situation, but I can't see it um, coping with an, an additional 500 residents. Um, um, I also understand that the more density the developer can get, the more money they will make. It also means more tax dollars for the city and council. And as someone else raised, this isn't you know, you have to provide more services. I don't know if our, our current fire services could cope with, with heights of, of these towers. So that would involve more infrastructure as well. Um, money is obviously the key driver here. I know St. Albert's property tax mill rate has always been high and in general residents accept that because they are willing to pay a premium for services and to live in a community with certain characteristics. I feel that this development will devalue the properties close by as people don't want to live next to high towers as well as deal with traffic congestion. Maybe the city will see more revenue in terms of tax dollars from the development, but if towers like this start popping up all over the city, people will be less willing to pay the premium rate for their residential property tax. 
again, in my experience, there's a limit to what people are willing to pay. And if they don't feel they are getting value for money, they will go elsewhere. In closing, I think this development as currently proposed sets a very bad precedent for the community and for St. Albert in general. I think it would be a good idea to consider scaling it back and making changes so this development fits with the current characteristics of Oakmont. Please continue to consider this proposal long and hard and reject the three bylaws because I feel this would negatively change the face of St. Albert for the future. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you so much, Audrey. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. All right, we have, is it, is it Rafate, Tony Rafate? Yeah, Rafat. Rafat. Okay. Thank you for joining us. You, uh, I'm going to just start the time. will give me one sec. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Thanks very much for allowing me to speak today on this very important issue. Uh, my name is Tony Rafat, and my wife and I have lived in Oakmont for the past 12 years and have uh, very much enjoyed our time there. And I want to start by uh, requesting that I am opposed or stating that I am opposed to the three uh, bylaws in front of you, to changes to those bylaws. I just want to make that clear up front. Now I'd like to give you my reasons why I would ask you to oppose those bylaws. So I'm not opposed to responsible and appropriate development. I am opposed to uh, inappropriate development and I feel that if this development was to go forward uh, it would be very much out of character and inappropriate for the area in question. Now when I considered speaking here I, I thought of a number of aspects of this that I was concerned about and one of my greatest concerns and we've heard this a little bit we've heard about the traffic concerns right. Um, my major concern about traffic flow the expected increase in traffic flow if this development were to go ahead would be the impact on access to emergency services. So let's say for instance that we add two to three hundred additional vehicles per day to the traffic flow. All right and during the end of day rush hour the concentration of vehicles on northbound Belrose and at the intersection of Boudreaux and Belrose will hinder and most likely prevent the timely response of EMS and police into Oakmont and large sections of Erin Ridge. As you well know, Belrose Drive cannot be widened. You can't add another lane. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to accommodate this expected increase in vehicles. So let's do a scenario. Let's, I'll, I just came up with this. It's 5.45 in the afternoon on a Wednesday. Mr. Smith, who lives in Oakmont, suddenly develops some very severe chest pains. Well, typically, I mean, a call would be made to 911. His, his wife, let's say, will make a call to 911. And normally, they would have response within seven minutes. And that is based on the 2018 Monthly Emergency Medical Services Activity Summary for St. Albert. But in this case, the ambulance is stuck in traffic. It can't get through. I guess they could try driving on the sidewalk. Here? If you're in the school, there's someone waiting for you by your office. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a teacher at Gish. So Thank you. We, have to be, we have to be in today. So I thought I'd do it from here. Um, yeah, so the uh, ambulance can't get through. Fire can't get through. And if you look at the police side, well, they've got two entrances and exits there. And my wife's an RCMP officer and she was here for five years. And she said, you know, it was always a challenge to be able to get out of there and to get into the traffic flow. So now I, I typically commute to work uh, Monday to Friday, right? So I come here to Gish and I leave about 7.45. And trying to make that left turn I can't count the number of times that I've turned off Oakmont Drive. I get about a third of the way down the hill, the Belrose Hill, and I just stop. And you sit there and you wait for the light at Evergreen, then you wait for the light at Boudreaux, and you wait and wait. Now that's bad enough. And would that be really impacted 
buy the new towers? Oh, sure. Well, those guys have to come out somehow, right? And if that's two to 300 more vehicles and I'm being conservative, I don't know where that goes. Maybe I need to ride my bike more. I actually rode it today, but I'm not gonna do that in January, right? So, and what about everybody else? Um, you know, I also, okay. Well, thank you very much. I just want to wrap up in saying then that um, I trust you understand my concerns and the concerns of many of my neighbors and that you guys will not make these changes to those bylaws. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You had exactly three seconds left, so good timing. All right, moving on. Uh, we have Claude Raken. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Honorable Madam Mayor and Council. My name is Claude Reckon. I've been a resident of St. Albert for 33 years. This is my first time addressing council in 33 years. We moved to Orion Close 23 years ago and our house is number, number 20 is within a hundred meters of this proposed, uh, the site affected by these proposed proceedings. I'm opposed to these three amendments uh, um, and ask that you not approve them. Um, I voted for many of you and now ask that you give fair weight to my comments as a long-term resident, but also as a resident, someone involved through the home, residential home building industry as a contributor to someone who's helped build the city. My wife suffers from a season, seasonal affective disorder and that's why my wife and I sought out a south facing yard with a walkout exposure so that we could maximize south facing glass to optimize wintertime light levels. If you as council approve these amendments and this project is built as proposed, Colleen and I will never again see the sunshine in our backyard after 3 p.m. for six months of the year. Um, the same six months where light levels are at their lowest. Um, the city, we have all sorts of bylaws protecting the environment, wildlife, even pests like magpies. Um, the people you were elected to serve are far more important than wildlife. Um, according to the Canadian Mental Health Association, about 10% of the population suffer from seasonal affective disorder. I'm asking you to recognize that these amendments will do harm to the residents whom you serve who suffer with this disorder as my wife does. My second concern is for the wider St. Albert community. Not walling off the river valley has been mentioned several times. Madam Mayor, I heard you say in an interview a few weeks ago in referring to residential satisfaction survey of those happy with living here, 99% cite green spaces and the River Valley as, as the main reason. In a quest for higher density, whether it has been deliberate or inadvertent, we have uh, begun the process of walling off the river bank from Caradon Village by Canadian Tire to Botanica 1 and then Botanica 2. Now I heard the developers say they are trying to minimize this effect, but there still will be a um, cumulative effect of adding yet one more project. I am opposed, I'm not impressed with the bait and switch when it comes to development. When people choose to invest and put down roots in a community only to have council amend the area structure plan and the land use bylaws to eclipse the features that attracted the residents in the first place, that's not fair. Um, to take away some of the view of the valley or the sunlight for that matter and use it as an incentive to attract new investors is a betrayal to your original residents. Um, this proposal, this project is a good in concept, but it is absolutely the wrong location. Um, in closing, I've addressed the shading and aesthetic sight lines, but there are other concerns that you've heard, the construction noise, the traffic congestion, the neighborhood density, heck, even the buildup of electromagnetic radiation from another 500 Wi-Fi boosters and a thousand cell phone signals. Um, for all these reasons, I'm opposed to these bylaw changes and I hope that you as council will vote against these amendments. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Claude. Uh, moving on, I have 
Dan Menard, but I don't, has he been let in, Tamara? Dan is not here. Dan, okay. Not so here. we'll come back, see if he joins us. How about Jessica? Uh, we have Dawn next. Okay, we'll go on to Dawn, because I see his video is on. Welcome to our public hearing, Don. You have, uh, I'll just, anytime you're ready to start. Thank you. Good day, Mayor Heron and Councillors. My name is Don Yon, and my family and I have been residents of Oakmont for 24 years. While I'm not opposed to development of the city in general, I am opposed to the location of this development and oppose the three bylaws. The points that I would like to bring forward are logistical in nature and do not argue the detractions or benefits of a completed development, but rather are discussion points for the 10 to 15 year construction period, as opposed to the seven to nine years proposed by the developer. For reference, the single tower in Edmonton known as the Pearl took five years from construction start to move in ready. Although this was a 36 story development, it had the luxury of accessibility for construction purposes, something this proposed development does not have. In order to construct the 26 story building, as well as the 11 story structure, the timeline is most likely in the order of 60 months of actual construction time. Subsequent phases in this development will even have greater challenges to construction due to the desire to get the initial buildings occupied and there will be pauses in construction to evaluate and progress to the next phases in, in the order of several months to years. Access to Oakmont and Erin Ridge, as well as to the, to the county will be compromised for years. Some points I would like to bring forward on the logistics of the construction phase. At present to the site is, or at present access to the site is solely off of Bellrose Drive. There is no changing this fact. A new access point will have to be built north of the existing access at Evergreen Drive to allow for residents of Botanica as well as Shops of Boudreaux to continue exiting the site. There currently exists no access to the southbound lanes of Bellrose Drive once north of Evergreen Drive. This means that heavy loads and large trucks will have to exit to the north, cut through residential in order to turn around and head out of the area. In the initial phase, the removal of the overburden and excavation, which will be required for site prep, how many trucks will be required for and what duration. Also has consideration been given to the massive amounts of heavy equipment required during the pre-construction and construction phases. There'll be hundreds of cement trucks required during foundation work, and then an excess of 80 trucks per floor during the concrete pour and they have to get in and out of the area. Access to the construction site will require that traffic lighting and other considerations will need to be removed multiple times due to clearance height limits for heavy equipment, such as pile drivers, earth movers, and crane equipment. This will be required all through the access routes. Routes for heavy equipment will be determined by such technical details as height and turning radius of long heavy loads. I would ask council to consider the following. If rezoning is approved to multi-use, Based on the type of development proposed by Boudreaux Developments, temporary infrastructure changes will be required for the duration of the construction period, which is likely to include changes such as the removal of the median on Bellrose Drive to enable access to the southbound lanes of Bellrose Drive from the construction site. Once rezoning is approved, the city will lose control of the development of the multiple use area and the construction will take precedence over the community. This will happen if you let it. There will be alterations to traffic patterns on Bellrose Drive, such as diverting traffic to bi-directional on the southbound lanes of Bellrose and closing Bellrose Drive northbound to all but construction traffic. I'm sure this will also happen. Current noise bylaws within the city allow construction from 7 to 10 p.m., which will compound the construction period timeline. Considerations for Council. Have there been any presentations by Booter Developments on the constructability, schedule, or logistics with hard timelines? Or does it look like it was still put together by the developer without input from professional construction and planning people? Boudreaux Developments has approached this multi-phase development, but clearly have no idea how this can be phased while allowing access and egress to botanic res residents, as well as having occupancy of Tower 1 while building Tower Route with one access route. Evergreen Drive is about to become the new, new under-designed Ray Gibbon disaster. All the presentations by Boudreaux Developments only speak of a very small section of roadways on Bell Road, on Bell Road, Road as well as Bellrose Drive that will be impacted. Is council prepared to cover the cost of road repairs required both during and after construction for damages caused by heavy truck traffic on all the major arteries leading to and from the construction site? Has there been any discussion regarding the easement of the noise bylaw time enforcement? Who is liable for damages to properties in the unforeseen event of damages caused by and not solely by pile driving, 
excavations near properties, ground disturbances, and material falling or blowing around. If this rezoning request is approved, there will be no stopping Boudreaux developments from executing any way they see fit. I'm sure these items have not been discussed at this stage of the process. But they're absolutely critical to have the answers prior to making decisions of this scope because the cost of not getting clarity will be on all the taxpayers of St. Albert for many years to come. I am opposed to the three bylaws that are in Thank you, Don. It was, Right on the wire there. I'm going to sit quiet with this. Sorry. And we have uh, Mr. Richard Brooks next. Hello, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Richard Brooks, and I'm speaking in favor of the Riverbank Landing proposal. I'm a resident of St. Albert and live at Botanica. My wife, Darrell, and I made the move to Botanica in March of 2017, and both of us are very pleased we did so. The opinions I'm expressing today are my views and do not represent the views of the board on which I serve at Botanica. I won't be speaking to the merits of the development, even though I believe there are many, one of which is the addition of almost $3 million in new tax revenue annually to the City of St. Albert. In a more typical residential development, the city uses the new tax revenue to pay for services it provides to the development, but not so much in this case. With Riverbank Landing, it's $3 million without subtracting the cost of street lighting and sidewalk maintenance, nor the cost of snow removal or sand and gravel application in the winter. $3 million without subtracting the cost of street paving or the cost of repairing potholes every spring. All of these duties and more are performed by the developer. So of the 3 million, there's a larger percentage, free and clear, to be distributed in services to residents throughout all of St. Albert. That's a good thing, it has merit, but the 3 million only materialize the project is developed. Thus, it's very important for council to ask the question, is the developer putting forward the Riverbank Landing proposal, a developer that can see the project through to its completion? I believe experience over the past three years will help you answer that question in the affirmative, and I'd like to briefly share with you what I've learned about Boudreaux developments. Shortly after we moved into our new home in Botanica in March of 2017, eight owners, including myself, were asked to buy Boudreaux to serve on an advisory council. Our task was to act as a sounding board for ideas they were considering for Botanica, and conversely, to represent to Boudreaux issues the ownership at large felt should be brought to Boudreaux's attention. In May of 2018, Boudreaux convened a meeting of the ownership, the ownership elected a board, and the developer turned over Botanica to the new condominium corporation. I was elected to the board and became the president of the corporation and continued to serve in that capacity. Much of the business conducted between the developer and the condominium corporation is governed by clearly defined provincial legislation or building assessment reports that are very specific in nature and are agreed to and signed off on by all of the parties involved, or repair of defects that either are or are not covered by warranty and of course our, our own condominium bylaws. But invariably, issues arise that are more nuanced in nature and fall into what I call the gray area. In these situations, the developer has done what they have to do, but the board or individuals on the board believe the developer should go further. For issues in the gray area, the developer is being asked to go beyond their legal obligation and consider what is the moral or right thing to do. Issues in the gray area are judgment calls and so much more difficult than those that are well-defined. Several times and with varying amounts of money involved, I have observed Boudreaux development do what they believe to be the right thing. They've begun, gone beyond their legal obligation and embraced their moral obligation. In my opinion, for a developer to have this capacity in their decision-making requires a commitment to the core principles and values that will guide and direct when it's time to make a tough decision. That's the kind of developer I've observed Boudreaux Developments to be. Their mission statement doesn't just hang on the office wall. It's reflected in the work they do. I know Boudreaux Developments can build complex buildings. I can see that in what they have done at Botanica. But what I've observed about Boudreaux is not part of the concrete, the building envelope, the interior design, or the aesthetic appeal of the building. 
What I've seen goes to the core of what guides the company, the principles and values the developers embraced that allow it to do more than create buildings, but build places where people want to live. If Riverbank Landing is going to be develop developed, and I hope it is, I would want to know if I was on council and had to make the decision, can I trust Boudreau Developments and the Riverbank Landing proposal to make my chosen city even better? From what I've experienced in the last three years, the answer is yes. Thanks for your time. All right, that had four seconds left. I didn't hear the bell on that one. I think we need to make sure we get, get that uh, reminder. Uh, next up is Thomas Smith, and I see him sitting, got his video on and ready to go. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Smith. Or is it Thank Smythe? You. Smith. Smith, okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Tom Smith, and I've lived in St. Albert for 42 years. Uh, 27 of those in the evergreens of Erin Ridge. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak regarding Riverbank Landing. This develop, or the developers makes it sound very exciting. A community on the banks of a river, a place to relax and unwind, connect with nature, complete with boutique shopping, restaurants owned by neighbors who know you and know what you're looking for. Now, as I said, these are the developers' words, not mine. It sounds appealing, except that my neighbors and I who are Riverbank Landing's neighbors have never been asked what we're looking for. Also, uh, they use the, the idea of $2.6 million in property taxes. But Mayor Heron, I agree with you that we must, and I quote, reduce our reliance on the regressive property tax-based model. As such, I would ask you to leave property taxes out of the equation. St. Albert has bylaws based on what the existing community is looking for. What we are looking for and have worked for is what has made St. Albert the number one community in Alberta. We're looking for a thriving suburban feel. The developer has used concern about the urban sprawl to justify the, uh, the request for buildings up to five times the currently allowable height. The city of St. Albert is well aware of urban sprawl problems and has already established higher density areas in Oakmont and Erin Ridge. To this end, they have also accommodated the developer by allowing Botanica. New subdivisions are also being built. If the city feels that towers are the only way to limit urban sprawl, these towers could be incorporated into the new subdivisions in such a way that new home buyers would know what they are buying into. The developer purchased land based on anticipation of profit. I purchased my home not for profit, but to raise a family and live here for many years. One of the attractions of my home was the large windows that made my children's rooms bright and cheerful. Backyards are places where we plant trees and put up fences in order to have our own privacy or privacy in our own space. Had there been no buffer zone between towers and the house that I wanted, I would have declined based on those towers overlooking the bedrooms. I would have the same reservations if there was no privacy in the backyard. When it comes time to sell our homes, this lack of privacy in bedrooms and backyards would certainly cause difficulty for all of the current residents. I'm also concerned about traffic congestion. Getting from the Evergreens to the left turn lane leading to Boudreaux Road can be very difficult because that lane is sometimes filled right up to the lights. I've had to drive partway down the road, stop, hold up traffic, and wait until someone would let me into the turn lane. Thank goodness we have some polite drivers here. At other times, we can't get into the evergreens because traffic from Botanica is blocking the entrance. Despite the changes being explored, the traffic problem um, will persist if this development goes ahead as requested. The residents of St. Albert have elected a mayor and councillors who, and I quote one of you, actually want to show respect for the residents so they feel they are being listened to. From what I've heard and seen today, I, I believe you. I ask you all to listen to us and respect us. The developer knew the bylaws from the beginning. If the only way to achieve a reasonable profit is to run roughshod over our bylaws, then they didn't do their homework. If they can make a substantial profit while adhering to the existing bylaws, then the extra profit from erecting towers is just plain greed, not interest in the community. 
Allowing the request for bylaw changes will encourage anyone wanting a piece of the pie to ask for similar changes. Mr. Broadbent, you've expressed concern that we might see, or over what we might see in 50 years, that it's not a community that has a commitment to an environment that sees trees and life all around us. I also worry that what we could see in 50 years would be a concrete jungle along the river bank. In conclusion, I would ask the mayor and councillors to take control of this and vote against changing the existing bylaws. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, Catherine Steffner, I think I, I saw her as a panelist a while ago. Is Catherine, are you there? Yes, I'm here. There you go. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. you start anytime. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Heron and councillors. My name is Kathy Steffner, and I am a lifelong resident of St. Albert. I am opposed to this development and the three bylaws and concur with everything that has been presented so far in opposition. As a resident of Woodlands, I often travel through the already busy Belrose Boudreau intersection. Prior to COVID-19, I had a home sitting business that required me to travel through this intersection every weekday. The current traffic patterns are so busy that I would purposely schedule my day to avoid traveling in this area before 9 a.m. and between 2.30 and 5.30 p.m. if at all possible. A high density proposal such as that which has been presented by Boudreaux Developments will only make the traffic congestion in this area worse. It is unlikely that a new road within the development with a right turn entrance, right turn exit access will alleviate this issue. As you yourself, Mayor, pointed out this morning, it is expected that forcing traffic north on Belrose will only cause traffic issues at the next intersection of Oakmont Drive and Edward Way as people try to turn around to head back south to the main part of St. Albert. And with the continuation of Neil Ross Road and a bridge across the Sturgeon River to connect to 127th Avenue years away from completion, this is not an acceptable route of travel. In a city where we pride ourselves on our green initiatives and even have an idling bylaw in place, allowing extreme traffic congestion in this area goes against all of those principles. After contacting our public and Catholic school divisions, there are currently 41 72 passenger yellow school buses that move through this intersection every day, twice a day. This does not include buses from the Francophone and Sturgeon School Divisions or any private school buses that may come through St. Albert from Edmonton. Some buses are even required to navigate the intersection twice on the same route. As a longtime parent and active member of many school councils over the years, I participated in the Safe Journeys to School initiative. This initiative was embraced by all school divisions and the City of St. Albert in 2015. This project focused on ways to mitigate student traffic safety risks at all of our schools in this city. It is a priority to create and encourage a safer road environment throughout St. Albert. I suggest that consciously increasing the traffic in an already busy intersection completely goes against this priority. Our children must be kept as safe as possible on their way to and from school. With so many of our children moving through this intersection on their way to and from school, a high density development in this area will cause unnecessary delays in the school bus routes throughout the city and of most importance, unnecessarily increase the possibility of accidents. However, of greatest concern is the impact on our emergency services from the increase in traffic that will occur with such a high density development. With the RCMP detachment and fire station number two directly within this intersection and the Sturgeon Hospital only two blocks away, a significant increase in traffic through this intersection will ultimately result in a delay in response times for our, emerg our, our emergency services. Boudreaux Road is the main east-west corridor for access to, to the Sturgeon Hospital. Delays in our first responders being able to move throughout our city in a timely manner due to a conscious decision to allow a high density development in this area is a poor decision that will negatively affect all of the citizens of St. Albert. 
after listening to Council's deliberations regarding other developments in our city over the past while, it would seem that previous decisions have forced Council into a corner and that unfavorable decisions have had to be made. I ask that Council please respect the current Oakmont Area Structure Plan and Land Use Bylaw and reject these three bylaws. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, Danny uh, Boyley, did I say that right? All right. Hello. Oh, we can hear you now. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, go ahead anytime. I'm just going to start. So my wife is to speak after me. So I'm just going to speak on behalf of both of us. So Kathy Gibson, she has a different last name. But, okay, but you uh, still just get five minutes. Pardon? Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my name is Danny Boyley. My, name, my wife's name is Kathy Gibson. Uh, so we're both residents in Oakmont here in St. Albert, and we're opposed to the development of the Riverbank Landing or the bylaws that are to be passed uh, because of it. Um, before I start, I just want to go based upon some comments that were made. So earlier, the developer had spoken to the uh, St. Albert Gazette polls, and I think one of the councillors had replied that uh, they were interested in the results had changed drastically overnight. So if you look at the poll, it is highly uh, have been voted towards yes by quite a bit. So if you go online and check. So I emailed the uh, St. Albert Gazette to ask if they had the stats on that, and they said, as of 5.30 last night, um, I'm just going to read exactly what they said. By 5.26 Sunday night, our poll had received 244 responses total. By midnight, that increased to 4.76, with the vast majority of responses being yes. Um, by the time the public hearing began, there were 573 responses, mostly being yes all at one time. Um, it said at some point the yes votes were coming in every minute and sometimes multiple times per minute prior to that. And the reason why I find that alarming, I know we have to take online polls with a grain of salt, is that uh, that was one of the arguments used by the developer towards the counselors and uh, the, the people that are listening here today. So um, I think that if we look towards some of the results that have by the city lawyer, I can't remember his name, sorry, that talked about uh, up to this point, there were 63 responses only in favor towards the council and 300 opposed which uh, just shows that that probably is more accurate. Um, some, of the, some of the reasons why I pose or why we oppose as a family, the zoning uh, that uh, was intended was not intended for these high towers to be put in. I don't think it reflects positively on the city of St. Albert. Uh, the density that happens in a neighborhood uh, of where it's being built, um, I don't, I think there's uh, so many people have spoken to some of the, the reasons why um, that doesn't help. Um, I really believe that this could be a positive thing if it was downtown, uh, to have that many people having a strong vitalized downtown, that, that would be where we as a family would be uh, very much in favor of that. And uh, one of the, the biggest reason why we are opposed to it is, is essentially safety. So when I look at traffic, and as it is, and this has been stated many times, during those rush hours, as it was talked about with Mr. Schick, in the morning and the a.m. and the p.m. It is just so difficult to be able to get out of our neighborhood. Even with uh, adding extra lanes and adding some AI technology to the um, traffic lights, I don't see how um, it's not gonna get worse as it is. And when I talk about safety, even Mr. Schick talked about it's a high accident area already um, and that we've already near capacity or reach capacity of what uh, the traffic that can be allowed with the setup as it is like it had to be changed prior to this development coming in with it coming in i don't see how it doesn't get worse both for emergency services both for traffic and uh for anyone simply just getting to school or work in the mornings and after school so uh i am opposed to all three bylaws being passed thank you thank you mr Boyley. and you're positive that your wife kathy doesn't want to speak yeah, I talked to her. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Uh, Brad Williamson. Is Brad with us here? He is not registered. Is it like logged in, you mean? No, not, not logged in. Sorry. Okay. We'll come back. Uh, oh, Ross Witha. 
She's here. I think you need to unmute yourself. You got that figured out? Oh, I can hear you now. Thank you for joining us. You can start anytime. Okay. Uh, Mayor Heron and city councillors, my name is Roswitha Knüffel and I live in Oakmont. I wish to inform you that my family is opposed to the construction of the proposed high-rise buildings in my neighborhood. The city would like to increase density living, but this must not be done with massive high-rise towers in developed neighborhoods. High densification must be planned for and introduced into newly developed areas and not via towers either. The city calls itself the botanical art city. So the city should preserve the nature of its river valley. Already botanica one and two are a big encroachment on the green space. Constructing high rises on our river goes against St. Albert values and its residents' best interests. A fire like the horrific fire at Grenfell Tower in England that made headlines around the globe and the recent fire in the Gateway Square apartments in St. Albert raise questions with regard to response times for emergency vehicles. You will recall that this fire in St. Albert had 25 out of the 28 suites affected including a dramatic balcony rescue. Imagine a similar scenario in a high rise. Our city emergency services are simply not equipped to handle such high rises. Two years ago, the universities of Huddersfield and Sheffield in England concluded in their study that the so-called villages in the sky have become concrete containers for society's poorest and neediest people. Understanding the link between high rise living and mental health is said to be crucial. High rise living evokes unsettling fears. Residents could be trapped in a fire or fall or jump from the tower. The sheer number of people sharing a single building can also increase the threat from communicable diseases such as influenza which spread easily when hundreds of people share a building's hallways, door handles, and lifts. Since January, we've been living with COVID-19, the most dramatic health issue so far. Our most vulnerable citizens and those living in senior residences across Canada have been affected in catastrophic ways. Do we want to increase their vulnerabilities by having them live in high rises? To top it all off, the Globe and Mail reported last Saturday that recirculated air is a big new concern in high rises amid a pandemic for residents and office workers alike. Ventilation systems can make a disease spread. The city of St. Albert is surely capable to achieve higher density living by other means than by mega towers. The idea of riverbank landing was developed long before the COVID-19 crisis. Today's life is no longer about more density. It is about keeping distances. We need to be living in wholesome buildings that offer fresh air and in a wholesome environment that offers lots of green spaces, which are the lungs of our botanical art city. We have to be prepared for a second wave of the coronavirus or even an entirely new virus. The present health crisis should be a warning to us as it has a devastating effect also on our economy. Both my sons are medical professionals, so naturally healthy living is of overriding importance to us. In Ottawa, the decision has been made that from now on, Seniors will be housed in semi-detached homes, so they live in separate units on the ground floor and have access to fresh air. Only if our city planners looked for equally wholesome developments would they keep the city's good reputation. We don't want villages in the sky. Who wants to live or work permanently in recirculated air? Who wants to live 26 stories up? the next virus hits or the next fire hits. 
I am asking Council to vote no to the Oakman Area Structure Plan amendments. Residents voted for you, trusting that you would vote in their best interests. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was exactly five minutes. Well timed. Uh, next, we have Margot LeClaire Upfold. And I see her there. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We sure can. Oh, great. Good day, Mayor Heron and councillors. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I am a resident of St. Albert for several years and I raised my family here. My position on the rezoning application is that any development must align with the current Oakmont ASP and the land use bylaws. Uh, Mary, Mayor Heron, I listened to your podcast from February of this year. The podcast predates COVID-19 and little did we know at that time what changes this would bring to our community uh, and around the globe. You reflected on the quality of life in St. Albert, the things you take most pride in. Much of this is blended with concern for the environment. For the longest time, St. Albert has been recognized and known for its beauty and livability and has held its ranking as Canada's top 10 cities to live in. You emphasize that it is the people that make it the best place to live, articulating how special St. Albert is with emphasis on the green space, which invites people outdoors to the trail systems, to ride a bike, to talk to our neighbors, and especially for the love of the river and trees. Albeit we are a growing community, but you still believe we have that small town feel and you say we as a city try to cultivate that as we grow. Our brand, botanical, our brand is botanical arts community and you proudly boast that we have more public trees per capita in North America and trees fight climate conditions. How will we rectify the permanent loss of trees and vegetation in an environmentally sensitive land reserve surrounding this riverbank proposal? Long gone will be the natural habitat for wildlife and birds. Having both phases of Botanica built practically into the Sturgeon River Basin demonstrates a lack of concern about our fragile river ecosystem. I cannot fathom what further damage this development will cause. It is our shared responsibility to preserve and protect the natural environment, which is a part of our heritage and our character as botanical arts community. After all, this is in the city's strategic plan. St. Albert recently received the Emerald Award, the highest environment honors for the electric bus fleet. This is an outstanding contribution to the climate change cause the city can be proud of. Though this achievement will be in sharp contrast to the giant carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions that will accumulate at the intersection of Belrose and Boudreaux due to daily gridlock chaos indefinitely. This will set the clock back on how well St. Albert is doing about climate change on a global stage. How will it appear that the things we take most pride in our community will be smothered by this development? Keeping the young people in St. Albert is a priority for you, Mayor Heron, and you claimed it is your job to make sure that these citizens have a house to purchase, an apartment to rent by saying, I don't want the price to ever drive a young person out of St. Albert and that affordability will always be a factor whether someone can live here. The proposed development will not attract young families. In fact, hundreds of the units are small and designated for single or double occupancy. Hardly the space one would need to raise a family coupled with sky high prices of the condos far surpasses the average cost of a three bedroom home with a backyard and privacy. Lack of access to a mass public transit hub for this area makes matters much, much worse. To whet our appetites, the developer pushed out a few glossy ads to reveal what this place might look like in a decade. Apart from the smoke and mirrors, I couldn't help but notice that the development is really designed for a select exclusive crowd. So again, I highlight not affordable, not family friendly, not environmentally protective, not accessible, and not inspired by inclusiveness and diversity. This matter is truly about what is best for people and the community of St. Albert, not for those that will make their money off this and leave. 
Let's keep it simple, Mayor Heron and councillors. Please vote to refuse this application to change the Oakmont Area Structure Plan and Land Use Bylaws. My thanks to you today. Thank you so much, Margo. So next on my list is January, is it Baker or Baker? It's Baker, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, you can start anytime. Excellent. Mayor and Council, I truly thank you for this opportunity to speak today and allow my voice and the voice of my family and the fellow residents of St. Albert to be heard. My name is January Baker and my family and I live on Orchard Court and I am strongly opposed to the amendments to the Riverbank Landing Bylaws for the following reasons. Incompatibility. St. Albert, while a growing city, we are known for our intimate feel and these towers will be like nothing we have in our city. They will stick out like a sore thumb and do not contribute to the overall look and feel of our community. The form, mass, and character will not complement the adjacent single family residents in Oakmont and Erin Ridge and beyond. The building's scale and height will be impacted by shadowing, noise, and privacy issues. Our city was not built to be a concrete jungle and the transitioning between this development and the single family residential is not appropriate as outlined by the developer's plans. Councillor Broadbent said it well, if I may paraphrase. You try to compare us to Coal Harbour in Vancouver, but we're not Coal Harbour in Vancouver. This is a significant change to the feel of our community. This solution to potentially flatten and widen the proposed plan also does not address the next concern that I have, which is around density. The density of the site should be reasonable and practical. This is not reasonable for this area. When we started our build process in our home in 2012, the area was designated as a low density commercial area. If at that time we had been aware that we would be living beside a high density residential commercial, we wouldn't have purchased, we wouldn't have built this home for our family. Having grown up in Vancouver and also living in Toronto, my family and I truly value the peaceful, calm nature of St. Albert and the beauty of our green spaces. We will lose this should this development move forward. In addition, it's also referenced that this proposed high, de high density development is outside of the required proxim proximity to transit. The next, which is probably my most passionate concern, is the traffic congestion and safety issues. The volume is already high and nearing capacity as referenced numerous times during this hearing. As the Botanica continues to increase the number of residents, this will only further congest the area. So if this development moves forward, as a parent who takes her children to school every day and then proceeds on to work, it is going to continue to increase the amount of time that's required for me to do both of these tasks. I'm also deeply concerned for the EMS and their ability to function in a highly congested area. The health and safety of our residents is a paramount concern, and this development will have a tremendous negative impact on this. The collision study that was referenced is a big concern, but I didn't need the study to bring that forward, as I hear sirens and see accidents more regularly than I even want to think of in this area. As our city engineer referenced, if again I may paraphrase, paraphrase during today's hearing, the potential benefit of the proposed upgrades that need to be done will likely be lost by the increase in density brought about by these towers. We move to environmental concerns that can't be ignored. You cannot build a development of this size and scope without there being a negative impact to the environment in the surrounding green space and River Valley area. These green spaces are what contribute to the beauty of our city. There are also tremendous concerns on property values. I've worked in the mortgage industry since 2001 and worked closely with appraisers and risk departments and these do not fit in this area and it will definitely impact the property resale and values. Finally, the lengthy construction period and disruption to homeowners and businesses is a serious concern. Living through seven to 10 years of construction will add to the already high level of construction fatigue that we're all going through. I ask that council vote against all of these bylaws and amendments. You must refuse the unimaginable infill that is incompatible with our surrounding neighborhoods. I understand the appeal of increased tax revenues, but at what cost to us as residents? You need planned growth with proper infrastructure. I love our community and always wanna support positive growth. 
However, this is not in line within this area of our community. I thank you so much for your time and allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, January. Uh, and I believe somebody, very same last name, Tim Baker. Tim, yep, I can't see your face, yep, can you but I know you have your screen on. <laughs> I think you're just backlit. Yes, you can, you, can everybody hear me? We sure can. Yeah, thank you for your time. Um, yes, January is my wife, so <laughs> she's articulated our family's position perfectly. Um, what I thought I would use just a brief amount of my time was to, again, concur that, that we as a family oppose this uh, development outside the, the standard zoning requirements that are currently on the land. Um, but what I wanted to do is the reason why I'm backlit is it's one thing to talk about it, but I think it's another thing to show it. Um, we live on Orchard Court. And if this development goes through, the uh, skyline in the back will be wiped from the back of our house. I'll be staring at two 26 story towers. So I think this is a real life example. Uh, I wanted to put uh, or have council be able to actually physically see uh, what the impact will be to myself and my family. Um, again, just to reiterate, um, traffic is a huge concern. Um, we're also quite concerned where the traffic will then go through Orchard Court on, on a future basis. Um, so again, uh, the Baker family position is that we do oppose these uh, changes to the potential zoning. Um, and we thank you for your time and your consideration. And, and, and we believe that uh, mayor and council will do what's right and what the citizens of, of St. Albert are asking for. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff Hayman is next, and I just saw him pop on. <laughs> can you see me? You sure can, and we can hear you fine, so start anytime. All right. Hello, Mayor Heron and Council. I thank you for your service to our city and for this platform to speak. My name is Jeff Heyman, and I live at Three Elm Point in Erin Ridge. I'm a father, a business owner, and I have the great privilege of living in St. Albert since my parents moved here 32 years ago. I'm speaking today on behalf of 1,285 St. Albert residents, along with 372 surrounding area residents, who took the time to sign and include comments on my online petition opposing the Riverbank Landing Proposal. You may refer to document A from the package I submitted prior to hearings at stalbert.ca. In the interest of saving time, I will point to these documents going forward. I would also like to thank my neighbors from across St. Albert that volunteered considerable time to research and provide the evidence that legitimizes our objections based on facts. The draft municipal development plan encapsulates the future vision of St. Albert uh, and its residents and the Riverbank landing proposal departs from the direction of this plan in many ways. The location of the proposed density within a mature community along the Sturgeon River is not supported it would significantly add to the traffic congestion at Boudreaux and Belrose. More congestion means more pollution, reduced safety, and longer EMS response times. Further, the proposal fails to show any investment towards sustainability beyond mere window dressing. I do not have the time to speak at length on every aspect of where this proposal is misaligned with St. Albert's stated vision for the future. So I will focus on a few points and leave the others to my neighbors. Before starting my online petition, I explored whether my visceral opposition to the proposal had merit. This exploration took me down a rabbit hole of municipal development plans, area structure plans, land use bylaws, and other great bedtime reading. The result of which makes me look at the petition against the proposal as a positive in favor of maintaining the essence of our beloved botanical city, which was aptly encapsulated in a quote by Mayor Heron, quotes, that small town feel really still does exist in St. Albert and we do everything we can to cultivate that as we grow." End quotes, reference to document D. The Riverbank Landing Proposal does not merely tinker with the existing area structure plan and land use bylaws. It seeks to drastically alter them and thus break a covenant that the city holds with residents. Nor does it align with the city's new draft municipal development plan that suggests we, quote, accommodate new forms of housing in established neighborhoods that respect the existing scale and character of the area, end quotes, reference to document E. 
Further, the city's planning department expressed their own reservations saying that, quotes, there are few MDP policies to guide a proposal of such intensity outside of the downtown. As such, it can be interpreted that city plan did not contemplate such a development for this area, and therefore due to its silence, it is not supported, end quotes, reference to document F. I have to go a bit off script because this morning the uh, developer chose to bring in the St. Albert Today poll. Uh, I suggest this poll is an attempt to discredit my petition by false equivalence. The St. Albert Today poll does not require any sign in association with postal code or location, nor does it allow comment. Um, Essentially, Boudreaux Communities Limited could spike the poll by having every employee and extended family log in and vote. I would suggest that if the developer is confident in its product, it does not need to spike polls or bookend hearings with salespeople. The product would win the day on its own merit. Even though my petition garnered 3,000 plus signatures, I pared this down to what is exactly represented by name, postal code, and location. Petitioners were also allowed to make comments. Like the cover of a book, we must not judge the Riverbank Landing proposal on the pretty pictures, but on the substance of what it offers and whether it aligns with the future aspirations of the residents of the city of St. Albert. 1,285 residents suggest that it does not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. We are now moving on to Mike Rakic. Mike there? Mike has not logged in. Maurice is next. Maurice, okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us, Maurice. Can you hear me? You sure can. Go ahead anytime. Hi, hi, hi Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Maurice Chevalier of 96 Orchard Court. And we're new to the community. We just moved in here, moved to St. Albert in November. I'm here to oppose the Boudreaux uh, community's application to amend the area structure plan and land use bylaw in Orchard Court. As you can tell, like uh, Tim Baker, can you see behind me? Can you see the, the current uh, Botanica? It's very close and it affects me directly. This, this shadowing proposed development will negatively affect our privacy, sunlight, property value, and quality of life. The projected nine to 11 story structure will be less than 100 feet from our home. Before our build, due diligence showed the land directly behind our lot, 300 Orchard Court was deemed low density. Knowing this, we built with confidence because St. Albert's reputation of allowing plenty of green space amongst developments the low density designation made good city planning sense considering the high density of the current Botanica development mixed with the established Oakmont community. Quite frankly, we were not worried the city would consider switching the land use bylaw. Like many area residents, it shocked us seeing the planned development midway through the construction of our dream home. While I understand why Boudreaux Communities wants to maximize this premium land with mega structures, I believe this plan represents greed like no other. I urge council not to get seduced by the economy of such a development. Please be patient and wait for a development that fits the current ASP and land use bylaw. Thank you. Thank you uh, so very much. Uh, Grant Napick. There he is. Thank you for joining us. You can go ahead anytime. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mayor Heron and Councillors. Uh, again, I, like everybody else, appreciate your time and your efforts and your counselling to date. Um, I have had to change my script because so many of my neighbors have more eloquently uh, laid down our concerns, um, covering everything from zoning to density to traffic and shadowing. So I won't uh, belabor my points and, and, and take up space. I'll leave some more time for some other neighbors to uh, maybe enlighten you on some other issues that uh, either we haven't all thought about or they want to reinforce. To be clear, I'm, a, I'm not opposed to um, 
moving forward, progress, um, construction, residential, commercial. But I am opposed to these three bylaws, and I mean all three, not just 13. We've talked an awful lot about 13 today. It's not just a height. It's the whole, uh, all three bylaws. <sighs> My wife has lived in St. Albert for over 20 years. I've lived here for over 10 years. We jointly built our dream home in Orchard Court three years ago. And I, like others, did due diligence and recognize that there can be changes, but we thought this would be the best place for us to set our roots down. My address, 21 Orchard Court. For those of you that are doing the math, it is four homes down from the development. This is personal. <sighs> Um, the one thing I want to add, uh, that, uh, and I, I know Don Yon has mentioned this already, he eloquently and uh, completely uh, talked about the, the traffic, not just the intersection, but beyond the intersection, because the traffic isn't just congested in that one B&B &B intersection. Uh, I have to compliment Mr. Schick and his associates. They have done yeoman's work on their um, their studies and gotten out reports to us. So they're, they're complete, almost complete. My concern is they're, cons they're fine almost now. His reports cover the concerns uh, with flow volume uh, to date. It doesn't take into account the new construction. My concern beyond all of that that I haven't heard anything about is the flow that goes beyond the intersection, mostly the bridge, Boudreaux Bridge. I travel that twice a day. I work in the city of Edmonton, but I've chosen to live in St. Albert for various reasons. That bridge, I'm very concerned about. I don't know if it's sinking. I, I can't confirm that, but I've got, um, my car changes uh, heights on both ends of the bridge. I do know when I walk the trails, as soon as even yesterday, there is still water covering the trail going underneath the bridge. So my concern is if there's a lot of traffic at that B&B &B intersection, Boudreaux and Belrose, it's gonna back up onto that bridge. That bridge is gonna be our concern, city of St. Albert, taxpayers. If that bridge needs construction sooner rather than later, what impact is that gonna have on all of us? what everybody's mentioned, not just personal traffic, um, peak and flow, what about weekends? What about festivals? What about schools? What about EMS? I work in, <clears throat> I work in healthcare, sorry. And I'm very concerned about EMS reaching everybody in my community. This has huge impacts. Um, I've read the transit assessment report. It seems like there's a lot of talk about 2034. I can't see that report as to what the volumes are talking about there. I don't know if it takes into account this new development on the proposal. Um, so I've got big concerns about traffic, but beyond the intersection. Noise is a big concern for me too. I've lived at my place uh, long enough to know it's like it's constant. Uh, there's no there's no reprieve. It, it, there's, there's construction noise fatigue constant. Anyway, you've heard that before. Before. I don't want to ramble on too much longer. I want to give somebody else some chances. Uh, I, I find it interesting. The proposal talks about a walkability. I live four homes down, not houses. This is my home. I am not going to walk in this area. If you want to make it a walkability area, I propose the lowest hole heritage site. I would walk there. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Appreciate you joining us today, Grant. Um, next up is Sandy Scott, and she is somewhere in outer space. <laughs> I'm here. You can start at any time. Okay. My name is Sandy Scott, and I am opposed to the development, and I oppose all three bylaws before you today. I vote that uh, the height is kept to 15 meters or less when they do develop. And I just want to say that everyone that buys a property uses the same book of rules. And that book of rules is the area structure plan. 
The area structure plan tells you what you are buying into. The area has a plan. The developer knew what the ASP was when they bought the land. Then they came up with a project that has promised increased tax dollars to the city. If only they allow this area structure plan change that gives them carte blanche, making the land more valuable overnight. Then the city in return gets no more money for the land. Smart on the part of the developer, the old bait and switch. They are proposing a major downtown development in a residential area with buildings higher than those already in downtown St. Albert. Simply ridiculous. You are asking the existing community to put up with six to nine years of construction and a traffic nightmare that will never go away. Build this in a new area where access roads can be planned. Can you build a new development in an existing community? Of course you can. It's called infill. That is not the case here. If this project goes ahead, it will choke roadways and make the entire Oakmont and Aaron, Aaron Ridge area unsafe. The extra traffic that 500 units added to the existing 252 of the Botanica makes 752 units. So two people per unit, that's a minimum of 1,500 people. Some will be single, others will be families. So let's say 1,500. How many cars is that? Let's be conservative and say that 500 of those will not have a car. So 1,000 cars. Now let's add business traffic. That's harder. Depends on how successful the business is. So let's put us back up to 1,500 cars. This development has only one road to exit onto. They can turn left or right onto Bellrose. Now, if the left turn lane queues up, and it will, traffic will go right. Then they're gonna take the next left into a residential area. That would be Edward Way or El Dorado, creating a loop to get them back to St. Albert Trail or Boudreaux. This takes traffic past a school and a hospital. Dean Schick indicated that the existing intersection of Boudreaux and Belrose is at capacity or over capacity. Now adding upwards of 1000 cars can only make it less safe. Even if traffic is gradually increased, the end result is the same. There will be gridlock and ambulances will not be able to enter or exit the hospital. Fire trucks will not have access. No amount of smart signal technology or an improved left turn lane can accommodate the foreseeable traffic. This project needs roads and infrastructure that can support it. For safety reasons, there should be four major exits from this project. That's not possible where they want to build it. The open houses gave feedback. The community is against this. When a change to an area structure plan is made, it cannot be made lightly. The change that closed Coal Mine Road is still haunting us today. With no collector road to move traffic, we have spent hundreds of thousands on traffic copy, all because of one change to an ASP that allowed a developer to sell lots at a higher price. Traffic calming slows traffic. It can't change traffic volume. There will be unprecedented traffic volume. Remember this, the developer Riverbank Landing knew what the ASP was when they bought. So did the homeowners. If you vote no, the developer can still come up with a livable project. Don't let the developer sway you with the promise of tax dollars. Fixing the traffic will suck up any profit on tax revenue. Change is inevitable, but there is no excuse for poor planning. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Okay, it is 2.30 on the nose. Uh, we've been at this for two hours now, so I'm gonna let everybody take a quick stretch, a bit of a health break. 15 minutes, okay? Okay, so let's get back at 
All right, my clock just switched over to 2.45. Can everyone hear me? Okay. The next um, public presentation is Grant Milner and uh, doing it through a Zoom phone call. Grant on the line, Tamara. All right, Grant, can you yes, hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We sure can, so go ahead whenever you're ready. I'd like to thank Mayor Heron and Council for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm joining by phone, but just pretend I'm standing in front of you in Council Chambers. My name is Grant Miner. Uh, we live in Erin Ridge, and we've been residents of St. Albert for more than 20 years. I studied every available report and document on this matter. As a result, I do not support any changes to the existing bylaws for this property. Here are my reasons. There are two major issues, building height and density. Regarding building height, admin is now recommending that council votes down bylaw 13 2020, and that would be the correct outcome. But there's another glaring problem, and that's density. This land needs to remain as low density and under direct control of council. Here are three compelling reasons why. Botanica one and two, Oakmont has already hit the desired density target of 30%. To cram another large development in this location simply lacks common sense. If bylaws 13 2020 fails and the other two bylaws are passed, it still gives the applicant the ability to replace vertical sprawl of high rise towers with larger buildings so they can drive the number of residential units back up to high density. And that outcome would be a complete failure in municipal planning. In fact, there would be no plan at all and the city would transfer control to the developers so they could basically do what they want. And here are three more solid reasons why this location is not suitable for a massive increase in density. The property is nowhere near mass, nowhere near mass transit and it never will be. The admin analysis report on Riverbank Landing shows, quote, this development does not support the EMRB guiding policy number four the subject site of this proposal is outside of the planned RLRT alignment along the St. Albert Trail, which is prioritized for high density infill development. And by the way, adding a bus stop on Bellrose is not mass transit. As well, it's not downtown, it's not near St. Albert Center or any other major commercial center, nor is it on St. Albert Trail. The admin report states this development does not support the EMRB guiding policy 4.2.2 where intensification will be directed to rural, urban, and TOD centers, metropolitan core and downtown, brownfield sites, and along transit corridors. The admin report also states the subject is not located within St. Albert downtown or within proximity of a TOD center. So the administration itself describes how this development fails to align to the city's vision and plans, whether those plans are aspirational or otherwise. And lastly, traffic congestion. The city's recent request for proposal and safety study for the Belrose Boudreaux intersection confirms the current traffic problems. Adding a turning lane or changing the traffic like sequencing may reduce collisions, but it will slow operational efficiency, not improve it. Then add in Riverbank Landing and council would be creating a mess that you have the power to avoid right now. So I'll wrap up my comments. First, the applicant. The applicant purchased this land knowing the existing bylaws and zoning. Now they want the zoning rules bent and broken just so they can meet their profit objectives. The city, there is clear evidence that this development does not align to the city's current or future MDP and EMRB growth policies. It may look like a quality development, but it would be in the wrong location as many others have pointed out. A development like this must be located in an area where the infrastructure, roadways, and mass transit are created in concert with high density development. And finally, the public's interest. Please respect the petition, respect today's speakers, and the 267 written submissions speaking out against this development. Acting in the interest of the public should be your top priority. Please vote no on all three proposed bylaws. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grant. And I apologize if I said your name wrong. It's written down, Milner, but you said it was minor. So I apologize for that. All right, the next I see is Shane Metronek. Metronek uh, is ready to go. 
So Shane, anytime you are ready, you can start. Yeah, hi folks. Uh, thanks for taking the time, obviously. Um, main thing is here, um, I'm opposed. Um, my neighbors and, and people that live around here that I see all the time have done a fantastic job of describing the reasons why we're opposed. It's not fair. You, you, you can't say it's one thing and then you, you switch it. That's just not fair. Um, that being said, I do support the shops at Goudreau and I would probably support shops in the future if they were expanded. But to the extent of the mega towers, I mean, that's where, that's where we're at. Uh, that's, that's a sticking point for me. Um, and I would prefer that they do not um, occur. So long story short, I'm opposed and uh, yeah, do the right thing guys. Thanks. Thank you, Shane. Uh, we are seeing a, sheet, a screen sharing uh, from someone. Yeah, too. Melinda, but Melinda, is there is Sarah um, here to speak? No, don't don't. Um... Sorry, Sarah, are you there? Same last name as previous speaker, Metronek. Mara, is, is Sarah here? She was here, but it, she's... I see number I three. I see a Sarah. Sarah. I'm just asking her to start her video. Okay. Okay, there she is. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Um, can you unmute your mic and we test to see if you can if we can hear you? Yes, there we go. Uh, and you've got hello. a special guest with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Hi. start anytime. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm a resident of Oakmont, and I just like to add my voice to the opposition of changing the bylaws. And I don't think I have any other points that haven't already been made. I just like to echo them and say we are in the shadow zone, and um, yeah, we we disapprove. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> that is all. Okay. All right. Thank you for Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now it's Melinda Durand and I think she was probably hoping to share her screen. Yes, I was. Can you hear me? I am. Can you we hear can. me? Yeah. Thank you. Those kids are so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, start anytime. Okay, so uh, my name is Melinda Durand and I am a concerned citizen. I oppose the Riverbank Landing Project because I share, first of all, I share the concerns with all the other residents who wrote in and communicated to you about opposing the project. And I gotta first let you know the shout out for Aaron Ridge. We have one access in and out, the same one for our EMS and police and every all the services. So if the congestion at uh, Stur at uh, Bougeau and Melrose is congested, and I have to say that I, because of my profession, there are things that will happen that will cause congestion that where lives and safety matter, that is kind of something that needs to be considered. So. As a shout out, that's the first major concern is the concern, even with the AI that Riverbank is proposing. So for me, I have worked for the city of Edmonton for over 35 years. Let me just get to my PowerPoint here, I'm sorry. So I've worked for the city of Edmonton for 35 years and um, most of it dealing with water and sewer. So I'm gonna center my communication to you with respect to my profession, since I've worked in that for so many years. And um, just to be clear, I oppose this project. So for me, I've worked in every section for the city of Edmonton, including our planning department, which approve projects such as this, which is the Riverbank Landing, our design and construction, where I was the project manager, manager to, design and construct servicing issues such as our flooding issues to the city of Edmonton 
and also to our maintenance section, which is to water and sewer, which is 600 staff deep to try to maintain our existing sewer system. So, and, and not only that, our existing manholes, pipes, catch basins, stormwater ma management lakes, and so on. I mean, it really is a concern. I'm again, not opposed to the development, but just opposed to it being here because of its proximity to the Sturgeon River. So in my professional opinion, I am concerned with the sheer concrete footprint of the river bank landing, which will undoubtedly affect our Sturgeon River. So as a reminder to you, uh, you have endorsed and coordinated with other municipalities the responsibility to maintain the viability of our natural resource, the Sturgeon River, running through the city of St. Albert. So this slide here represents a Fort McMurray, which just flooded a few months ago. My concerns are the river, the development, and the potential cost to us taxpayers. The health of our Sturgeon River is the responsibility of you, City Council, to maintain our, 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 our existence here in St. Albert. So I propose, so in my prof professional opinion, there's too much smooth surface in the buildings proposed by Riverbank Landing, including the roads, buildings, and parking lots, which increase the stormwater management flows and ultimately are diverted into the Sturgeon River. You reported that some of your generous, well, not you, but Riverbank Landing has reported that some of the generous setbacks are as up to 15 to 60 meters. Really, that's 50 to 53 feet away. If you think of that, your backyard is probably longer than 50 to 53 feet away. That's how close this development is to the river. Please consider that. My concern with the riverbank landing is, is that the, the quality of the stormwater management, which will be diverted to the Sturgeon River. Stormwater is rain and snow melt, which would ordinarily be absorbed by the ground where the plants can intake the health and vitality and the soil below will maintain its stability. This development, because of all its concrete and smooth surfaces will adversely affect the rates, which will eventually, I believe, cause the city money. All right, Linda. So if you end, of the end, timer. This end, there are deficiencies with this project. There are so many deficiencies and you need to be aware of those deficiencies. They're designed, they're greed in using their whole property encapsulating. Linda, Linda, I have to cut you off. I can't um, mute you when you have your screen share, but I, I, I need to stick to the five minutes. Sorry about that. I hope there we go. Sorry about that, Council. My first technical struggle. Um, the next on our list is James Donahue. Is James here? Yes, I am. All right, James, do you um, want to turn on your video? Oh, uh, I got to find that. Oh, there it is. There's no requirement, but yeah. Okay. Thank you for here. joining us. Thank you. First, thank you for letting me speak, Mayor and Council. I'm James Donahue. My family and I have lived in Aaron Ridge within the proposed development area since 1999. To summarize my opposition to this development is to say that even though the benefits seem to be enticing to others, it is simply in the wrong location. <clears throat> the total stories proposed of this megaplex as part of our existing landscape is not what many of us residents expected or envisioned as part of our choice to live in a botanical suburban community like St. Albert. With consideration to these two monolithic structures rising from the shallow banks of our river valley, it makes me wonder if our commitment to being a botanical city has been thrown out. What I see in the proposal, and I'm certain many others also see, is two downtown like structures towering over and shattering all the low level, low density living among our picturesque river valley. This is more like an Edmonton like project 
that is in the wrong community that just does not have enough space or seem and seems inconsistent with the surrounding residential and green space features. Also, once completed, I just don't see how there will be enough road space to adequately support the traffic flow for such a high residential population, along with the other ongoing commercial uh, services. If this were part of St. Albert's downtown community development plan for supporting greater infill and vibrancy, I could be wholeheartedly on board with this proposal. Then there would be greater proximity to mass public transportation to then reduce the need for every occupant to own and park a vehicle. And all the other amenities would fit in well with an established commercial community, and I expect it would be more widely welcomed. In conclusion, we took pride in purchasing our lot knowing that it once was Lowe's Holes farmland. And need I say more? Thank you for the opportunity to speak and share my perspectives on this proposal. Excellent. Thank you, James. Thank you. Next on our list is Mr. Neil Kortash. Hello, Neil. Hello, oh, I'm going to try and, uh, try and share my screen here if I can. Let's see. Can you, what are you seeing right now? Can you see the sure. screen? No, no, not yet. I'm going to pause your timer until we get this figured out. Okay. okay. Let's see. I haven't shared on uh, Zoom before, so it says, let's see. Still don't have anything? No. Someone from IT want to jump in and help? Yeah, maybe if I could. Jason? Hi, Neil, you there? Yeah, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm just trying to share the screen here. I've clicked on the share button. Okay. And uh, we've got. So you should have a, like a basic tab at the top of the share window and you can choose screen one, yep. screen two. Nope, there you go. There we go, we got it. I had that, it wasn't showing up the first time. Okay, excellent. Um, do you wanna put can that you in? See, can you see the uh, the presentation there? We sure can, okay, I'm starting. Excellent. All right, we're good to go, sorry about that. Thanks no uh, members of council for, for this opportunity today. As you can see, uh, I'm not in the area. I live in Mission, but I uh, have a vested interest in this project for a few different reasons. So thanks for the opportunity to uh, to present here today. Um, you, you know, ultimately we have to come down. Uh, I was told by Ledge Services on one side or the other on this project, and it's a tough decision. So I don't envy your position, but I, but I am opposing the proposed amendments today. And it's not because the development isn't isn't a great development. I actually love the development. I think towers have a place in St. Albert. I think that if the market is demanding this type of development, then the city has the obligation to provide it and prevent some of the, the urban sprawl that we're seeing. Uh, and that's the nature of infill developments. I think it creates a vibrant uh, type of community. And, and, and in particular, I, I think the development's great. Now, that being said, I do have some concerns around traffic. As many of the residents have expressed, I've got concerns around the legislated commitments that the city's made to residents in the area. And so those are obviously questions council's gonna have to consider very carefully. Uh, my primary concerns are around uh, the connectivity uh, with the Red Willow Park Trail system. And so uh, that's what I'm going to be speaking to primarily here. And so uh, this photo I took while kayaking down the sturgeon a few weeks ago. And it was interesting earlier to hear the, the proponents speak uh, about tenor or about the Canadian tire development saying that we, we wouldn't, didn't want to build one of those when we built Botanica. And in my opinion, this is far worse. Uh, you know, I love the development from the front. I'm, I'm a regular uh, consumer at the shops there, and, and I think it's a great development from the front. But from the rear, it really has walled off the river, as the developer mentioned earlier. And I'm not sure this is the look that we want as, as a city. And there's a few other things wrong with this picture. You don't see the trail there. You don't see the connection to Red Willow Park. And I, and I also question the one in 100 year floodplain. Uh, it's something that you know, I, I won't get, go into the science on, but as we're seeing more and more flood events, I question whether one in 100, one in 200, one in 500 year uh, events need to be considered. Uh, and I'll leave that up to, to council to decide. But a little bit of historical context. When I uh, ran for council years ago, one of the reasons was the development of 14 Mission Avenue, which is awfully close to the river. And in fact, uh, you had to kind of walk up on their boardwalk this spring because the river was so high uh, to get around. And 
unfortunately, this, this whole area in Oakmont was something that was not on my radar when I was on council. The development, the, the older area of Oakmont took place before uh, my time on council and the newer area, the Botanica development was after my time on council. But I will say it is one of the larger or the biggest regret that I have on council is, is not spending more time, investing more time in connecting the trail on the north side of the river. We've got that little little stump of a, a trail behind Botanica that just ends. And, uh, and that's really unfortunate. It's a shame, really. And so I, I sent this photo to a couple of members of that uh, council that approved this development and asked, how did this happen? How did this occur? Uh, one of which replied to me and said, there was so much focus on the height and the density of the building that sort of the, the Red Willow Trail system sort of got forgotten about, sort of got left behind. And I'm urging you not to let that happen this time around. Uh, in the ASP amendment, you can see that there is no connection. There is no trail connection to the, the Red Willow Park behind the proposed development or behind the new section of Oakmont. Uh, even if this develop, even when this development is approved in whatever form, at whatever height, at whatever densities, how are the residents of Oakmont supposed to access this development or, or pedestrians for that matter, uh, supposed to access it without the trail system. So it's wonderful that they've got something proposed facing the river and public access, but it should be available to pedestrians by connecting Red Willow Trail there. Uh, I'm also concerned that the municipal reserve is not wide enough to allow that type of connectivity to happen. Uh, I was going to show you an example in Chicago. I know some of you are familiar with it, but they've spent millions and millions of dollars over the last 50 years reclaiming both sides of the river. Uh, maybe a closer example to home here would be Saskatoon, where they've got a beautiful trail system on both sides of the river, except for this one development right here near Idlewild Park, where uh, homes, private residences reach right down to the river. And so it interrupts their trail system. Um, and and we've, we've sort of got that happening in St. Albert right now, and I'm urging council to try and prevent that from happening here as well. And you don't have to be a big city like Chicago or even Saskatoon to have a big vision. This is a picture from Canmore where their trail system sort of uh, gets to an end and they, they come over some wetlands area. And so they, they weren't able to continue the paved trail like they have through the rest of the town, uh, but, uh, but they continue on the boardwalk. And that might be something that St. Albert will have to consider here. I don't know what happened to my my slides. There we go. Oh, is that uh, end of time? That was your time, Mr. Cortez. Thank you for uh, the nice PowerPoint. Appreciate your time. And I see Chris Boyda has already got his screen turned on and ready to go. Uh, good afternoon, uh, <clears throat> Mayor Heron and uh, councillors. My name is uh, Chris Boyda, and together with my wife and kids, we are 78 Orchard Court. I'm here today to inform you that I am opposed to the three bylaw amendments in front of you today. And I ask council to unanimously vote against these three bylaws. As a professional engineer and my wife as well, I'm a proponent and supportive of progressive development that, do, that does not compromise safety or sustainability and is also in line with the growth objectives and plans of the city and the needs of its residents. This development, this development proposal is certainly ambitious no doubt about that. And at the surface, it's alluring and attractive given the many sided fiscal benefits. Despite the variety of issues, and there's countless numbers that have been mentioned here today, and the consequences that would arise from this development, it may even be possible. It is vitally important to bear in mind that, the, that possible does not equal right, nor does it mean that it's in the best interest of the residents of St. Albert, and in particular, the residents of the neighboring communities. It is important to step back and take an objective look at the concept and the given infill location and note that it is simply trying to do too much with too little. The concept is a template, a formula used in other urban areas with many more millions of people to support that rapid transit and other factors that allow it to be in alignment with the adjacent communities, neither of which exists here. And the reality is in its current state, the proposal and the foundation of which it is fatally, is fatally flawed. This is really akin to ramming a square peg in a round hole. It can be done, but it's ugly. Rejecting these bylaws changes doesn't mean that St. Albert is not a suitable place for growth and development. 
It means that the city of St. Albert seriously heeds to its vision of being a vibrant, innovative, and thriving city that we, we call home that sustains and cherishes its unique identity and small town values. The development proposal is grossly disproportionate to the adjacent communities, and it must be in line with them and the residents' needs and their feedback. Council must walk the walk and live out its mission, and that is to represent the city, the residents of St. Albert, make decisions in our best interests and that of the entire community and ensure that the corporation delivers results that will sustain and not compromise a high quality of life for St. Albertans. The bottom line is that the proposal must change and other projects must share the load of progression for the city and provide the, uh, the amenities that a growing city needs. Now, in my experience, when you, when you push back on the first proposal, even better solutions and options uh, are to be had. And that certainly is the case here today. So rejection doesn't mean that it can't happen. It likely means that it'll look better for the city and provide more of, a, of something that other communities can live up to and aspire to be versus copying or templating something that, you know, that doesn't fit for us. Thank you for the time. And I hope you guys come to the right result. Thank you very much for joining us. Council, uh, the next speaker is supposed to be Celine Gannon. Uh, we did get an email saying that she got called into work and she will be available a little bit later. So we're moving her down to just after number 46, Zachary Dean. I, I believe this is all um, from the same family. So we're gonna go Isabel Dean, Zoe Dean, James Dean, and then then Mateo and Courtney, and then we'll come back to Samuel Dean, Zachary Dean, and then we'll go back up to sleep. So that's going to be the new order due to a work thing. So you must be Celine. Don't say I'm Isabel. I'm Isabel. You're Isabel. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Isabel, thank you for joining us. You're probably one of the youngest people we've ever had at a public hearing. Did your mom and dad explain the rules to you? Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Isabel Dean. I am six years old, dear mayor and city council. I am opposed to these changes and the towers. Please don't take my sunshine away. Thank you. That was very well done. Thank you for joining us. Okay. So is Celine going to be speaking? Um, um, uh, Mayor Heron, um, Celine was the one who got called away to work, so she'll come back. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's, okay. Great. I knew that. Sorry. So now I have Zoe, Dean. Yeah. Hi, Zoe. Hi. Hello, my name is... Hello, my name is Zoe Dean, Chair Mayor Heron and City Council. I am opposed to the three bylaws and the towers. I love playing in my backyard with my brothers, my sister, and my dog. dogs. I love riding my bike along Orchard Court with all the kids in our neighborhood. I don't want to do these things in the shadows of the towers. I don't want people to be able to watch me while I play in my backyard while I am in my bedroom. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. All right, James. <laughs> oh, uh, Mayor Heron and City Council. My name is James Dean. I live on Orchard Court. I am opposed to all three proposed bylaws. There is only a current, uh, currently there's only a single dwelling separating me from the proposed development. We experienced a similar situation with our property of 18 years, which we still own on 29 Hamilton Crescent. Before purchasing that, purchasing that property in 2002, we did our due diligence. We researched the ASP, the LUB, and the proposed development for that area. We had a beautiful green belt right out our back fence with wildlife and dense brush. We lived there for 16 years. 
six years into our residence, 99% of it was clear cut for Anthony Henday Drive. We were sad to see such a massive destruction of nature. It was not all necessary, but the difference there, that specific development was planned long before we moved in. We made the investment in our property knowing that was the plan. On our current home's property of over five years on Orchard Court, we also did our due diligence, researching the ASP, the LUB, and the MDP. I invested our life savings and mortgaged well beyond that based on those facts so I could raise my family in a community that fit our values. The developer bought their property with the exact same area structure plan and land use bylaws in place. This is a bait and switch. The developers want city council to change those rules to make a huge profit, moving much of those profits out of our city and our province. The economic stimulus will be fantastic for Parksville, BC, where one of the developers has his registered address, but not so great for St. Albert. Both my wife and I have been business owners in St. Albert for over two decades. I employ over 100 employees, most of whom live in St. Albert. Our kids play sports here, go to school, dance, gymnastics, and participate in so many different activities and events. You name it, and one member of our family has either played, coached, organized, or volunteered for that local activity or community event. That's what builds a community, not skyscrapers. We want St. Albert to grow. We want St. Albert to continue to be a vibrant community. We want to stimulate our economy. We want economic spin-offs. We value business. We know we need to spur commercial, industrial, and residential growth. The, the developer speaks of projections of revenue to the city curiously while proposing a 95 to five split of residential to commercial tax revenue. We know quite well that residents are costly, as Mayor Heron said in her February 4th radio interview. We all need and want services. If we continue to only add residents while maintaining our level of services, our property taxes will skyrocket. I don't wanna pay more property tax, nor do I want to decrease the services available to us. We need an 80-20 tax split. The city has had that, goal, had that goal for decades, and it feels we're moving further away. This is one of those times. The net financial gain as the developer slyly states for this proposal will be eaten up by the expenses that dwarf it. We cannot destroy our environment in the process. We cannot have our kids shadowed in the dark while they ride bikes down our streets or play soccer in our backyards. Personally, we've invested over $40,000 on solar panels on our roof. Again, we did our due diligence pre-purchase. I said it would take approximately 20 years to pay off my investment. The shadow studies done show that we'll lose up to 40% of our energy production, adding 13 years to paying off our investment. I've invested half my life and my family's entire future in the city of St. Albert. This proposed development in Oakmont does not fit the vision of our community. Please vote against this development in all three bylaws. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, next on my list is Mr. Carrier, and I see his video is on. Hi. Welcome. Go ready? ahead when you're ready. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the council. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, especially, I would like to thank uh, Councilman McKay for uh, bringing up some of our issues to the developer early on. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, and pressing the pressing the developer some. Uh, I'm opposed to the project. Uh, and all three bylaws uh, amendment. We just moved to Orchard Court. So it's for us, it's right in our backyard. And um, uh, houses uh, on Orchard Court are not cheap. They're between 500 and uh, 1.8 million. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a decision that we don't take uh, as lightly. Uh, when we bought the house, uh, the land that was supposed to be in our backyard and the rest of that Orchard Court 300 and, and 250 uh, were uh, zoned to be low residential and uh, possibly commercial, but nothing in there said that we would have uh, um, a skyscraper in there. Uh, so we feel a little cheated and it's just not what we bought into. Uh, if we had known, we would have probably decide, decided to move our plans of, of raising a family in a quiet neighborhood somewhere else, uh, probably Sturgeon County or somewhere. Um, people on our street are already starting to put their house on the market because they're scared about this project. Uh, it, and they have good reason to be. Uh, um, a building that high is kind of Oxford Tower high. So there's nothing like it in, in St. Albert, uh, nothing close. 
and that's um, quite a project. And it wouldn't be the first uh, development project that fails to its hubris. Um, some shops are closing on Boudreaux or there's this big turnaround. So we have to be um, careful that even though it looks good on in that glossy presentation, then in reality, everything might not be selling the same way that it, uh, it's planned. Um, the shadow is definitely a concern for us. The shadow study was uh, uh, quite telling. When we looked at the video uh, or, or when we looked at the slide, it was mostly geared toward the 7 a.m., 12 um, and 3 p.m., which are not the worst. Like for us, our house gets covered at 3 p.m. But when we look at the video from 3 p.m. all the way to the evening, our house would still be covered into that uh, shadow. And for us, that's very concerning because the mo most amount of time that we'll spend outside is when we get back home after working. Uh, and after a hard day's work, you wanna enjoy your, your backyard a little bit. Um, the, the privacy is also a concern. That's a lot of highs to have in a backyard. And being like on our church court, that's, that's very concerning to us. Uh, Traffic is already a problem. It was uh, talking very eloquently by others, so I, I won't dwell too much in that. But the plan that Mr. Smith uh, proposed from engineering uh, appeared to resolve the current issue, which are already a problem, but was not necessarily including all that added uh, traffic from the, from the development. Um, the developer kind of appeared out of touch with the community. Um, it was somewhat disrespectful, condescending uh, to put forward the fallacious claim that uh, walkability would increase property values when we know it's not like you know, St. Albert is nowhere near Toronto or San Diego or San Francisco when it comes to uh, the kind of walkability or the benefit of walkability. So uh, I, that's, that's just deceitful. Um, the shadow study was also deceitful because it was when they were saying that the tip of the shadow would only stay at the house for 15, 20 minutes. Well, that doesn't include the rest of the shadow because for us, it's mostly that whole area that's underneath the tip. And that one drags around for about eight hours. And we could look back at the video and we'll see that all these houses that are right, real close by, just by that building three, they stay in the shadow for about eight hours. And that's just ridiculous. Um, so that, that's a big concern of us. Um, some degree of development is, uh, is adequate when done respectfully. Um, and to respond to council women use, uh, I could entertain a smaller project capping the tower at 40 meters and having the building three to stay within that kind of zone where it was pre uh, uh, previously uh, zoned for. So 25 meters and under, uh, I think that would be reasonable to kind of build up as we move to the neighborhood and uh, I hear the bell. So I'm, I'm just thankful that, you, that you've given me time to express myself today. So uh, thank you very much. Excellent, well done. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Courtney Boyda waiting. Thank you for joining us, Courtney. Hi there, good afternoon. Sure. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we sure can, go ahead. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Councillors and Administration. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Courtney Boyda, um, and I am opposed to the three bylaws that are in front of you today. Uh, unlike many of the folks that have spoken before me, uh, my family and I are new residents to St. Albert. So that should also be taken something to be taken into consideration here. So my family and I chose St. Albert um, as um, written in the package that I submitted earlier um, last week. Um, based on a few things. So we looked for like-minded people in the community, uh, a sense of community values, the safety of the neighborhood in which we live. We have, we are a young family with two small children, the commitment to the environment and natural resources. Anyone that knows me personally or professionally knows about uh, my advocacy for um, the environment, natural resources and sustainability. Um, and in addition, the breathtaking beauty of the Sturgeon River Valley. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I previously submitted comments on each of these proposed uh, amendments. And as my uh, partner, Chris Boyda, just spoke to earlier, um, our family is in Orchard Court. Um, and we do support um, growth and development in the city of St. Albert. But that being said, we are opposed to the proposal set forth today um, due to the um, uh, it not being the right fit for the area. You have to take into consideration what were previous plans as well as um, your worship mentioned that there is a municipal development plan in place. So having a cohesive vision between the old plans and the new plans um, in, in what is, is right for that mission and vision of, this, in, of the city. 
Um, Today, many of my neighbors spoke today about the same aspects of the pros proposal of which I was going to speak. So I'm just going to go um, a little bit off the cuff here and speak about a, a couple of the items uh, spoken. Um, so many, many people spoke about the possibility of this not being a success. So, I mean, we could go ad nauseum talking about city infrastructure issues with regards and support services. Um, traffic, emergency services, but also utilities, what's the availability and the load on the natural gas, the electricity, um, uh, schooling, availability of childcare, water, meaning storm. Everybody talks about storm water, but there's also wastewater, sanitary um, waste, th those sorts of things. But what happens if this development is a success, right? Um, what if it goes through? What if everything is great there? Um, there is no room. This is already an established neighborhood and so even if we can there's no room to make the 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 roads larger to support even greater development and further infrastructure um, bordered by established neighborhoods and already the river and so again we are supporters of responsible well thought out development in this city integrating previous asps mdps uh whatever it may be and combining that with our future visions as we develop them and this riverbank landing proposal as it currently stands and the proposal amendments as they currently stand are trying to do too much in such a confined space um earlier a councillor spoke about uh that this is not cool harbor vancouver canada and i grew up in Vancouver, Canada, and saying that I was new um, resident here to St. Albert. Um, we don't have the same, um, it's not comparing apples to apples. So we really should, as the city tries to grow to 100,000, we should be looking at other cities in roughly the same um, size and how we can thoughtfully develop, learn from the, the mistakes that are made and learn from those successes. Um, in addition to the environmental piece, any, anyone who knows me knows I'm a, a strong diversity and inclusion advocate, especially in the field of mental health. And I would also like to reiterate uh, my neighbor, Mr. Reckon's comments regarding mental health um, and being a resident of Orchard Court and based on the Boudreaux Development Sun Shadow model that was presented just today. My family and the families on my streets, such as the Dean kids who have already spoken, would be in the shadow during the prime after school and after work hours and same with all of the adjacent green spaces. So that's not just our street in which we live. That's in all of our walking paths and such right after school and basically until bedtime. Um, I'm opposed to the three bylaws that are in front of you today and I respectfully request your worship and the council to take this as well as the feedback of other re residents into consideration when making your decisions and ask that you vote against amending these bylaws. Thank you very much. Thank you, Courtney. All right, up next, I think we have more members of the Dean family. Is this Samuel I'm looking at? Hi, my name is Zachary. Okay. <laughs> Dear Mayor and City Council, I'm opposed to the three bylaws. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Zachary. Uh, and is Samuel going to speak? Uh, uh, Mayor Heron, I, Sammy is not oh, up to <laughs> That's fine. Okay, before you run away, James, is Celine ready to go now? Uh, no, Celine's still still at work. I can uh, we can miss her, or I can email legislative um, at that time if and they'll. That's okay, so there's there's been about four people that haven't logged on at, in time. I'm going to go through that list at the very end. So if, when she is available, just have her log on, and, and hopefully that'll work out. Thank you. All right. Okay, so. No, Samuel. Uh, David Howe. I saw David. There we are. Thank That's you me. Us. Everybody hear me? Sure can. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, and thank you, Council, for this opportunity and other residents of St. Albert. Uh, I'm going to be taking a dissenting opinion to you, I would say, by and large. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd say every single person who is so far presented. Um, first, I want to say I'm, I'm in favor of all three bylaw changes and in favor of this development. I'm a resident of St. Albert. I have been for the last five years. Uh, well, actually 10 years, uh, but I've owned my own house in St. Albert for five years. Um, I also have worked for the city in economic development in the past. So I bring a perspective that's familiar with the development community's perspective and opinion of the community that we live in. One problem that I wanna point out immediately, and it's very apparent in this uh, public hearing especially, is that public hearings are often dominated by a vocal minority, specifically people who are opposed to the development. 
Um, I'm not saying those, those concerns aren't warranted, they certainly are, uh, but it's been by and large, as you've seen here, residents of the communities of Oakmont and, and the southern portion of Erin Ridge that have joined us today. And certainly they have a vested interest against this development going forward. As a, as a resident of another community in St. Albert, I feel that it's really important um, that our voice is heard as well. I, we don't see the same impacts, obviously, in traffic, uh, potential servicing, uh, shadows, for instance, that these residents do. So certainly those concerns are warranted and should be listened to. Instead, what we see as other residents of St. Albert is another development opportunity that could be potentially turned down by the city. It's especially concerning as we all know that municipal tax rates in our city are the highest in the region. And getting away from developments that add density like this in the city puts us further away from achieving a potential goal of really lesser tax impact for all of us single family homeowners. Now, part of what I was saying is true here. That representation is heavy in Oakmont and Nairn Ridge. This is the most important development decision that's going to be made for a lot of those re residents and probably the most public, important public hearing in the last five, 10 years for many of those residents. For residents that are in favor of this sort of opportunity, we had to take potentially a full day off of work. I'm doing this from my office right now, um, just to sit through all of these uh, public hearings, just to get a word in, in favor of the development. Um, so I, I ask council to very thoroughly think and, and weigh that in their decision-making process. You're very likely only hearing from the people that this dramatically impacts the most, where it has the potential to dramatically impact all of the residents of St. Albert uh, if it goes forward. Now, the other thing I hear often is that this is not St. Albert. This doesn't mesh with our ASPs. This doesn't mess with the development plans in the city. One of the big things I want to say is that you're right, this doesn't mesh with the old St. Albert, but we're growing. We're a growing city and we need to understand and build properly for the next phase of growth. Frankly, when I worked for the city, it was really difficult to approach developers, especially industrial developers, about developing any properties in the city. Uh, it, was, it was especially difficult because all the developers that we would approach uh, in the last 50 years have had similar experiences to this one right here. They've proposed uh, in, in a lot of respects of sometimes ostentatious developments, but also really novel and, and frankly unique developments that our city could use going forward. We don't have any, uh, we, don't, we don't have this type of density anywhere in the city right now. Uh, so it is unique for our city to go through this process and understand what concerns and how that development can build out. If we just start uh, opposing all developments that could change existing area structure plans offhand, we'll never get to that next level of development that we're searching for, especially in areas like the employment lands. The other, the other issue at play here is infrastructure. So we, we, we've spoken a lot about the transit and the, the transportation infrastructure in that corridor. Um, I, I'm of the belief that no amount of work on the Boudreaux and, uh, and Bellarose intersection is actually going to fix the traffic issues that are incumbent of that area. Um, and personally, I would push for this development and other developments in this area to instead fund a secondary access route over the river. Now, I don't want to get too much into that, but the province is right now considering selling River Lot 56. Uh, that could be used, for instance, to look at another river crossing. Um, I'll wrap it up. I just want to harp on the reputation element. St. Albert is a community that's known by and large in the area and the region as a community of NIMBYs, not in my backyard. It's very understandable that you don't want a development of the site in your backyard. I probably wouldn't want it next door to my house either. That being said, we have to consider the needs of 60, 66,000 residents, not just 120 that are opposed to it. So I urge you to consider the needs of the rest of us residents. Thank you, David. Um, sorry, I had to meet you at the very end, but I think you were just about wrapped up. All right, Jamie Juckna. I saw her. Yep. Hi. Can you hear me? We sure can. Awesome. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to share my thoughts today. My name is Jamie Jukna, and I am strongly and passionately opposed to this development and opposed to the passing of all three bylaws that would allow it to be built as proposed. So I want to make it clear that I'm here representing my family as well, who are unable to attend because of the inconvenient timing of the hearing, but we all share the same views on this matter, and I have their permission to say that. <laughs> 
Um, I have lived in St. Albert my entire life in several different areas. So I know this city very well. I've seen it grow and change over the years and usually the changes are an improvement to the city that I know and love. I never had much mind for politics when it came to development because I trusted the people making the decisions in my city. Sadly, that's no longer always true. I could not believe my eyes when they started building the Botanica monstrosities right along the riverbank that I walk along every day. I was heartbroken, not only because it started an unstoppable ball rolling on the destruction of our once beautiful river valley skyline, but also because I knew it was opening a door to bigger, more obstructive developments that would continue to chip away at the identity of our city. Adding to that, the eight-story seniors complex near Canadian Tire that is currently being built again right along the river valley. At the very least, those buildings don't infringe on the privacy of long-term re long residents, but now here we are with a developer proposing to 26 some story buildings in the middle of our city, overlooking the river and the houses and one's private backyards of several residential neighborhoods, not to mention shadowing many neighborhoods on both sides of the river. I am not a resident of the surrounding Oakmont area, nor will I ever be should this development be built as proposed. Nevertheless, I have enough humanity and common sense to understand the immense negative impact this development would have on those poor residents. That fact alone should have been enough for City Council to have laughed in the face of the developers upon seeing this current proposal. But the negative impact of this development would spread its shadow, both literally and figuratively, over all of St. Albert. I live in St. Albert so I can see the sky, not sky rises. I want to kayak alongside the natural beauty of our tree-lined river, not through a shadowy corridor of apartments. I feel that you are not building up my city, you're destroying what it always was and what it's meant to be. If I wanted to live in a high-rise, or be shadowed by a high rise or see high rises from my house and my work and literally everywhere else in my city, I wouldn't live in St. Albert. We, the people who live here and work here and build our homes here and raise our families here and choose to stay here, we don't want those towers here. Please protect the identity and integrity of St. Albert by refusing to pass bylaws that would allow developers to build something that would disrupt the privacy of your residents, overload already high traffic areas, destroy the beauty of our, ri our river valley, and infringe upon our right to have the sun shine in our backyards without a creeping shadow over our city. Allowing this development to be built according to the plans I see now is a show of city council's lack of care for its citizens and the integrity of our city which as of now I can only interpret as an act of greed. Throughout this hearing, I have heard councillors like Wes Broadhead and Ken Mackay acknowledge the way this development would deteriorate the identity of our city. So thank you for speaking as a citizen of St. Albert. I really hope you stay true to our community and oppose these three bylaws and this development. Should you allow the developers to build towers like those proposed, I will personally always see those towers as two giant middle fingers to the many, many residents of St. Albert who have spoken out against them. Please do not let that happen. Please oppose these bylaws. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Jamie. All right, next on our list, I've got Lana Bernstad. Is Lana here? Mayor Heron, she hasn't logged in. Okay, we'll come back to her. Jonathan Martin, I see on the screen. So you can, uh, if you're ready, you can start now. Good afternoon. I live in Woodlands neighborhood. Let me repeat that, David Howe. That's Woodlands neighborhood. I want to discuss some of the information this developer submitted in their application, which indicates their proposed development does not align with certain policies in St. Albert's MDP. Specifically, I want to discuss the evidence which addresses traffic flow. Page 10 of the developer's technical report states, Riverbank Landing would provide a neighborhood activity center. Page 20 of St. Albert's MDP policy 4.18 states that a neighborhood activity center shall be easily accessible by all neighborhood residents. I argue that this developer has failed to show evidence which clearly indicates that this proposed development will in fact be easily accessible by all neighborhood residents. 
I find it concerning that the developer's traffic impact assessment was based on traffic studies that were conveniently conducted in June of 2019, which directly coincided with one of St. Albert's largest construction projects of 2019, the Boudreaux Road and St. Albert Trail intersection improvement that took place the entire month of June. Normal traffic volumes in the Boudreaux Belrose intersection would have been significantly reduced due to St. Albert's residents adjusting their daily travel routes and work commutes in order to avoid Boudreaux Road. Therefore, I request that the developer's TIA be disregarded as it does not provide a complete and accurate reflection of typical traffic volumes in this area. Another factor that contributes to whether the development would be easily accessible by all neighborhood residents is public parking. There are approximately two hectares of commercial space being utilized by the shops at Boudreaux. And within that two hectares, there are 229 public par parking stalls. Riverbank Landing is to utilize four hectares of land, and yet it only includes for 139 parking stalls. Therefore, this development will only encourage people to park in neighboring residential streets. In consideration of the inaccurate data reflected in the traffic studies I, and the lack of public parking stalls, I find this developer has failed to provide evidence to support that Riverbank Landing will align with policy 4.18 of the MDP and be easily accessible by all neighborhood residents. I would also like to mention that I find it deeply troubling that the city planning department is also willing to overlook this. And I question whether some have crossed the line of what constitutes ethical behavior in the eyes of a judge. After careful analysis of the developer's application, I have come to the conclusion that Riverbank Landing resembles a gated community that specifically caters to those individuals who reside within that development. Riverbank Landing will divide our community. The benefits that will be felt by the residents of Riverbank Landing will come at the expense of all other residents. I would like City Council to recognize that a neighborhood activity center already exists in Oakmont with the shops at Boudreaux and Botanica meeting the criteria in the MDP. I 100% agree with David Hope when he was recently quoted saying, it doesn't make any sense to do a development where the traffic doesn't flow. If complete and accurate factual evidence does not clearly exist to support changes to the Oakmont ASP of this magnitude, no changes should occur. Completing 300 Orchard Court with low residential housing will allow traffic from those residents to be diverted along Orchard Court. And when the shops at Boudreaux have already been so well received by our city as a whole, why mess with a good thing? Not changing the remaining commercial space in the ASP will allow the shops at Boudreaux to almost double in size. This will allow for adequate parking, public parking and remove the need to further open up Belrose Drive. Traffic flow in this area would not worsen and all residents in St. Albert would be able to easily access and enjoy the businesses in this area develop this area as it was intended. This will enhance Oakmont's existing neighborhood activity center, allowing all residents to enjoy it, not just a privileged minority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I have Kathy Eberhart and I saw, yeah, Kathy keeps popping in and out. I know she's here. Hi, um, yep, anytime. Thank you very much for allowing us as St. Albert citizens this time to speak and view our opinions. I echo the thoughts of many of the people who have spoke before me, especially Isabel. Um, Please don't take my sunshine away. Um, always been one of my favorite songs. So uh, I, I too live in Woodlands. So, but I'm, and I have lots of concerns about my sunshine because the River Valley is, is one of my most treasured places on earth. So um, a lot of what I'm going to say is emotional and but I think that that's okay because where we live, to be honest, is an emotional choice. So home is where we want to spend our time, home is where we want to raise our families, 
And interestingly enough, my, my adult kids lived in the Pearl downtown. And it's cement and it's big and it's this tower. But you know what? They love how St. Albert felt. So they sold their condo at the Pearl and guess where they live? St. Albert, because it's so beautiful here. So I, I think that that's an important thing to consider when we're changing the dynamic of our city is we might gain a few things, but what are we gonna lose in the long run? So I'd like to go through a few of the, the things like the charm of our city, which is part of the emotion and part of what, what we feel of living here. Um, the green spaces and the big outdoors, like that's that's just what, what is here. Big buildings don't fit in. Um, I noticed that when the, the, the session is in recess slide came out, what, what was on there was a picture of the river and our beautiful city and our trails without two big buildings there. And I was looking at it for the whole 15 minutes at break and all half hour at lunch and I thought how awful that would look with two big towers in there. So I know that everyone's proud or that picture wouldn't have been there. So um, I don't, again, concrete and towers just won't fit that, that pristine and beautiful look of, of what I jokingly always call the mighty sturgeon. And because I've been here for 35 years, so at some points the sturgeon you could actually prowl across in a pair of boots and it was kind of stinky and monkey, but it's turned into the, something beautiful and it's it's interesting how that happened too. Um, the shadows, like we live in the great white north and we don't get that much sunshine and we don't get that much beauty that no one should be able to take that little bit away from us that we do get. And, and I think, especially when we look at these dark days of COVID that we all have been in, if we didn't have that sun shining in our windows, it would have been worse. So let's take that into consideration regardless where we live or what part of St. Albert we live. It's not all about money and growth. It's about our life and our lifestyle and, and how we've chosen to live it based on information that we've been given by the city. So um, that, that's sort of part of that. Then I'd like to talk about the developer's presentation a bit. He compared us to really big cities, which makes no sense. It's just like throwing, look a bird, because it it's just not fair. So you, you kind of have to just chuck them out of the out of the equation and not pay any attention because it, it's irrelevant. They made a point that was really disturbing. They talked to the realtors on Friday. That's just a couple of days ago. How can it be so unimportant about our citizens' real estate um, values when we're, well, Alberta's going through a rough time? This is one of the most serious things that we all have is our home. And they have the audacity to chuck in there. Oh, we had a meeting with realtors on Friday and came up with this. Uh, that just irritated me to no end. So enough said on that. Um, urban sprawl, they were talking about, you know what, that's why we live in a suburb. We want urban sprawl. We chose it. Like it, it, it is the, what we picked. We didn't pick the, um, the density. So that sort of doesn't seem to make sense to me either. Um, and, and a couple people have really touched on this. A few people will really benefit from the beauty of our, of our river and that, that, that sort of piece of land that, that belongs to all of us. And it's a privileged view. And you know what, that river valley and all the trails belong to each and every one of us. And, and I don't want to ride my bike and I'm handicapped and I, I got an electric bike and the greatest joy with the electric bike is going down that trail. And I don't think that going down the trail two towers there is going to feel as well. So anyway, um, and I'm worried that, that woodlands will become a cut through and same with sturgeon for people getting to, to their homes and to work sites and stuff over in that area if we put that high density in. So I'll wrap it up. Um, I don't think that council should be distracted by all the glitters. Let's, let's just look at all that is calm and peaceful in the nature that we have here in love and citizens are willing to pay the taxes they have for years. Edmontonians always joke at us, oh, the taxes out there. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Kathy. Uh, next on my speaker list is Andy Lashuk, and I see him ready to go. So whenever you wanna start. Okay, Mayor Heron and councillors. My name is Andy Lashuk. I'm an owner resident of 15 Orion Close. St. Albert's previous wise leaders developed St. Albert with vision, a River Valley residential community with a forested botanical appeal. All streets and boulevards were adorned with a plethora of tree varieties, clearly an artful mix of native trees with transplanted 
decorative domestic varieties to create a forested attraction to the community of St. Albert, manicured, managed, grown by St. Albert, creating a botanical brand for St. Albert. An artistical botanical garden space was developed along the Red Willow Trail to further enhance the namesake brand of St. Albert, a botanical arts city. We bought the brand and chose the near rural appeal of a small community without the urban cement jungle of high rises. St. Albert to my family was living with the amenities of a large center, hospital, shopping, services, schools, but with the best feel of a smaller community similar to the smaller town, my wife and I both grew up in. To me, building the high density towers means breaking the botanical arts brand and breaking the established vision of previous leaders of St. Albert. Once broken, there is no going back. A scar is a scar and remains forever. You can see it every day. Before building in St. Albert, I understood development would occur. So I spoke with the city of St. Albert's business development officer who confirmed Aaron Ridge and Oakmont were to be a residential development plan for the foreseeable future. As a longtime resident of 15 Orion Close, we are within 65 meters of the proposed Riverbank landing property. I have concerns. This proposal reveals a drastic change to our lifestyles. I oppose the bylaw changes and the Riverbank proposal on this site for the following reasons. I will experience a loss of privacy, mine and my neighbors. As a backyard vegetable gardener, we spend many hours in our very private backyard. The proposed tower residence will invade my piece of heaven that we only share with one neighbor, not 100 or more future tower dwellers. My view of the river valley will be corrupted by the proposed senior center and two towers. St. Albert's business development promised single family development of our area. As I look out my front windows, I currently have a view of the river valley that would be turned into a wall of windows with noses pressed to them as the riverbank residents check out how my garden is growing and with telescopes check out the bird count in our backyards. The shadow study, I have built my own and I see more impact to our home. I believe the towers will block critical growing sunshine to my garden. Shadowing will change the important temperatures. The Red Willow Trail plan on the north side of the river is missing. We were promised 26 years ago by Landrex. The land is owned by the city and the trail would be developed. We're still waiting. Should a catastrophic emergency occur, I'm deeply concerned evacuation of Botanica, Riverbank, Evergreen and Oakmont could not be conducted on Belrose Drive due to the congestion that would impair access for emergency vehicles due to the insufficient access and egress of residents. Dust and mud. We are so tired of the increased dust and mud introduced from the Sarasota and Landrex development of Orchard Court for what seems to have been taking forever rather than just eight years. We would see another 10 years of the same. A new riverbank landing will continue this mud dropping truck and construction traffic dust enveloping over my deck and garden. This has become exhausting of cleaning the barbecue in the deck when trying to enjoy our backyard. Heavy vehicle ground vibration. Heavy vehicles during multiple years of construction will increase. I currently feel ground vibration of buses and trucks today, and this will surely increase due to the right-hand turn egressing from the riverbank landing development. In closing, I oppose the bylaw changes and this riverbank I proposal. I concur with my neighbors on the issues of traffic over congestion, increased people and traffic noise, Due to this overdevelopment of such a small pocket of land, thank you for your time. Thank you, Andy. Uh, moving on to Carla Anderson. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, excellent. I wasn't sure if the headphones would work or not. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council, for allowing me to speak today. I'm asking today that my city council vote in opposition to the bylaws in front of you today. I was born and raised in St. Albert, having lived here for over 33 years in several areas. I lived in Erin Ridge for the last eight years and regularly and frequently use Belrose Drive to access my home and community. Many people have already spoken in regards to the traffic concerns 
and I also share them. I understand the developer has made some changes to this plan. However, there is not enough access for development of this size. The city already today said that the intersection at Boudreaux and Belrose is failing at peak periods. If you live in the area, you know that. So now that we're gonna add in Riverbank Landing and then other, any other developments that are happening at the north end of Belrose Drive and it'll become completely gridlocked. My husband and I have already discussed moving to avoid all the negatives this development would cause. Belrose Drive is virtually the only access road for Oakmont residents without driving through Erin Ridge. And now this potential development will just add more congestion. I support high density developments to mitigate urban, urban sprawl. However, there must be more forethought put into the plan. The piece of land in question is, is extremely valuable being riverfront, and I understand the developers wish to make the most of it. However, the proposal is so astronomically out of proportion with what is currently in St. Albert. I understand change occurs and it should. However, it must be gradual and not at the expense of people in established neighborhoods. I could support developing the site for mixed use. However, the sheer size and number of buildings proposed seems honestly ridiculous. I'm aware of the approved similar towers in Grandin, However, there are marked differences. They are adjacent to the downtown area, a much more appropriate area for towers. They also do not directly impact residents as much as they are at the bottom of a steep hill and they have much better access for vehicles. They also have not been built yet. So is there enough demand for housing of this type? I also wanna to speak today about some of the costs of adding this development to the community, community, specifically EMS and fire services. According to the National Fire Protection Association, a building of this size would require 43 firefighters to respond in the event of alarm went off for something as innocuous as some burned lasagna. We currently have a staff of 15 firefighters on at any shift, 15. We would require Edmonton and possible other communities to respond and it would take all of our resources for a single event, which leaves no one available if another call came in. We also do not have the sufficient equipment including a dual pump fire truck to tap into the building's water system. An additional fire hall is already needed, but we potentially need another one, which would cost over $3 million per year before equipment and training, which negates any tax income from these buildings. And that tax projection is so far into the future, and that's assuming the buildings are at capacity. We don't know what the economy will look like in 10 years when this project is complete. They may be two empty eyesores wrecking the beautiful aesthetic of our beautiful botanical arts community. When asked if the developer would buy us a fire truck for the safety of the people in the buildings he's designing, the answer was no. These people are not from here. This design does not respect what St. Albert is, and it feels like they are cramming as many people into a space to make as much money as possible than to take that money out of the province. They do not have our best interests at heart, but I'm confident that the, the, the council I voted for will. Additionally, when comparing other cities in Alberta outside of Edmonton and Calgary, the tallest buildings are in Red Deer, Airdrie, and Grand Prairie, all of those at 47 meters tall. This proposal is over double any other building outside of Edmonton and Calgary. Other cities of similar size seem to agree that the people living there don't want high rises. If they did, they would move. The developer also mentioned in their proposal they will provide jobs. They cannot provide jobs outside of construction, medical jobs, et cetera cannot be provided. They are simply providing space. An excellent example is the completely empty St. Albert Crossing building on St. Albert Trail, which was to attract and house medical professionals, yet it remains completely vacant. In conclusion, I support developing the site, but at a drastically reduced capacity to what is proposed today. Take the tall buildings into our downtown area to build it up or into new areas rather than putting oversized towers in the middle of an already established area. Asking the residents of St. Albert to allow such drastic changes to allow buildings up to a height of 100 meters is absolutely ludicrous. I reiterate that I asked my city council to oppose the bylaws before you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Carla. Okay, Jillian. I am here. Parents. Sorry. Should I am you... here. I just don't have a camera. Oh, that's fine. You can just, we can hear you just fine. So why don't you begin? Okay. Madam Mayor, councillors, my husband and I are opposed to the three bylaws in front of you today. My name is Gillian Lorenz and together with my husband Olaf, 
We've been residents of St. Albert for 43 years and in Oakmont for the past 19 years. When we bought our lot in 1998 to build our house, Oakmont was deemed low density housing. The ideas of villages in the sky sharing public spaces with strangers in high rises can make residents more suspicious and fearful of crime. And according to studies from Huddersfield and the Sheffield universities in England, high rise living make many feel an absence of community despite living alongside hundreds of others. We are all aware that the land earmarked for these towers are the former Hall's greenhouse acres. Lois Hall stood for a green St. Albert, which was obvious by the bedding plants and other types of vegetation that she sold and the numerous flowers planted around the trees outside the property. We know that after all she was to St. Albert, she would never approve of a development like this for her precious acres. How many traffic lights do we have to endure to even turn on Boudreaux from Belrose? Because there is not enough space for all the cars now. Just add another 800 to 1,000. Will we ever get out of our own subdivision road? I think that the artist's rendering of Boudreaux Development's Riverbank Land in Towers advertisement Estimating a future property tax amount of $2.8 million when the project is finally completed has the council's eyes popping. However, individual homes in the immediate vicinity, no, namely Oakmon and parts of Erin Ridge, will lose their value, thus losing tax revenue. Or are the council going to be setting the mill rate higher to recoup these taxes and also raising taxes for every area in St. Albert. So no longer are the towers not in my backyard, they will be in everybody's backyard. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and once again, I ask the council to vote no on the three bylaws before them today. All right, thank, thank you, you so much, Jillian. Uh, council, the next speaker was supposed to be Greg Eberhardt. Uh, he sent an email that he couldn't um, stay on the line. Well, I'm just going to. Hold on. Uh, good afternoon. I observed this morning's council meeting. However, unfortunately, cannot hang on to make my presentation this afternoon due to business commitments. I'm strongly opposed to this development as proposed and commend council members for their questions this morning. This is a threat to the culture that St. Albert has uniquely grown and should be proud of. Let's continue to build on that rather than the entrepreneurial aspirations of commercial developers who wish to threaten this over their, their profitability. I've been a resident of St. Albert for over 30 years and she used to live here over Edmonton due to its small community presence. Our family has enjoyed everything that St. Albert has to offer, and my son and his wife chose to purchase a new home in St. Albert over a condominium in High Rise in Edmonton. The developers must not misconstrue St. Albert as Coal Harbor in Vancouver or some similar urban community in coastal North America. Most residents of St. Albert, like our family, have made a choice to live here for what it has and continues to offer. My apology for not being able to wait longer um, and to wait my turn to speak. So that was Greg. And I wanted to make sure that was read in because we said we would provide every opportunity for public input during this. So I'm just going to, okay. I had him, I had him on a screen in front of me. I'm not sure if that was Greg. There he is. This is Ryan. Ah, I oh. believe. And can you hear me? I did, I can. And Ryan was kind enough to tell me in a private chat, how to pronounce his last name. So it's Dagen Hart. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, Ryan, go ahead, you have five minutes. Madam and city councilors, my name is Ryan Dagenhart, and I'm a lifelong proud resident of this beautiful city. I live in Oakmont and I own a rental property in Brayside. I wish to inform you that my family is opposed to the construction of the proposed 11 and 26 story high rise buildings on the former whole property and opposed to the respective bylaws 11, 12, and 13. 
Your mission statement in representing the residents of St. Albert is to make decisions in the best interest of the entire community, decisions that will help sustain a high quality of life for St. Albertans and to behave consistently within those values. In fact, this council's current strategic plan priorities include environmental stewardship. Madam Mayor said it best when she said, we are the botanical arts city. Frankly, the construction of a riverbank development high rise on top of pristine land, land with a legacy and a major part of our unique identity, literally on top of a former greenhouse seems at odds with St. Albert's own strategic vision. That said, as someone who is disabled, I would like to speak about my concerns with specific regard to fire safety and emergency services. Now, uh, Tony and Carla have alluded to some other ones, but I will, I will color some of their points. Excerpts from your own municipal development plan, background report, June, 2019. 13.3.3, which reads emergency response and fire services, that's on page 160, and also excerpt 13.4.5, adapting emergency services and law enforcement, which is found on page 164, indicate that there are concerns with how new developments are trending towards medium to high density construction, and how these higher rise buildings will impact fire services in St. Albert, and how the infill of higher rise buildings also impacts the provision of law enforcement services. My own research on this has revealed that at present, St. Albert fire trucks can only reach the seventh floor of any building. Water can spray up to the 20th floor, but it is less effective the higher it goes. St. Albert, as far as I could find, does not own a dual pump truck, a trunk with the capability to add pressure when hooking into a building's internal water pump to drive the water up. These trucks are expensive, costing over a million dollars each and would be required in an emergency, required, but those figures would be dwarfed by the manpower expense. The National Fire Protection Association has the standard 1710, which states that 43 firefighters must respond to an emergency at the 26 story height proposed, any emergency. Currently, St. Albert has the capacity for 15 firefighters on at a time per shift. A single firefighter costs city taxpayers roughly $150,000 per year the manpower alone of just another 12 firefighters, four per shift on three shifts would cost $3 million per year. And that's just to have half the manpower required to respond. That is not counting the new fire halls, which have been discussed, infrastructure upgrades, which have been discussed or other provisions which have been discussed. And we would still be dependent on Spruce Grove and Edmonton to help in severe emergencies. The public tax burden would be in fact, will be substantial. Even with twice the manpower and the fire halls and the trucks and the infrastructure, there's the issue of wasted capacity. In Edmonton, for example, what is proven most common is a simple smoke alarm going off for someone leaving a pot on their stove. Even that simple alarm on the 24th floor requires the city to, spend, to send all of their resources to deal with an emergency at that height not knowing specifically what the emergency is until they arrive on scene. So you would have all of this equipment and manpower and buildings and infrastructure costing taxpayers millions and sitting idle and aging just to more often than not end up responding to burning toast in one of these buildings. While I am primarily concerned with fire safety and an emergency support in our fragile river valley, I equally support other residents' concerns with regard to the environment, shading, traffic, and contaminated aesthetics in the plan development. Therefore, I am asking council to vote no on the Oakmont Area Structure Plan amendments as presented by Boudreau Communities Limited. Madam Mayor, I voted for you, trusting that when big decisions were needed, you would step up. You would advocate for the interests of the many at the expense of the few. This is one of those times. You have a big decision to make here, make it a good one. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Ryan. Next speaker is Hugh Wallace. Wallace. Oh. Thank you for joining us. You can start whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Mayor Heron and councillors. My name is Hugh Wallace. What I wanna make abundantly clear is I live in Lacombe Park. So this is not a NIMBY presentation. I will be speaking against 
approving the bylaws. Several weeks ago, the St. Albert Gazette published a letter from a woman who supported the riverbank development. She chided opponents by saying St. Albert is an up and coming city, and this is what cities do, they expand and grow tall. She suggested that if you don't like it, move to Morinville. Well, St. Albert is my Morinville. 39 years ago, I moved from an acreage to be close to my job. My choices were Edmonton, which did not appeal, or St. Albert. It was October, and when we drove into the Grand area with its mature elms and full fall colors, we saw what we wanted. We chose St. Albert, and we stayed. It was 1981. The population was 25,000. There was a lot of green space, but sadly, a lot of it was in private hands, waiting to be developed. I would take my children for a walk from our house to Big Lake. At Lavasseur Road, then the edge of the town, we had passed what the kids called the frog ponds. When a developer began bulldozing the area to make what we called Lost of Heritage Lakes, he showed up at the elementary school to talk about the development. My eight-year-old son asked him, why was he destroying the frog, frog ponds? What I like then about St. Albert and why I'm speaking to you today is that not only did St. Albert have a small town feel, it connected the urban with the outdoors. We have the Sturgeon River, the heart of St. Albert. This jewel of a river historically was important to the people who lived along its shores and remains important today. No longer as a transportation route or source of water or food, but as an opportunity for us to enjoy the natural world without leaving the city. The forested beauty of the valley is augmented by wooded ravines which reach into the river valley onto our upland communities. The Red River Trail, or, sorry, the Red Willow Trail system provides us with the opportunity to walk or cycle the length of the river a network of feeder, feeder ravines. As a wildlife biologist, I'm gratified by the outpouring of affection for the wildlife by fellow residents and presenters today. River valleys in Alberta always attract the greatest variety of wildlife. I could talk for an hour about the wildlife of our river valley, but Mayor Heron would glower at me. I could go on about the diversity of wildlife from the huge flocks of bohemian waxwings swirling overhead in winter, searching for berries, to the large pileated woodpeckers, to the year-round year cheerful sound of the chickadees. Luckily, the city of St. Albert recognized the extremely high value of these animals, as well as the benefits of having them affords to citizens, and the city has prepared several plans and documents designed to protect this treasure. Unfortunately, the River Valley is under constant siege. We haven't treated it well. The allure of free city land on the riverbank is strong and has seen a proliferation of uses, displaced the natural forest. We have soccer fields, rugby fields, RV camping site, a BMX park, a community garden, a huge city hall, and a dozen more facilities, each of which has merit, but all of which, in their cumulative impact, squeeze the natural vegetation of the river valley. What happens to wildlife when its habitat is changed or turned into a parking lot? Well, they just don't go somewhere else, don't they? No, they just don't get born. The rest of the land along the river is privately owned. The city has wisely prepared area structure plans to guide the development of such land so there would be certainty for all residents and some protection for our natural landscapes. There have been significant changes to the River Valley experience with infilling of floodplains and large buildings relentlessly crowding the green space. Walk from the Boudreaux Bridge downstream along the river and alongside one river bank, you will experience a jarring wall of concrete and glass, which is incongruous with the outdoor experience. Adding more density and large towers along the river valley will further change the river valley character by turning it into an urban canyon. In a 42 year career as a wildlife biologist, I've wrestled with mitigation pleasures, <laughs> mitigation measures for wildlife and wildlife habitat. It's no kind of panacea. When COVID-19 kept us isolated at home, where did we go to get a break? Did we go to the mall parking lots to walk in circles on the pavement? No, the trails along the river and connected green spaces with us. And we were alive with people and we're alive with people seeking to maintain their mental and physical health. I'm asking council to respect the thoughtful planning process that is in place for the Oakmont area and keep the integrity of our River Valley green space intact. Please don't take another cut out of the heart of our community. Keep St. Albert as the best city in which to live. Keep the footprint of this development as unobtrusive as possible. In conclusion, I urge council to reject the proposed zoning changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hugh. Um, I agree, we could spend hours talking about the wildlife. Okay, that's my timer, give me two secs. 
Next on our list is Lloyd. I think that's going to be Weeb. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, go ahead when you're ready. I am Lloyd Weeb, and I'm speaking also for my uh, wife, uh, Lynn, with a statement that we're not in favor of the proposed development and that the existing zoning should be left as is. Hence, we want you to vote no on the three bylaws. Uh, we've been residents of St. Albert since our first home purchase in 1972, and we later moved to Oakmont in 1993. And our home shares a fence with the original Ted and Lois Hole residential lot. And I'm opposed to the development application for many reasons, but I have three that I want to present. And the first one is that the residential lot 300, that's the one owned, previously owned by Ted and Lois, is 2.16 hectares and under existing low density residential zoning, the lot would support up to 84 dwellings. Um, and keeping this development density at about 39 living units per hectare. This is probably a typical density for Oakmont. Now the developer wants to construct these 26 story towers, a nine story uh, senior living residential building plus a mixed use residential and uh, commercial building, three stories within the lots. This development could um, result in 465 to as high as 1200 new dwellings. Now let's do the math. Take the original low density zoning from 84 dwellings to as high as 1200 calculates up to a 14 fold increase in existing zone density. And this isn't acceptable uh, for us in Oakmont. We were aware of the Oakmont area structure plan when we purchased this house. And that document was written in ink indicating that lot 300 would be kept low density residential. Now my next point is, is the dual tower residential building sun shadowing. And we've talked a lot about it. And these two towers and senior residential buildings are cast shadows during every season of the year. Considering this proposed development site is surrounded by low density single family dwellings, these shadows will prevent sun shining in those homes for hours in length, depending on their proximity to the proposed buildings and those seasons. In the spring, fall and winter, the low angle of the sun above the horizon decreases, the sun intensity is reduced and the length of the shadows increase. Placing these tall buildings blocks the sun and significantly reduces the amount of sunshine that we once enjoyed over the past 27 years. And I do acknowledge that we don't own the sun, but we did purchase land from land, uh, land developers knowing that the single family two-story homes could be built there and actually wouldn't contribute a whole lot to building shadowing. And my last point is very concerning that the developer in the past, I guess, several uh, meetings has presented opinions at every opportunity stating that this infill development will increase property values of adjacent communities. This stated increase in value is totally incorrect. Based on a recent June 15th value impact assessment study conducted by an Edmonton expert the development will actually decrease the value of residential properties in a range of five to 9%, depending on the property location and its proximity to the development, proposed development. Now, if you take some time out and you start calculating what could possibly happen with the five to 9% uh, reduction in, in your uh, resale value of your house, I went and looked at the analysis of homes in Oakmont, 100 of them, Aaron Ridge, 50 of them, Woodlands, 50, 50 homes in those communities, and to see what the decreased value of those homes would be like if Riverbank Landing was to proceed. Oakmont, for instance, the average price of a sale of that home in Oakmont was $619,000 in 2019. Aaron Ridge, 573,000. Woodlands, 378,000. If you take those homes, 100 of the Oakmont, 50 of the Aaron Ridge, and 50 of the Oak, uh, Woodlands, that loss of value in those homes would be $7.6 million. That would be uh, $38,000 on the average for each of the homeowners. I'm just saying, uh, Mayor, uh, uh, Madam Mayor and Councillors, you need to remember that 
you're elected to articulate the community vision, the way that Alberta community vision should be, and not to go the way of the developer who just wants to make a profit. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Uh, next speaker is uh, Joe. Um, I'm going to probably mess this one. Arenes? Joe Aarons. Aarons. Okay, yes. thank you for joining us. Uh, you have five minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship and, and uh, mayors of members of council. My name is Joe Aarons. I live in Oakmont at uh, 14 Olivier Close, and uh, I oppose all three bylaw changes. Uh, Your Worship, four years ago, I moved here to St. Albert. I moved from Manitoba to work in Edmonton, and I could have bought a house anywhere. Uh, I, I looked in Edmonton, Spruce Grove, Miskew, Leduc, Sherwood Park, Morinville, Port Saskatchewan, and of course, St. Albert. And all have beautiful homes and all have beautiful communities. But I noticed two very spectacular things about St. Albert. One positive and one negative. Spectacular from afar was that there is no skyline. Spectacular up close is the beauty, the thought, the botany, the trails, the riverbank, and of course the people. Spectacular on the negative side is the taxes, unquestionably higher than all of them, the third highest in Alberta. And somehow to purchase a house here, the intangibles, the beauty would have to outweigh the cost for someone who's mobile. And it does. And I was happy to buy a home in Oakland. And I noticed there was growth in some areas and that's great. But I decided to buy in a well-established, mature area. I was willing to pay more in both purchase price and taxes to live in one that is well-established and zoned to prevent development that doesn't suit the neighborhood. My community is gobsmacked that this council would even entertain a monstrosity anywhere in St. Albert, much less in one of the most established communities. And let me be clear, I don't want to live in Edmonton. And I don't want to live in wannabe Edmonton either. I love this community. There's no doubt that the most valuable property in St. Albert will be atop of the Twin Towers. What a beautiful view they'll have. And what a cost of every other resident of St. Albert to provide that view for those few. Your Worship, this morning the developer in response to a question said, and I quote, I fell in love with the river. I fell in love with the people of St. Albert. Well, so did I, and so did my neighbors, and so have the people who built this city. And I have great respect for those people. We've heard of residents of 39 years, of 50 years. I have tremendous respect for how they have managed the growth of this city to get bigger, to have every modern convenience, but to do it in a way that we maintain the serenity and the beauty that we have and that we're willing to pay for. I didn't purchase a property in St. Albert and then go to council and demand changes. I understood the rules. I understood where I was buying. I understood the zoning. The developer can do the same. Because they've chosen to buy, ignoring the well thought out bylaws, bylaws should not be our problem. If 25 meters is too low, if density is too sparse, perhaps they could find a city that supports that type of development. Do not come to our city and change it. I'm counting, as are my friends and neighbors in St. Albert, Madam Mayor and Council, on your leadership 
as we continue to love this city, as we continue to grow this mm -hmm. city in the spirit that is St. Albert. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Moving on to the next speaker, we have Jerry Hassar. I saw him logged in. There you are, Jerry. You can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, good day, Mayor Heron and counselors. My name is Jerry Huzar. My wife and I live in Oakmont and have been residents of St. Albert for 27 years, and we definitely oppose the three bylaws. It is my position that extreme over density will occur if Riverbank Landing or any other high density development is allowed to be built on this site. To support my position, I analyzed applicable information found on the city's website and elsewhere. We already know that Oakmont has met the municipal development plan's density target of having a minimum of 30% medium or high density dwelling units. But let's look at what happens to density in Oakmont when a project the size of Riverbank Landing, Landing is added to the mix. If Riverbank Landing is built, over 46% almost half of all residential units in Oakmont would be multifamily units. Or if you take the 466 units in Riverbank Landing and add them to the number of units in Botanica, you would have over one third of the total number of residential units in Oakmont, all sitting on just 6% of the residential land area. If that isn't over densification, then what is? Well, guess what? If the city allows this site to become a direct control mixed use district, the density can even be worse, much worse. City administration described a scenario in its report where there could be as many as 1,250 multifamily units and 2,200 residents on this site. That, would, that result would be over 60% of all residential units in Oakmont and about half of Oakmont's population would be multifamily units. In fact, the number of multifamily units on this four hectare site would be more than the number of single family residences in Oakmont. Over densification has suddenly become mega densification. Administration's report goes on to warn council that a development permit for a project of this magnitude could not be refused if the develop developer met the conditions and requirements in the land use bylaw. The fact is, these are just two types of high density development that could happen if council passes bylaws 11, 2020 20, and 12, 2020. 20. We could see, for example, four or more nine story Britannica size high density residential residences built on this site or variations thereof. Are these the type of high density developments what council envisions for our neighborhoods and for the future of our river valley? I hope not. Administration report also identifies several areas in the growth plan and the municipal development plan where this project clearly fails to satisfy policies. Many of these have been spoken or well articulated by other speakers, so I won't identify them. However, I would like to mention that intensification in the growth plan does not say high density and the intensification objectives for the municipality are aspirational over the long term. I hope council is not fooled by architectural renderings that give an illusion of open space and walkability. The project is much denser than that. And remember, the high density botanica condos are already right there, right next door. We already have high density in the area. The dev developer wants the highest residential de the density it can get to achieve the most profit. This is proven by its request to reduce the minimum floor space for commercial from 25% to 5% of allowable floor area. Given the facts, I find it astonishing that administration is recommending that council approves bylaws 11, 2020 20, and 12, 2020. 20. There is no practical justification, no technical reasoning, and no explanation to support their recommendation. Quite the contrary. All of the facts and information that has been provided shows that this project fails in almost every regard and will result in excessive high density. In summary, 
If these bad orders are passed, we could see added density between 466 and 1,250 dwelling units. I am not opposed to growth or to high density, but it should be built in the right locations, like Coal Harbor in downtown Vancouver, not on this site. The development for that matter, any high de density development was not planned for the site, is not suitable for the site, nor is it appropriate for the area. There are way too many red flags that have been raised. Accordingly, I ask that council not change the land use, but I'm sorry, uh, Jerry, that was your five minutes. Um, we are gonna go on, I think Stuart Nelson is our next speaker. I see Stuart there. Thank you for joining us. Begin when you are, oh, you need to unmute yourself. Unmute, am I on now? You are on now, so begin when you're ready. Okay, um, Madam Mayor and Councillors, uh, my family and I have, are strongly opposed work. Strongly opposed to proposed uh, changes to all three bylaws. Uh, my wife and I have lived and raised our family of five children in the Oakmont community for over 20 years. I'm a professional engineer with a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering. Uh, I've over 45 years of, in the design and construction of infrastructure projects, including roads and bridges across Canada with many in Alberta, including St. Albert. I concur with my neighbors opposing uh, the project based on many valid issues uh, that have been raised. These include shadows, environment, traffic, trust in council, to name a few. And many of these issues have been eloquently presented by those presenting before me, and I'm sure after, with solid arguments against these changes. I have read and studied the documents submitted by the developer in support of their request to change both the area structure plan and land use bylaw to allow for the proposed development to occur as well, I have read numerous other related documents, uh, both with respect to this project and in general in St. Albert regarding traffic uh, and geotechnical issues. And there are some serious engineering problems for which solid factual based solutions have not been provided by the proponent or the administration. As stated by the administration today, the Bellrose Road, Woodrow Road interchange is at or over capacity currently. Uh, this is confirmed by an analysis of the data that I've seen and the roadways and intersections leading in. And I've also witnessed as well as many others that the queue of left turning vehicles heading southbound on Bellrose backs up past the signal lights even at Evergreen. So this is without the addition of an additional 800 plus people uh, at that location specifically. Administration mentioned earlier that there's a possibility of 127th Street connection to Highway 2 to reduce traffic impact. However, this is only a line on a drawing. There's no planning, no money, no nothing. And I think as someone mentioned, uh, we'll all be doing something else in an old folks home before that ever gets going. Uh, that's, I mean, the West Regional Road took long enough and that had a lot of drive to it. Uh, and also if that does happen, that area out there would need to be developed. And that's going to add thousands of more vehicles to the roadway system with their goal to go into St. Albert down Bellrose. So that isn't really a viable solution. Uh, I also note the administrative uh, summary of the concerns raised by the citizens with regards to traffic. 73% of the submissions state that traffic is a major concern to the citizens. Administration's off the cuff comment was that the proponent addressed this issue by increasing capacity of the road network. Now there's a couple of things, they've got an intersection improvement, but as it states in the RFP documents for that project at Bellrose Boudreaux, that is for safety matters only and is not increasing the volumes of traffic through that intersection. They've got a proposed, I mean, they don't even know what they want. Right in, right out, where everybody travels out to uh, Sturgeon County or a traffic circle in which everybody will be in Sturgeon County when the traffic backs up. These aren't viable solutions. To increase the capacity of roadway capa network, actual roadway surface needs to be added. 
Lengthening turning bays a bit and adjusting traffic signals only provides a minimal, minimal effect to the patterns, but doesn't really increase your capacity to push through another thousand cars or 800 cars, however many there is. The traffic impact by this proposed development would be significantly negative and nothing the proponent has provided contradicts this statement. I urge council to reject these three bylaw changes and to allow the development to occur on these lands that are in harmony with the existing area structure plan and the current land use bylaw. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stuart. Uh, council, um, Councilor Jolly just asked me a question about a dinner break. I think I count about 10 more speakers, which takes us to about 50 minutes. It's been two hours almost since we've had a break. Are you guys okay pushing through to around 5.30? And then so we can get through the public and then we can take um, a, a dinner break. I'm seeing you know, Councilor Watkins nod. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. And uh, so that's gonna be the plan. So now we have Trevor Abs Absalon. Yes, Absalom. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, unfortunately, all my prepared notes are pretty much rubbish because uh, many more people have touched on almost everything I wanted to speak about uh, in far better terms than I could have. So I'm going to have to wing a large part of this, but I am opposed entirely to this project and all three bylaws. Um, I would like to say that uh, I'm not opposed to change. My father was a uh, developer. And uh, so I understand that change is inevitable and that the land in question will be developed in some way. But the development that's being proposed is truly obscene. And to be honest, I can't believe it's made it this far. It's so out of touch with this community uh, that again, I don't understand how anyone could have ever thought this would be an appropriate project for this area. So I would like to say, um, I chose to live in St. Albert like so many other people because of what it offers, the green spaces, the quiet neighborhoods. Um, I lived in Japan for almost 20 years, so I know what it's like to live in concrete jungles and they're not pleasant. They get tiring very quickly and they don't make good communities. Most people don't know their neighbors and structures like this lead to that sort of community breakdown. It isn't the right project for this area and it's not going to help this area. Um, even though I'm not a big fan of the existing Botanica project, uh, I would much rather see something like that go ahead if something did have to, uh, something like this did have to fill that land. But the two 25-story towers or whatever new numbers they've come up with that they were proposing, it's such a ludicrous concept that, again, it's almost offensive to people who chose to live in this community for what it was, the greenery, the nice open spaces, the quiet, safe neighborhoods. Again, as so many other people have said, if I wanted to live in or amongst skyscrapers, I wouldn't have chose St. Albert. And so again, coming from Japan, I didn't. Um, there's, um, I, I also have to admit that uh, I'm a little biased. I came originally from Victoria, BC and where we have a lot of green space again and a very beautiful architectural city. And one of the things that kept Victoria beautiful was the fact that it has a skyline uh, bylaw in effect. And that has meant that the city has kept uh, the height of the buildings, even the downtown core to a reasonable height that allows sunlight to reach the street levels. And it makes it a very pleasant and habitable place to be. So again, the fact that St. Albert is considering moving to change the bylaws to allow buildings like this in an area that's completely unsuited to them, just is mind boggling. Um, as other people have said, and again, almost virtually every point I had hoped to touch on has been covered for many times over before I could get here. Um, I was too, was willing to pay the higher taxes to live in St. Albert because I knew I was investing in a better quality of life. And now I can see that better quality of life going out the window. And one has to assume as other people have mentioned that greed is the driving parameter here. Uh, not only on the uh, behalf of the developer who I can only assume overpaid for the property and now is trying to maximize their profits from it, but from the council itself, who I can only assume are looking at the potential dollar signs of uh, putting well over a thousand people perhaps on a tiny postage stamp piece of land. And that's wrong. 
uh, you're selling short the existing residents to this community and the people who've established it and made it the city it is. So I really hope you will consider uh, what you're doing before you vote on these bylaw amendments. And I think the one thing that I haven't really heard anyone comment on, or maybe there's only been one, is the fact that you are public representatives and the choices you make going forward are gonna go with you. And for those of you who choose to support these changes to the bylaw, I hope this haunts your careers in the uh, service of the public going forward and that it makes your careers short because I for one will not let people forget uh, what you've done to this community. So in closing, I'd like to paraphrase one of our counselors and I'll do it with a little more dignity than he did. But I have to say this uh, proposed project in the 225 towers makes me want to puke. Thank you. All right, next up, John Baldassar. Thank you for joining us, John. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Heron and City Council. Uh, I'm John Baldessari and my family is opposed to the bills as presented. And uh, much of what I uh, had to discuss from all of my notes have already been covered in many different ways. Uh, the vision of the city, the ASP as it stands, the environmental impacts. And so I'm really gonna speak personally about how this decision may impact my family and how it's impacting it currently and how it may uh, do so in the future. So we live in the Evergreens of Erin Ridge, and so we only have one access in and out of our area. And when Botanica was uh, initially proposed, uh, some of my neighbors were quite upset over uh, the development that was going to take place. But I also understood being here for 24 years that growth is something that was inevitable. And so I knew that the commercial developments coming in were going to have an impact in terms of our lifestyle. Uh, but we also were able to take advantage of some of those commercial developments. Bill 13 2020, however, changes the entire dynamic of the discussion that's taking place about growth and development in this area. Uh, I took a look at a number of documents and one of them was uh, specifically from St. Albert Transportation. And Belrose Drive has the fourth highest arterial road count in the city of St. Albert. The first three are St. Albert Trail, Boudreau and Ray Gibbons Drive. And that's current, that's of 2019. There are almost 15,000 vehicles on Belrose Drive and according even to Oakmont's ASP technical report for the Riverbank, that was dated in November 2019, it's already been identified that the area is over capacity. So the only way to illustrate kind of how bad this is currently and how it could even be uh, worsened is by talking about my experiences during rush hour. I can't access a left-hand turning lane at Boudreaux if my life depended on it during the rush hour traffic. It's simply impossible unless somebody allows me in there is no way I can access that left-hand drive. And if I'm coming into my area, that left-hand uh, turn lane to get onto Evergreen Drive is also impossible because I cannot see traffic coming down the hill due to the length of, uh, due to the volume of traffic that's there. I have two children that are gonna be entering driving age and I'm significantly concerned for their safety as young inexperienced drivers. Evergreen Drive, and the, the intersection at Boudreaux and Belrose is failing. It's failing now. John, can you hear us? I think you got cut up. Renee, can you stop the timer for a sec? Some changes that are gonna take place there. Um, they only may bring uh, some new development, they only may uh, bring some changes to mimic the current situation once all of the development is built. But my family will be made a prisoner in my own area. The area simply has too many vehicles for the design of the transportation system. And this new development, right, will not make that any easier. When you take a look, and a lot of people have mentioned it, EMS service will be non-existent in this area. So when I discuss this uh, with people, try to break it down to, in the simplest terms. We have a road system where we have the fourth highest volume of traffic leading into another arterial road with the second highest volume. 
We've already identified as a city, there are elements over capacity and failing and need monitoring due to safety. And now we're gonna undergo a major development to add significant residences and commercial traffic to the area. Does this make any sense? So in the back of my mind, I ask why I believe this is happening. The developers see a multi-million dollar project and obviously major profitability and their profit profitability impacts me. Simply put, this change to allow major residential growth through condominium towers is ill-placed and ill-conceived for this area. It'll make the area unsafe for all residents. I know the developer, developers indicated in their presentation that the development would bring the best of li live, work, and play. And I love the conceptual feel of the development, but there's nothing that discussed about my or my neighbors live, work, and play lifestyle in my current location. It's great to be able to visit the shops, but I'll never be able to get to work by leaving my area. The area simply cannot handle more traffic as our road systems are designed. We are not Toronto, we're not Vancouver. We should not be comparing us to them as development. People bought their homes for the vision they had of living in the area prior to this proposal and Bill 13 disrupts that vision and replaces it with those of the developers. I wanna thank you for your time and consideration and urge you to vote against uh, the bills as proposed. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I'm hearing my voice somewhere. Um, Bill Barkley is next. Good afternoon, Mayor, can you hear me? You sure can, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, for hearing from me. I live on Orion Close, and I'm opposed to all of these bylaws. I've provided you with two written submissions with attachments, and in the limited time available to me, I will focus on my mo most recent submissions. I'm very concerned about how administration has characterized the task before you today. As you know, what you have before you for decision are three bylaws. You do not have uh, uh, to vote on a development, you've not been asked to, to vote on a proposal, and you've not been asked to vote on a conceptual plan. You have been asked and are required to vote on these bylaws. Both the municipal, or sorry, both the, pro sorry, development's proposal and concept plan are pure, purely conceptual. Neither are any in any way binding upon the developer. However, if passed, those bylaws will be binding on us effectively forever. In the result, you have to focus on the bylaws themselves, what they would authorize, and the consequences of those bylaws, whether they are appropriate for this particular site. That certainly includes the effects on the surrounding neighborhoods, including the five to 9% devaluation of properties as set out in the appraiser's report attached to my written submissions. To ascertain the effects of the bylaws, you have to consider the actual uses provided by the DCMU bylaw, the density of the bylaws, and consider all of the negative consequences that are likely to arise. You also have to keep in mind that the DCMU bylaw would apply to the entire site, and any of this development could be uh, located anywhere on that site. The DCMU bylaw would allow a number of uses which are completely incompatible with the existing neighborhood and could be developed adjacent to my property and be extremely disruptive. Most are commercial uses which are likely to generate considerable traffic and noise. Examples include hotels, cinemas, theaters, restaurants up to 100 seats, liquor stores, grocery stores, shopping centers, drinking establishments, and commercial schools. Not only are these commercial uses incompatible, however, they are prohibited by the MDP. Section 3.1 of the MDP specifically says that the city of St. Albert shall direct future growth and development in accordance with map two. Map two of the MDP designates 300 Orchard Court for residential purposes only. No amendment has been sought to that MDP, and you neither have the authority nor the jurisdiction to impose commercial uses on 300 Orchard Court. You also have to consider the density of the bylaws or that these bylaws would authorize. As indicated in the administrative report, these bylaws would authorize a density of up to 2,200 people. It's also stated in that report that this density could be achieved through the permitted uses, even without the additional height requested by the developer. And the development officer would no, have no option but to approve. 
Effectively, there would be no appeal for those permitted uses so long as variances are not involved. It would also shut out council from any involvement in the development site itself, the very antithesis of a DC bylaw. Just as, as importantly, there are no supporting reports which support su such density. Neither the servicing report nor the traffic report support or even contemplate such numbers. And frankly, it defies logic as to how any responsible council could approve these bylaws when you don't even know if the site can be serviced or whether the site or the city's road system can bear the traffic generated by that, those kind of numbers. The administrative report also stresses that the bylaws breach a number of the provisions in the ASP, the AMDP, and the Regional Growth Plan. I don't have time to go into all of those matters nor the even blunter assessment in the city's circulation comments also attached to my submissions. However, I will stress that those bylaws do confirm what we have been saying all along. This site has not been designated for high density by any of the city's statutory plans, has not been planned for high density and is not appropriate for high density. As set out in the administration uh, report, this is not a TOD, it's not a neighborhood activity center, it's not an urban village, and it's not downtown. The city's statutory plans and regional growth plans all mandate that high density be located elsewhere. Thank you, those are my comments. Thank you so very much, Mr. Barkley. I see Doug Hartman is next and I see him with his video on. So, Ms. Mr. Hartman, you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Mayor Heron and councillors, can you hear me? You sure can. Thank you. I'm asking you to unanimously vote against all three bylaws that you have before you today. In this time of a global pandemic and extended social isolation, I've constantly been reminded of priorities, quality of life for my family, friends, and neighbors. I am reminded of what I value most in our great city, they are the magnificent mature trees and the natural river valley. I don't want to change the feeling of our great city. Over the 29 years that I've been a resident of Heritage Lakes in Oakmont, I have grown accustomed to the beauty and wilderness along the Sturgeon River corridor. For my family, the river valley is our greatest asset to enjoy in the botanical arts city. I find joy in canoeing on Big Lake and along the Sturgeon River, biking the length of the Red Willow Pathways, hiking and encountering moose nearby. Over the years, I've played many rugby games and enjoyed hundreds of soccer and baseball games while surrounded by nature. The Sturgeon River Valley is a home for wilderness and recreation that gives me a vacation from the surrounding city. Let's take a tour. Imagine you are sitting in a canoe or standing on the pathway near the Legion Ballpark in our cherished parkway. Now look across the river to the land being discussed today. Imagine two towers that are the size of downtown Edmonton's 26 story CN Tower, or Mr. Hout's recent concession of 89 meters, which is 22 stories. Now imagine seeing those towers from every vantage point in St. Albert. 26 story buildings and the population density that are being proposed in our river valley would change the character of St. Albert forever. Having towering high rises and commercial density encroaching on the river valley does not align with our brand and does not protect our cherished river valley. 26 or even 22 or 18 as previously mentioned, story towers will move us away from being the botanical art city. Instead, we need a well thought out and well planned development that meets the expectations of our citizens and in compliance with current land zoning and land use designation. On June 2nd, Mayor Heron proudly received the Emerald, Emerald Award stating, quote, our electric buses and the photovoltaic installation at the transit building represent some of the things we are doing to maintain a healthy, natural environment and ensuring its sustainability for future generations. The city believes that building a sustainable community involves a balance among our economic, social, and environmental needs which we call our triple bottom line, end of quote. If this six building monstrosity proceeds, we will not be maintaining a healthy natural environment for future generations as the surrounding riverbank natural area is damaged irreversibly. Madam Mayor and councillors, 
Is that your vision for balance in the future? I believe the towers and population densities that would be allowed from the passing of the proposed bylaws will ruin the character of the Sturgeon River Valley, the surrounding existing developments, and our botanical arts city. They simply do not belong. Throughout the past many months, you have heard, and today you have heard, many reasons why this proposed development does not belong near the river valley, and why it does not belong as an infill to this planned, mature residential community, or within any mature neighborhood in St. Albert, on land that was never intended for that type of use. In the past, several of you have justified your decisions by declaring that change is difficult. Indeed, change can be difficult. Now is time for change. I believe I and many others have given you reasons to change away from a history of unrestricted pro-development decisions. Acknowledge today that the negative impacts of this proposal outweigh its short and long-term benefits for our great city. Today is the day to support T8N together with clear-minded thinking and decision-making. Your votes today will result in losing or keeping your authority over what happens to this land, as Bill Barclay has just explained again. I ask you to keep its current zoning so that you and I may continue to enjoy our cherished river valley and trees. Mayor Heron, Councillors Broadhead, Hanson, Hughes, Jolie, Mackay, and Watkins. As a citizen of Oakmont, and as president of, and on behalf of. I'm sorry, Mr. Herman, that was five minutes. Um, thank you for your presentation. The next speaker we have is Amanda Hippola. Hi, thank you. My husband's on behalf of our family. Okay, you can uh, go ahead now. Hi there, uh, my name is Seneca Hippola. Obviously, it's my wife, Amanda Hippola. Uh, we live at 82 Orchard Court with our two kids, Piper and Tucker. We've lived here for the last four years and we're very proud of it. Um, I was born and raised in St. Albert uh, for 42 years now. Um, and it's been, it's, been, it's been our history. It's been something that's been part of me. Um, Rather than going back and forth like some of my colleagues have done here, uh, that have done a fantastic job, we've taken kind of a different route and we want to show a video um, of our kids and what they do during, uh, during the days on Orchard Court. All right. So any given day, um, from four o'clock on, there's probably double or even triple the amount of kids on our street, riding bikes, scooters, um, rollerblading, you name it. Um, with that development, um, the ability for them to ride out in the beautiful sunshine that we have on our street would be taken away. And um, as you can see, they are loving it. Right up on the hill there is where the towers would be. So we would be completely blocked out. Um, that would not only be our, our house, but probably for the next two, three blocks over as well. I'm urging the councillors, the mayor, to put yourselves in our, in our spot and ask, would you want to raise your kids in this environment? where they can actually enjoy riding bikes, scooters, whatever it may be out in the beautiful sunshine that we can enjoy. Um, you know, in my closing comments, I heard David Howe speak and about the NIMBYs. And I find that absolutely irrelevant in this case. Um, you know, we, I think as the city, you considered 66,000 other people they just didn't choose to speak. And um, yeah, so that's, that's basically where we're at right now. Oh, and by the way, we oppose all three bylaws. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, and thank you for the video. Yep. Okay, next speaker I have is Joe Prins. Is Joe logged in? Oh, here, I see him coming on. 
There we go. You need to unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? We sure can. Begin when you're ready. Okay, I'm pausing because you just muted yourself. I don't know if I have the ability to unmute. Unmute, right? Okay, start again. All right. Well, the six to six people before me basically told everything that I wanted to say. Uh, the only thing that I really want to emphasize is if in 1990, the council at that time said, okay, we're going to keep this spot basically single family, why change it to towers? I mean, it is absolutely terrible. I used to live in Aaron Ridge for umpteen years and I've been in St. Albert for 31 years. So I'm asking, I moved because Aaron Ridge changed from when I came in there to what it is now and I don't like it anymore. I live in Kingswood right now and it is, I enjoy it, but I don't want to see any towers in here either. People mentioned regarding the traffic and the parking. I am really concerned about Mr. Dagenhardt said regarding the fire services. I was not aware of that. I used the Valley Trail and do my bicycling there. And you know what goes through my head is says, what does Lois Hall think about the whole thing? Thank you for listening to me and I appreciate the, the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm going to go on to the next speaker, uh, Donna Sokol Sokolik. Is Donna here? Yes, she Donna's is. Outside, it looks like. <laughs> Hello, Donna. Can you, can you, Hi, can you hear me? We sure can. You can begin. Great. Good afternoon, Mayor Heron and members of council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Donna Sokolik and I reside in Oakmont and called St. Albert my home for 28 years. I'm not used to talking to a computer, so bear with me. I have many concerns about the proposed area structure plan amendments and the land use bylaw amendment. I am opposed to these amendments and believe the area structure plan and the land use bylaw currently are. My concerns have already been expressed numerous times in presentations made by citizens prior to me and in written submissions in the agenda report, so I will not repeat them. Before you is an application to amend the Oakmont Area Structure Plan and the Land Use Bylaw. The developer's presentation that we have seen and heard is conceptual, and many comments we have heard are based on assumptions. Please be sure to have all of the facts. The decision you're about to make is not conceptual and it's real and it's permanent. If these amendments are passed, is there, there is no guarantee that the developer will not sell the land. A totally different developer can come up with a different design. There are no guarantees. I am urging you not to approve all three amendments. When looking at major document planning documents, the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Growth Plan, the St. Albert Municipal Development Plan, and the development downtown area redevelopment plan, these amendments and development concepts do not fit. Just one example is according to Google Maps, Botanica walking distance to St. Albert Transit Terminal is 1.3 kilometers. I don't understand why administration would recommend these amendments 11 2020 and 12 2020 to be approved. You have written submissions and now public presentations provided to you by professional urban planner, a long-term municipal lawyer, a long-term civil engineer, and a professional appraiser who have all provided reasons within their fields of expertise to why these amendments should not be approved. In my opinion, these professional advice should be taken seriously as should the views of existing residents. It was mentioned that the only such development to compare to is in Toronto and Vancouver. That's quite a jump to propose a development as such on our St. Albert Riverbanks. Why not Montreal, Edmonton, Ottawa, Calgary, or Victoria? I am not big on high density, and I'll be the first to say it, but I've learned that it will become more and more necessary. And I understand that, and I accept that. 
I question why does this density have to be in our river valley and amongst already existing mature neighborhoods? There can be sent the same economic benefit to the developer and the city, if not more than what currently is the benefit. If this development was to be built in a new area where the adequate infrastructure can be put in place and future residents can purchase their homes based on the ASP that advises them what is coming up front. How about having a walkable community around a multi-recreation center, a school, shopping centers on the proposed row hit lands west of Northridge. Please stick with your long-term planning and don't make knee-jerk reactions. Plan, plan, and plan. I would say listening to these presentations and reading all of the written submissions, including the gender report, the vast majority of presentations are in opposition and do not support any change to the area structure plan and land use bylaw. Our River Valley has been encroached on in our city should start now and say no to all three amendments proposed and develop a policy going forward to finally protect our Sturgeon River Valley. Many cities in North America, including Edmonton, have policies to protect their river valley. The density surrounding the river valley should be limited and minimal. The developer may say they're willing to compromise as I am sure they have a plan B. Why do the residents have to compromise over our river valley for developers' profits? As citizens, we should not have to compromise. Density should remain as is in the current ASP. I do not agree with the proposed amendments. Please vote to protect the uniqueness of St. Albert on our river valley and say no. Thank you for your time and your commitment to the city of St. Albert. Thank you, Donna. All right, so Donna is the last uh, presentation on our list. Nola was part of the um, uh, Boudreaux Developments team. So she already had her opportunity, but going back um, to speakers that had registered but hadn't logged on, uh, we as you can see, uh, Celine Gannon is here now. So Celine, you can go next. And then I also have Kathy Gibson, uh, who is number 21 on our list. So. Celine, um, thank you and uh, hope we could make this work for you. And thank you for sharing your lovely children with us earlier. Yeah. You can start whenever. Thank you. Uh, dear Madam Mayor and St. Albert City Council, my name is Celine Gannon Dean and I am opposed to the proposed changes to land use and the building of the really tall towers. I live in Oakmont with my husband and four children who you met some earlier. We would live in the shadow of the towers. Um, I love that little video from uh, Seneca and Amanda earlier on Orchard Court. My four children are usually in that mix. They weren't there that day. So add at least four more children to that mix of kids running on and playing on the street. Um, we also have, we have solar panels and attempt to be responsible citizens and they would be in a fair amount of shade for a decent part of the day. Uh, I'm also proud to have planted several new trees this season in, alone in our backyard, as well as many vegetable and fruits from carrots and beans to grapes and raspberries. Obviously these would not do as well with less sunshine, producing less fresh food and also less oxygen for our community. Uh, we moved in and built our house knowing the land use laws. We chose to live in our current beautiful sunny community on purpose. We've always loved St. Albert, a botanical art city that encourages cultivation and values green space. It always seemed to respect the environment. We are proud with their household compost program, for instance, that not many cities have. My son was working on a wetlands project as part of grade five science last week, and we were reminded the importance of areas like our Sturgeon River and how the life and food chains of animals affect all of us. How we as humans do have the power to destroy much of nature's protective and well thought out plans when we destroy wetlands and tear down trees and increase human density too much in an area. I believe the current house plans with yards would be better, but better protect a healthy balance and our river green space. Of course, I know everything we do can't be to save the environment and we do have to develop as humans and my family does appreciate the many quaint and wonderful businesses that have started up in the shops at Boudreaux. I would support, could support more of these of similar reasonable height, but not the huge towers with the huge effects on sunshine and the environment. And I haven't even mentioned traffic yet. Uh, it was great to hear that the city is aware of the Blue Joe Bella Rose intersection as an area of concern. Uh, but this, this AM, uh, this morning, sorry, Mr. Schick did quote an underestimated 50 to 70 second wait time for peak times. I drive it regularly and it can be multiple minutes, not just one. It might be true during COVID while school and activities are closed and canceled, but not on a norm basis. Uh, it can easily take three to four light cycles to turn left. You can check my car if you like. 
Um, and as far as where would all the cars back up into, I was glad to hear Mr. Schick did acknowledge that the city's proposed increased car storage plants may be lost with additional development. Uh, traffic will naturally get a little worse already with Botanica, Botanica not quite full and Sturgeon County growing and currently home plant, plant areas for the area. Uh, so this is already is bordering on non-functional at certain times of the day. It is a residential area and cannot take such a large increase in vehicles. Although these towers would affect my own yard, I would oppose these towers anywhere along the river, especially in any residential area, and especially if the target density for the area has already been reached. Uh, also, before I finish, I must also share a few points of frustration I have with how the developer portrays information with the public. Sometimes it's rather unjust, I feel. In one ad, the developer was saying that uh, the development would promote a park or green space area to play outside. I hope most people can see this as a somewhat almost comical, uh, and anything they do would decrease the nature and park area currently in existence. Uh, as Councillor Mackay was questioning earlier today, the plan shows very little park, even very little buffer between the houses where they had an the opportunity to keep some parkland. I also read that they claim it will provide us with many more healthcare professionals. My husband and I are both healthcare professionals, and we know, as well as you know, that just because you make an office space, healthcare professionals do not just magically appear. I believe there's already a healthcare office space building in St. Albert that has been vacant for years. They brag about the tax that the city will get from the new residents, but they don't mention the cost of providing fire services alone to towers of that magnitude, how costs alone of the more required fire holes and trucks would eat up these taxes easily, not to mention other costs of residents. To conclude, I oppose it for various reasons, some of which I have mentioned. I hope my four children can continue to live in our city that supports sunshine and the environment. I hope they can watch fruits and vegetables grow in our backyard. I hope they can see the solar panels do work and we can all do our part. I hope they won't have to leave even earlier and spend even more time in a car to go places due to longer and lo longer traffic lines. Uh, keep our current streets safe and our current land use agreements in place. They were put in place for a reason. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celine. Okay, um, do we have Kathy Gibson? Is she around? I see her in the panelists. Kathy, can you hear us? Have you been um, chatting with her, Tamara? No, she was she was logged in, but I've asked her to uh, turn her video on and haven't had a response. Yeah, I see she's muted and no video. Why don't we go to the three pre-recorded um, videos and then we'll come back to Kathy for another attempt. Certainly. Who's sharing those? Renee will be sharing them. Renee, I'll let you just show them one after another without me introducing. I'm hearing an echo. Is there somebody else in the room with you, Renee, that's got the audio playing? It's David. Design, construction, and maintenance. And as well. Why are you not up here? All right. Mayor Heron and council members. My name is William Norris, and my wife and I have been very happy residents in phase one of Botanica for over a year and a half now. I have two areas of comments regarding the existing and proposed development. First, our move into the Botanica community has been an outstanding experience. We are active supporters of many of the local community businesses and appreciate the high standards of design, construction, and maintenance 
and as well the convenience of services the businesses provide. We also look forward to the expansion of our community to include Riverbank Landing, to, which is going to include more services, enhance life experiences, and the addition of more neighbors. Thanks again. My name is William Bud Norris, and I hereby give Riverbank Landing permission to submit this video to City Council on my behalf. Thank you. Worship, members of the council. Thank you very much for this opportunity to express our support for the proposed River Bay Landing. My name is Paul Short, and on behalf of myself and my wife, we appreciate the opportunity to express our support for this proposed development. We are currently residents of the Academy. We certainly enjoyed our opportunity to be part of the city of the Academy. We also appreciate the peace Sir, Mayor Heron. Is, is it my audio that's bad right now, or is it hard no, to hear what he's saying? I had it turned up, and then it progressively got more quiet and more quiet. Renee, is there something you can do? I can't hear anything, madam. No, I said that it was going to be uh, hard to hear when okay. they submitted it. Okay. I can't hear. I can't hear. And Good. now it's totally gone. I can hear it up to the moment. Mayor Heron, do we know if this if um, the submission is in support of, of the amendments or not? Does anyone alleged services uh, watch this video? Yeah, yes, I did watch it. I listened to it. He is in support okay. and submitted it. I said it is very hard to hear and it might not come across very well. Okay, so we'll log that one in, in support. Yes. Okay. And then the next one. There's this one that was really bad too. I can hear nothing. Yeah, it's another one. He is in support, but it's really, it's poorer quality for sound than the previous one. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so we'll put those, all the, th so essentially all three of the pre-recorded video submissions were in favor. Yes. Okay. What about Kathy Gibson? Mayor, have you been? Yeah, I've tried emailing her. Uh, she may be logged in, but she's not responding. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess we, we're not going to close the public hearing now anyway, because we still need to go back to administration and any, any more questions. Um, it's 20 after. We can take our dinner break, but before we, we do, I, I just want to... Um, make a couple comments. First of all, we really need to thank um, Tamara and Renee and everybody in Ledge who was um, bringing people in and, uh, you know, having them all online. There used to be a little clap reaction on Zoom, but it's not on the webinar version, I guess. But uh, that, um, in my opinion, I think went very smoothly for the first time we've had to deal with such a large volume of uh, public speakers. So. Um, my wholehearted thanks to you guys. I also want to, to just say um, a couple words about all the presentations. I honestly think this is one of the better public hearings we've ever had. Um, participation was high. Uh, there was, you know, I, you know, I'd love to see that some people were calling in from work um, and that option, 
option to speak in person might not have been available to them if they had to work. So this was a, maybe a, something we could consider in, in the future. I thought um, it most, you know, the majority of the presentations were composed. They were civil, they were educated, um, light. And I just really wanna thank the public for that. And, uh, you know, I think there was some concerns about how we would run a public hearing during COVID. And uh, I think you can see by, by what has happened over the last few hours that uh, the city has provided and allowed for any kind of submission. We've had video, um, we've had submissions over the phone, we've had Zoom PowerPoints, we've had uh, email submissions, we've had no age restrictions on, on presentations. So I just want to thank everybody um, involved for you know proposing that this new procedure, those members of the public that did uh, take the time to speak. Uh, I appreciate the um, the high level of engagement and uh, information that you shared with council. So saying that, it's five uh, twenty. Are you guys okay with a forty-five minute break? Okay, so let's come back uh, shortly after six, so 6.05. All right, see you in a bit.
Did I say 6.05? Okay, that's what I thought. Just so you all know, I had DJ's pizza. <laughs> They're opening up mid-July. I have alphabets. <laughs> I didn't. Wait, I I'll have mine later. Alphabets? No, just <laughs> dinner. That's what I'm hoping to have later, but this is just to tide me over. I, I had pierogies and grapefruit, so it's like I'm good to go. <laughs> and I'm drinking pop, which I never drink. Oh, with caffeine. What did you have, Wes? Had a taco. <laughs> All right, 6.05. All right, um, we're back. Uh, we've gotten through um, the public presentations from what I can tell. There is uh, now the opportunity for council members to uh, either comment or um, ask questions of the public. So uh, I, I'm going to actually start with a couple because I was writing little notes down as I went through the list. Um, Sandy Clark had mentioned that some of the letters that she was aware of were not included in the package today. So um, Mr. Lafar might need to look into that. But I think every email that I received, I responded back with, if you want this part of the public hearing package, you need to actually send it to the hearings address. I would not um, assume that you wanted a part of the public hearing. So it was, uh, they had to send it into that hearings address. So I think everything that went to that address was included. Uh, I also had um, written down a quick note that we need to know if, if the phone numbers were okay to include in the package. And so Mr. LaFleur can respond to that later. Uh, what else did I note down? Uh, Mr. Dean was talking about the 80-20 split and he thought it was slipping away from the 80-20 and I just wanted to point out publicly that we're actually moving quite close to the 80-20 and when you consider our, our tax split instead of tax assessment we've actually met the 80-20. Um, there was one comment that they were surprised that this proposal had gotten as far as it had, that council had allowed that to, to get to this place. And I just wanted to point out that it is our duty and our obligation when a, when a developer or a landowner um, buys a piece of land and, and asks for an um, amendment uh, that we do give them this opportunity through our public hearing process that we are doing today. So, and I've said to many people that supporting first reading, reading does not mean council supports the project. That was just a legislative um, step in the process. So I just wanted to get that clear that um, we were kind of required to get this far. And uh, that is kind of the notes that I took that they weren't really questions. They were just, I didn't wanna start commenting on each and every uh, presentation. Um, one member of the public actually said that his notes were rubbish because so many people had spoken exactly what he had written down. And I just wrote down that your opinion is never rubbish. So thank you once again for everyone who um, took the time. Okay. Does any member of council have a Kathy, you cut. Kind of, we missed the middle part. I don't know what you want. You hit a member of council and then it went out. So I'm not oh, sure. Oh, that's weird. I said, does any member of council uh, have any questions for the presenters that were in front of us today? All right, does any member of council have any comments uh, on what they heard that they didn't have an opportunity to say during the public hearing or during the pre presentation part? Go ahead, Councillor Jolly. Thank you, Mayor Hearn. I guess just to add to your comments, um, I think a few of the presenters um, made comments that this should be um, parkland and it should be maintained as parkland. So just kind of putting it out there that the city does not own this land um, and we are 
we can't prevent a landowner from, develop, from developing la that land. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll give you guys more opportunities as, as you know, I always do. So is there anything that you heard today that caused you to have more questions uh, of our administration? And, and Mr. LaFlore, can, can they ask questions uh, back to the applicant as well? Uh, yeah, yes, Mayor Heron, the, the council members now at the stage are at the stage where you can go back to either the applicant or to the administration if it's something new that came out and they require more clarification or raise new questions. What you can't do is make comments now. That's for debate. Right. Excellent. Okay. Questions of any kind for either the applicant or admin or fair game. Okay. So <clears throat> let's start with maybe uh, administration. Uh, any questions? Okay, Councillor Mackay, then Councillor Broadhead, and then Councillor Hughes. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sorry. Madam Mayor. Um, the question is actually to Fire, to uh, Barrett, if he's there. I'll wait till I, I can see his name. Thanks. So, uh, in numerous uh, questions arising out of um, the public's presentation, they referred to uh, particular <clears throat> uh, abilities uh, of our fire. Um, Department of Fire Services, if uh, if they built to 26 stories, would our current equipment uh, be able to respond and actually be able to um, put out a fire above 20 stories? And also in relation to equipment purchases like the double pump truck, um, some of the other uh, uh, or other comments in relation to uh, more manpower. Uh, can you? Um, add some uh, comment to that or? Uh, yes, I sure can. Um, when it comes to high rise buildings like this, we rely on um, engineering controls. Every city does, every fire department does. Um, and fire engineering controls are things like uh, booster pumps, uh, stand pipes, sprinklers, um, protection alerting systems, um, and even the construction materials. So when uh, a municipality, when a fire department comes to a high rise building such as this, those engineering controls have to be in place. The fire department is basically there to augment the system already in place. If that system is created and um, built to spec, um, like I said, we're there to augment. Now, when we look at um, by the time these buildings would be built, if station four was still online, we would have sufficient um, equipment and firefighters to actually have a proper initial response for these buildings. And looking at other municipalities that have buildings of the same size as this one in the surrounding area and within the province, and, um, we'd have similar numbers to those fire departments as well for that initial response. If it was confirmed fire in a high rise, um, at that point, we'd be relying on mutual aid, like every other city would, which would mean, you know, automatic aid or mutual aid. We'd have to rely on that. Um, other cities to come in and help. Uh, the number that we look for, you know, with that kind of a high rise fire is about 43 people, and um, you know, to, to have a city support that initially is is very very difficult. And you know, like I said, other municipalities are in the same boat as we are. But for the initial response, um, we would be we'd be fine. All right. Thank you. That's all my questions, Madam Mayor. Thank you for asking that. Okay, I've got Broadhead, Hughes, Jolly, and I saw Councillor Hansen's hand go up. So, uh, Wes, you're up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to administration. Um, so the implications of defeating all three is everything stays as direct control and everything remains as is so that any development uh, proposal would come to council for review and approval, is that correct? That's correct. Direct control means what it says, only council can approve a development proposal in a DC zone. Okay, and, and this is where I'm going because I'm not sure that, I, I'd, I'd like the information that I was received to be given publicly. So, so if we approve it and goes to DCMU, direct control, uh, yeah. multiple use, the SDAB then comes into appeal. Is that correct? Yeah, essentially, if, it, if, you, if you approve the rezoning, 
a person could still apply for a development that's not on the list of either permitted or discretionary uses. And then it, it works like a regular direct control zone. It comes to council and there's no appeal to the SDAB. Whatever your decision is, that's it. However, if you approve the rezoning and if someone like this applicant, for example, applies for something that is on the list of permitted or discretionary uses, then you're out of it as council. Uh, a development officer makes the decision with or without conditions. If it's a permitted use, as I think every, all of you know, the development officer has no choice. They have to approve it. And um, and uh, if, if, um, if someone, let's say, didn't like the conditions on the approval, they could go to the SDAB and the SDAB can, uh, can um, SDAB has a fair bit of authority. Uh, they, 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 they cannot approve something that's not on the list of permitted or discretionary uses. But as long as it's in that list somewhere, the SDAB does not have to observe anything that's any regulation in the land use bylaw. So for example, they can relax setbacks. You've, you've all seen them do that many times. They can relax setbacks, they can relax architectural controls, they can relax lot coverage requirements, they can relax height requirements, they can relax anything as, except the actual use itself. If, if it goes to the DCMU zoning, does that help? Fair enough, thank you. So uh, switching uh, uh, tactics here, questions just a little bit. How far are we from uh, receiving uh, the updated municipal development plan for approval. How far away are we from that? I can answer that question if you would like. Sure. Um, sure. We are in the process of doing our final review, um, an administrative review, and then we will be going out to the public in the fall. We're anticipating sometime in October uh, for first reading with the new municipal development plan. So what would be the implications, uh, both to the proponent and to council, if we were to propose, uh, postpone this? Can, first off, can we even postpone it if we wish, uh, until the new development uh, plan is underway? Or is it because they've submitted it now, it has to be reviewed under the existing municipal uh, development plan? The, la the latter is correct. They did submit under the old, um, under the existing, or possibly the old MDP, so we would evaluate it against that. Okay. So there is, there's no wiggle room there in terms of councils saying, we're gonna postpone this till the next MDP comes in and we'll ev evaluate it under those. That's not a happening thing then. <laughs> I, I would suggest there'd probably be some legal ramifications that uh, Mr. LaFleur could uh, speak to regarding that. Yeah, you do. You, there's two things, if I may. Uh, the, the developer does have the right to a reasonably prompt um, um, answer on, on his request for bylaw amendments. That's why, you know, we as, as council is aware, we did um, make the public hearing a little bit later in the process than we normally would because of the complexity of the issues. But we didn't want to wait too long because, you know, you're trying to balance the developer's right to the, to the right of the, the public to have you know, enough time to evaluate things. So there's that, and then the, and the developer could waive that. The developer could say, you know, I'm happy to wait. But, and then the other part of it is, you know, exactly as Christina has said, if the application was made under the current MDP, you've got to evaluate it under the current MDP. Um, if you wanted, I could give you more, I guess, insight into that. Um, I would prefer to do that in camera. But, but I can say it's, it's fair to say that the current MDP would be what you have to evaluate this against. Fair enough. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right, Councillor Hughes. I just wanted to further on what Councillor Mackay had to say about the firefighting. So do we need specific trucks that we don't have? I thought when we had the aerial truck that was to handle higher heights, but are we actually missing equipment to handle a high rise? Because beyond this, we've already approved Greenwich Towers at 26 stories. And I'm just wondering if we're not actually equipped to handle that approval. No, um, aerial units, um, the one that we have, the ones that we have, they go 105 feet and that's pretty much uh, as high as go with an aerial. Um, we have the equipment we need. An aerial unit can only go depending on how close you can get to the building, maybe up to seven stories. 
Um, beyond that, once again, we need the engineering controls in the building, and then we go in to do the rescues at that point. But aerial units basically go to that height, and that's, uh, yeah, that's the maximum height we usually can go with. So if you had like, if you had 20 stories and you can only go seven, you'd have 13 stories of people you have to rescue? That's correct. Now, there was a mention about some kind of like pumping mechanism. So you would get the water from on site or something. So it would go higher. Um, can you shed a bit more light about that? Sure. Um, when it comes to firefighting, the, the biggest decision, one of the biggest decisions that has to be made right away is if we're going to actually fight the fire um, and separate the people in the building. Um, so lots of times we'll do what's called shelter in place. You know, we'll go to a building, we'll find out where the fire actually is. Uh, we might contain it and people will shelter in place. So if you go to a, a hotel or something, you might hear it saying everybody stay in your rooms and they'll find out where the fire is and they put it out. Um, it all depends on, on what we're looking at when it comes to the type of firefighting. Now to get, to get to a structure fire from a content fire. So most of these fires are content fires, which means that something in the room is burning. And we really try to, contain that fire to that room or to that floor, if anything. If it actually becomes a building fire, um, that means you know some of the engineering controls have probably not worked, like the sprinkler system and things like that. Um, once again, we're there to augment. So we would hook up to a, a standpipe system at the bottom of the building um, to augment the water system in that building already. Um, you can have a super pumper. Um, which would give you more. We could set up our, our units to create a super pumper, put two next to each other and, and create this kind of super pumper system. Um, but when we look at the, the pumps and the aerials we have right now, um, we would have, you know, if station four was online and we were able to get that, that equipment in manpower, we'd have what we would need for the initial response. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary Heron, I don't know, is the developer still around? Is he, yes, he's paying attention right now. It is, uh, yeah. Because um, I had a question for the, uh, the, the proponent of the developer, um, and that is the parking. Um, obviously, they mentioned, or people mentioned how there was less parking on service parking, and I remember that you mentioned that you're planning to have additional um, underground parking. So what I'm wondering is, is there planning to be a charge for the underground parking, or would that also be at no cost? Because I'm assuming surface would be at no cost, so is there a cost for the underground? And how many underground stalls were you planning to have? So the, the underground parking stalls for um, visitors or users of the store or the site, uh, those are free of charge. So just like it would be surface. Okay. Um, the number of stalls, I don't know off the top of my head, but we are not seeking any parking relaxation from standard city bylaws. So um, there has to be lots of parking on site to have this work. I don't know, Stephen, do you know off the top of your head the number of parking stalls? I don't recall. Yeah. But we aren't seeking a relaxation. Okay. That was it. Thank you. All right, Councillor Jolly, you're up. My questions have been asked. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Councillor Hansen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, these are just some things that came up with uh, some of our presenters. Um, Margot Leclerc Upfold. She meant she mentioned trees coming down. Um, I just go back to my notes here. And I was under the impression from the developers that, uh, in fact tree canopies or trees near the river would not be disturbed. Um, so just wondering what you can tell me about that. So that's a question for the applicant? I guess so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so all of the trees around the perimeter of the site, we will be uh, keeping them. And we've actually taken another step. Uh, there were some old orchard trees on the site that we have moved to the exterior of the site that would go along the pathways, um, apple trees, pear trees, different things like that, because they would have been removed uh, during construction. And there are a couple trees in the center of the site that were planted and were not naturally there, uh, planted by the residents that would be removed. Okay, so about anything closer to uh, the river uh, as development is is being constructed, would there not be some trees that need to come down? No, with our sorry, yeah, no, with our large setbacks, all the trees along the exterior are staying. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the other question I had. Um, Councillor Hanson, hold on. Did, Mr. O'Flaher, I saw you waving your hand. Did you have 
Yeah, just a very quick interjection. The, this last question and answer um, has to do with the detail of the development. And strictly speaking, that kind of thing is not before council today. It's not really germane to what you're deciding. Yeah, we understand that it's it's a conceptual plan, but I think it was a fair question just because the trees are so important, but I, I know what you're saying. Uh, well, I understand that we're talking about bylaws here, but uh, changes to bylaws might have some environmental impact. And that's why I'm asking the question. My second question actually is, is um, assurance of uh, services and sewage and things going into the river because we heard from a presenter with some expertise that works for the city of Edmonton that it's possible that our river could be compromised. So uh, I guess I'm trying to be as informed as I can. So how, do, how am I assured that we have the capacity for a one in a hundred event or whatever that we can manage this, especially with climate change and, and changes to some of these events? I don't even know who to ask that to, to be quite honest with you. Um, is the appropriate person to answer that one? Thanks for your question, uh, Councillor Hansen. Um, so we'll talk about each of the different utilities a bit separately. Um, in their original submission, they've had to provide a servicing report um, to which both myself and Donnie's department have gone through and provided comments and gotten comments back from the proponent. Um, the sanitary system has sufficient capacity to support the peak wet weather flow. So that's when everybody's having their morning showers, et cetera. Um, as well as the water system has ample pressure to support the firefighting needs for um, kind of the pressures Barrett needs if he's fighting a fire on those sites. Um, and then when you look at stormwater, which was my primary um, focus and concern when I looked at the application, um, there is additional capacity in the existing outfall. They are providing both underground and rooftop storage um, to kind of contain the major rainfall events. Um, and in any major rainfall event, um, our roadways are major conveyance roads. Our pipes are only handled for the one in five. Um, so they have to show all the ponding and how things um, are conveyed from their site without impacting um, property and or environment. So those are some of the aspects that they've provided and will continue to get more refined as they go forward, if, in, if they go forward. Um, so they do have some hurdles to still go through and provide the assurance to both myself and Donnie that they um, are incorporating the necessary design parameters into their um, development. Okay, thank you for that, Kate. Uh, and my final question for now is, um, a couple of the presenters, actually two or three or four, were saying that we were not aligned with the EMRB section 4.2.2, I think it was. It was mass, mass transit um, and putting one bus stop in front of on Belrose is not going to um, provide us with an alignment to that policy. So I wonder if somebody could help me understand that a little bit more. Uh, Councillor Hansen, I can take a stab at it. Thank you. Um, We've got, um, there are a couple um, objectives and policies within the growth plan, 4.2.2, uh, which I think was specifically uh, mentioned. It, this, is, this is a concern and this was raised uh, by Suzanne through the agenda report as not being in compliance with that policy. However, there are other policies within the EMRB growth plan in which it does conform, specifically 4.2.4, which is actually just underneath it, which talks about intensification will optimize existing and planned infrastructure. Um, so this is the existing infrastructure. Um, it does enable um, these developments are enabled through that existing infrastructure and we should be using them as according to the EMRB. So sometimes you end up with some conflicting EMRB policies. Um, there are also quite a few others and I would direct you back to the agenda report that was um, submitted, submitted back in May regarding affordable housing and then also just the overall uh, density targets that this helps achieve. Um, so that's I guess the short answer to a pretty in-depth question. Are you happy with that, Jackie? Okay. 
Uh, I don't see anyone on council wanting to ask more questions, so I'm going to go. I, I just want to make uh, myself assured and council that all the um, submissions were included in the package. That was a concern from one of the presenters. I, I can answer that, Mayor. Um, all of the submissions that were received uh, by the deadline, uh, which was last Wednesday at noon, were included in the package with one exception. One, it's a manual process and we missed one. And, and that person was told that council would get it, even though it wasn't the package, council would see it and, and you did. So okay. you've got everything that came in on. Okay. And then the second concern I heard Mr. LaFleur was about, um, uh, blocking out the email addresses, but not the phone numbers. Is, how does FOIP respond to that? Um, the, the, if, if a person makes a submission and voluntarily includes their own personal information in their submission, we do not censor or redact that out. So if I make a submission to council that includes my, my address, my, my phone number, my bank account information, you know, my SIN, whatever, you know, I, we don't redact that out. The, the thing about email addresses is that they come through involuntarily because just by the nature of the way email works, the, you know, it's going to show where the email came from and the person who sends it isn't necessarily wanting to disclose that. So we block that out. But everything else that's personal information, uh, we take the position, and this is standard FOIP practice, that if, if you put it in there, you must want it to be public because everyone knows you know, it's in the notice, right in the notice that everything you send will be made public. So I hope that's clear. That uh, makes a lot of sense. Appreciate that. All right, council. Um, next steps are, uh, I'm just looking at, at my six colleagues here to exhaust your questions. Do you have any more questions of the applicant or administration? I see Councilor Broadhead hand waving and then Councilor Watkins. And we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you this a couple more times. And then uh, when we are exhausted, I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So, Councillor Broadhead, you're up next. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> and I just want to confirm in my own mind again, and sorry for being re repetitive here. If we pass bylaws 11 2020 20, and 12 2020 20 tonight, Council never hears of this development again. Is that correct? Uh, I think they can still ask for something outside of the permitted or discretionary uses. And so then the development um, authority would not have the um, authority to approve that. So it would come to council for approval. But if it is in the permitted or discretionary uses, they do have the authority to approve it. Am I right there, Adrian? Yes, yeah, so essentially it's a, if it's a permitted use, then it's out of council's hands at that point. It sticks with the development officers and the Development, planning and development department and council does not weigh in on the merits of that proposal anymore. Um, as you mentioned, mayor, if it would be something that was not within the permitted uses, they would have to, the applicant would have to come back to council for approval of that. So basically what we'd be signing off on then is <laughs> a development similar to Botanica, similar heights, similar densities, no, Botanica is not a DCMU, it's R4. Yeah, the only DCMU that I know of is the Grandin Developments. Step in right now, Adrian. Um, yeah, that's, that's correct. So yeah, it's not, this exist, the existing Botanica, as Christina mentioned before, is uh, R4 and uh, C2, so it's a commercial and a residential, whereas the downtown Amicon development is a direct control um, project. Clear as mud, Councillor Broadhead. Well, just I'm just wondering if I'm clearing my own mind what I'm buying off on yeah. here, if I pass those two bylaws. So go to. Oh, um, read it. Maybe I'm. I'm I'm in the May 19th agenda package. So the, the go, to, go to page 540, Councillor Broadhead. Of, of the of today's package? Yep. Okay. Go to page. And it'll give you the permitted and discretionary uses. Well, yeah. It it well it, it explains on the 
okay. One, two, three, fourth paragraph down. Come back to me if you don't mind, Madam Mayor. Oh, absolutely. Um, and actually, I don't see a lot of changes in the tracked document um, of what's permitted and what's discretionary. So I'm actually on page 518 of 862, Councillor Broadhead, which is the LUB DCMU track changes and the permitted uses and discretionary are the same as what's already approved in the grant and development. Nothing has been added or deleted. Do you want me to read them off? No. I guess I'm not making myself clear here. Okay. Well, we're gonna clear everything up before we move on. Yeah. Come back to me if you don't mind, Madam Mayor. I'll have my head cleared by then. That's okay. It's the talk of Councillor Watkins. I just had uh, one question of, I think it's administration, and uh, it's about the, uh, the um, survey that was submitted uh, in opposition, the petition. petition? And uh, I just wondered if that was reviewed by legal and if it was a valid petition, all of these. Uh, yeah, if I may, through the chair to uh, Councillor Watkins, yes, we did review that. And no, it did not meet the threshold for a, a legal petition under the NGA. And what part did not meet the threshold for legal petition? Oh, in a, in a number of respects, there was no authentication of the signatures, which is why those are not included in the council package, just the comments. Uh, and uh, there weren't there would, wouldn't have been anywhere close to the number of people required. You'd need 6,000 odd people for, for a valid petition. And I think it was less than 2,000. Okay, thank you. And then uh, uh, the other uh, petition or survey that was called into question a number of times by the residents was the Gazette survey. And I don't know if uh, if anybody is here from the Gazette who could speak to that, their survey and the validity of their survey, because it was called into question here a couple of times. There is no one here from the Gazette. Okay, uh, uh, there was some evidence presented about how that petition was presented. Is that person still here? And can they repeat the information that they said about that petition? That was, oh, I forget his name. Mr. Mr. Boley. Boley, that was it, yeah. Danny Foley, is he still around? Checking the attendees. I do not see him there. Okay. Okay, those are your questions, thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Councilor Broadhead, I'm gonna come back to you now. Have you, have you... I know I, I, so I've read it again, and I, I. So when I said, if I'm buying off on a building that's 25 meters maximum height, correct? Under the DC, the current DCMU. That's right, Suzanne. Yes, the current, or sorry, the DCMU district that's proposed in the application has a maximum height of 25 meters as a standard. Right. <clears throat> So I read that. So, so I guess my question is next around density. Are we? What what I'm wondering is is that if we pass these two bylaws, are we buying off on a development that could look something like Botanica? I think, given the height and mixed use development, it would probably look a little different than Botanica. We might have. Miller High is probably a little bit shorter, and you likely have more of the residences on top of commercial versus having your residences separate from the shops. But it, it could look like a continuation of Botanica. It could look like a slight variation to Botanica. That's what I thought. All right, thank you. All right. Any more questions, Councillor Hansen? Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. 
She's looking for I was some. just trying, I was, I had taken everybody off and I was looking at documents. <laughs> and then I couldn't find us again. Um, so I, I'm, I think I'm following up on Councillor Broadhead's question. Um, if we passed the first two bylaws and not the third bylaw, then the project is going to have to look a lot different than what is proposed. Would that be fair to say? Correct. Um, but if we've made those decisions to pass those two, first two bylaws, uh, they're set in stone. And if this developer just doesn't want to carry on without the third bylaw being passed, then any developer could come in and make use of whatever these new zoning districts are. Would that be fair to say? Yes, if you pass them and then the applicant decides to sell the land after that, then yeah, you probably see a different development application. Right. So I guess, um, and I, I guess I don't have a crystal ball. So, um, you know, I don't know if uh, we risk something by passing the first two bylaws and not the third. Um, so I'll leave it at that and I'm going to, I'm going to keep thinking that through, but I just wanted that to be clarified. Thank you very much. Mr. Watkins. Just a question of Mr. O'Floor. If we pass the first two bylaws and we don't pass the third bylaws, which is basically the height schedule, what are we passing? What you're passing then is uh, you're, you're giving instructions basically to your development, your planning and development branch that they are to approve any of the permitted uses on that site and that they may approve with or without conditions any of the uh, discretionary uses, but that they are not to approve anything over 25 meters. Your development officers would not have that discretion. Uh, subject to their variance power. I mean, if it was 27, they might have, but really essentially nothing more than the 25 meters. Uh, that does not say that on appeal to the SDAB, that's what would happen, but certainly your development officers would not be able to approve an application for anything more than, than 25 meters, but it could be anything that's in that range of permitted or discretionary uses. There just wouldn't be an overlay that would say this height would go here and that height would go here and this height would go here anymore. That's what bylaw, yeah, that's what bylaw 13 is trying to do. Yeah, yeah that's right. Just exactly right. If you don't pass that bylaw, you, you don't you don't have that. And Suzanne, you wanted to jump in on that just to add, and then I'll go to your next question, Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, because there is a little bit of extra layer to that provided by the area structure plan amendment, wherein it holds that uh, 135.5 dwelling units per hectare density. So I know some of the uh, public hearing participants have mentioned like excess of 1200 units, but really the limit on the units and the density will be held within that area structure plan. So even if you change the heights, you wouldn't see your uh, density go up incredibly by not having those heights limited to the locations in, uh, proposed in Schedule F. But the maximum quite the height across all three sites would be what? <clears throat> 25 meters, that's it. That's it. Yep. Across all it would be the same across all of them. Correct. Yes. All right. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and with this conversation about the first two bylaws versus the, the last one with the height schedule, I'm going to go back to the applicant. I, I, know, I know we said we asked you this at the very beginning. Uh, and you said that you would live with 33, I think, for. Um, The building number three and, and maybe 89 for the high rises. Sure. But I guess my question more to you is because I, I don't know where my council's heads are right now. I honestly have no idea. But what I don't want to see is us approve something that you completely object to. So if we are, if we can't in our hearts um, do the height schedule, do you want it to say DC? I don't, I don't know. I think, well, it's all about density, right? Yeah, it, so we've, in the earlier question, um, 
we were asked sort of what heights we could could live with and from my understanding with conversations with council um that 25 meters um is something that's more acceptable i'm not going to say is acceptable but it seems to be more acceptable than uh, 40 meters we um, proposed we did run some numbers um and if we left the height schedule if we left it at 25 meters for the site with the exception of the two tower areas reduce the towers to 79 meters so that would take them down what is that uh, 21 meters um we believe we could work inside that envelope and achieve the the vision not increase the site coverage and keep the green spaces um i don't know if does that answer your question i mean it does and that would uh require a council member to make a motion right now to uh amend schedule f to, to yeah. 79 meters which could happen I, I have no idea um but if nobody does that that the, this is where my 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 issue and my problem is because I don't, if, if nobody makes that motion, I, I don't know how to vote on the first two bylaws. So I guess, you're, you're, I think what you're saying is you would rather keep it as a DC, but I don't want to assume that. Yeah, we're, we're just checking with NOLA, the exact specifics of zoning. I'm not a hundred percent. Okay, all right. I'm going to um, come back because because I see Councillor Watkins waving at me. So go ahead, right. Rick. Did you just say that you could accept 79 meters on the high rise, and what was the height everywhere else? 25 meters. That way, we're not um, we're not making any other changes. Okay. Okay. So set you could go 79 meters on the high rise and 25 meters on the other part. Okay. Thank you. All right. Councilor McKay. Uh, just a question then to the uh, uh, gentleman, uh, because when you asked the question or when the question was posed, it, it came back, it's all about the density. Can you explain that comment? Yes, yeah, I can. Um, so we had um, we had the towers that were, were taller and we had some podiums that were uh, under the the 25 meters, they were under the 20 meters. So what we're doing is we're taking some height off the towers and the 25 meter height seems to be appropriate for some. So we're adding some density into the pedestal. So we're changing some pedestals from 15 meters to 25 meters. It costs us a little bit of density, um, but I guess that's a compromise we would make to, to get a quick decision too. So what we can do to make the site work is the two towers, not, not any bigger footprint on the towers at 79 meters, that 79 meters is the whole height, including the pedestal. Then the rest of the site would have the 25 meter maximum cap on it. Um, we believe we can achieve our targets in that and build very much what was presented. So thank you, Dave. The, so, what density do you are you looking for? What density do you need? What what do you think you need then in your plan? Um, your whatever. I'm, I apologize for not knowing the right language. But what density do you think you need to make whatever? Is it a profit? Is it what? Is it just to make it work? Is it make it to be supported by retail? Just help me out with that. Sure. Um, and, and honestly, it's all of those things. Um, we are doing this for a profit, but it needs to support the retail. Our maximum site density is got to be right in that 450 range. You know, maybe as low as 430. We go much below that, and it just doesn't work for us. All right, thank you. That's I appreciate that insight. Okay. Um, did you hear back from Nola? It's phone here, so let's give this a try. If that's okay. Okay. Hey, Noah. Noah, are you there? Yeah, I'll leave you in love. Okay. We're going to put you on with the council here, okay? You're on speaker. Okay, let me just get this connected here. It's testing on there. Can you hear Nola speak? We can, yep. Hello? Okay. Can just, they can hear you, Noah. Just speak normal. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. So, I... 
I think part of the question is, is it any bit Okay, sorry, I'm getting feedback delays. I think the desire here is if we can proceed with the DCMU with the revised height schedule, so um, we would need a, a motion made for that, then that would allow us to, and it would give council security that those the, the higher buildings at 79 meters would be in those specified locations. Um, so I think that would achieve achieve quite a bit of um, you know provide that certainty you're looking for that combined with the architectural controls that would be required at the development permit stage and a number of the other requirements at DP stage um, would alleviate some of those concerns that you know the, the same kind of uh, outcomes would be achieved with a with just a regular direct control as opposed to using the DCMU zone Okay. So, does, that help, does that help clarify a little bit? I'm sorry, my volume's a bit bad. I had to come fine. home to a baby. <laughs> can you hear me, Nola? Yes, I can. Okay. So the, the really the question that I'm struggling with, and maybe council is too, is if no one makes that motion to um, amend the height schedule and they disagree with what's in front of us now, how do we vote on the first two bylaws? The, do, would you rather it stay DC or would you rather it be DCMU? Um, well, I think um, that may be a, a Rob and Dave uh, <laughs> discussion and how they'd like to proceed at this point. Just talk to off mic. Okay, I'm gonna put it back to you, Rob and Dave in two seconds because I saw Councillor Watkins hand go up. All right, we just want to build what we propose. So I'm not sure what the zoning is. Um, I'm comfortable with a DC zoning. Councilor Watkins. Yeah, I was just wondering if, uh, this is probably a question of Mr. O'Flar, if the applicant could ask for a tabling of this item and come back at, a, at another date at, at the next meeting maybe with uh, amended height. Is that an option also? as opposed to if, if, if nobody's moving it. That, that would be very difficult, Councillor. We've gone through the public hearing process and will shortly have gone through the public hearing process after it's adjourned. Uh, it's in Council's hand to debate. It, it's not open to you, you know, in the absence of public scrutiny to go into negotiations like that. It just isn't. I'm sorry. Okay, you're good, Councillor Watkins. Any more questions? Oh, Suzanne, I saw you said you have a point of clarification. I didn't know what that was about. Go ahead. Oh, um, partly because your question to the developer referenced if they would want to stay as a regular direct control if they could not achieve, or if council did not agree with the height schedule that's proposed. Right. If the site stays as a plain direct control, council will see the development permit and can set heights and uh, development regulations through that direct control development permit. Whereas the direct control mixed use district is where that 25 meter standard comes into play. Right, and under the DC, um, there are no permitted or discretionary. It's, so they could they could submit a development permit for the full height and we would then be debating that all over again, right? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Watkins, something that has happened in the past, I'm not saying to do it or not do it, is when we did have the development, which council will feel uncomfortable with, there has been motions to just say, we're going to send this back to the developer based on the feedback and come back to us and not debate any of the bylaws, just leave it hanging. Do you remember that? We did it with um, Landrex north of, on the Sonoma Trail, Mayor Heron. I'm staring at you, but you don't know it. Um, <laughs> so, um, like, they wanted the commercial and we didn't want that much com less commercial. We wanted more commercial and we sent it back to them. So that's also an option is that this council could put a motion saying, go back and give us another plan based on the feedback of tonight. And we're not debating anything Then they don't have the six month delay if they do want to bring it back sooner. So I'm just letting you know that that's on the table as well, or has been done before. 
is not that what the tabling would be for you direct them to table it so they could go back it, it wouldn't be tabling it it would be like a motion saying go back and give us a new design and but we're not saying no we're just saying go back and give us a new design because we didn't vote if we don't vote no they don't have that six month delay so um that has happened and i know you were asking about it so that would be another option as opposed to saying i'm tabling it you'd actually say go back and give us something else so just letting you know that because that has happened so Councilor oh actually i'm going to let mr lafleur get in and then i'll go to you ken yeah if i may just a slight gloss on that Councilor hughes is correct that can happen but again depending on what the developer might come back with if it's if it's you know a significant change from what's been done now, you might need to go through another whole public hearing process. It's, yeah. I'm not saying you would. It depends what you'd come back with, but that's a distinct possibility if you go that route. Yeah. And that's why I continually look at the applicants to see if what they would change and what you know what. So, but it's difficult. Councilor McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, I think Mr. Lafleur just answered my question because my point would be, um, and I'm not sure how it was handled in the other situation, but what you're asking, uh, you're, you're, well, again, we're dealing with a conceptual plan and you, now you're saying you're going to come back at 79 and then where's the feedback, where's the shadow studies, where's all the other stuff potentially that might generate more public, the public's need to become involved again. So I'm, I don't know how you would address that. Yeah, I agree. It's difficult. You address it through another public hearing. Through another public yeah, hearing. You, you just do another public. It didn't stop it. It just does not require the six month delay then. Is if the developer were to make a turnaround and make the changes, there's a potential that they didn't have to wait six months before they begin the reapplication right. process. That's all. That's what, that's what the benefit would be. Great. That's it. And, and we could do it in person, hopefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Hansen. Um, so if we um, if we don't pass any of these bylaws today, uh, because there, perhaps there's a discomfort on council's part, um, I see that there's an alternate motion there that says that they can reapply within six months. I see that, um, but essentially uh, would that send send the signal that we want all bylaws to remain the same going forward or they would just come back with some new a new design uh, asking for uh, rezoning again and I guess I'm asking this question because I feel like I'm not sure that DCMU is the best I don't know that for sure but um, I guess I'm having a sober second thought about that rezoning. So, but would we assume that if we if we don't pass any of these, we're just um, back to the way that the land has been um, zoned, and then he just goes through the whole. They go through the whole application process again. That's basically what happens. I've never really gone through this, so that's if, exactly. If we put these bylaws on the floor and they're defeated, then they can't reapply for six months. Um, but during the, the process of debate, I would expect that this council would probably make it clear what you would be willing to um, see on that land and that would give the applicant some direction for the next application. Okay, thank that, you. That would be thank my you. guess. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm looking around for hands. No more questions. Go ahead. Oh, Councillor Broadhead. <clears throat> Is it your desire then, Madam Mayor, that somebody, uh, whether they support it or not, put a motion for the revised heights so that debate could occur? Is that what your desire is? Uh, and do you yeah. believe that that would be helpful for council? I, I don't think the, uh, I think council can't, we can't sidestep side the debate. We have to have the debate. I think the proponent needs to hear the debate and I think the community needs to hear the debate as well. Um, irrespective of the outcome. And uh, actually, Councilor, I, I really appreciate that question. 
because it would allow us to debate the one issue um, separately from the rest, uh, which is the height schedule. So uh, I'm not asking you to do it, but um, it probably would give clarity to the rest of council. <coughs> Although that would not come until we entertained bylaw 13. Mr. LaFleur, can we um, move these bylaws out of order? I don't think we can, because you can't, you have to have an area structure plan <laughs> approved yeah, I, before you do the land use pilot. You're thinking the same thing. Yeah. Uh, there. I don't think you can, and, and I, I, I defer to the planners for their views too, but I do think you do need to deal with the area structure plan first. You mm -hmm. would certainly you'd certainly need to rezone before you talk about changing the height, uh, height requirements. So I think they do have to come in the order they come, 11, 12, then 13. But again, if, 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 uh, if any of the planners have a different view, uh, I'd certainly like to hear it. No, Mr. LaFleur is correct. They're given in the recommendation given in the report is the order that they should follow so that the land use bylaw stays consistent with the ASP. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, and we wouldn't make a, a motion to amend the height schedule until you got to bylaw 13, second reading. Correct. <laughs> All right. Um, Councilor Broadhead, the other option is, of course, put second reading for the area structure plan on the floor. And during our comments, we could we could talk about the height that we yeah, give an indication when you got to the land use bylaw whether we should change it or not. Or defeated. Okay. Um, any questions? Anyone need a minute to think or to take a break? Okay. Um, anyone willing to make a motion to close the public hearing? Go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. I move that we close the public hearing. Is there something else to, put to say? I don't think that's uh, it. And we're close. We have to read uh, which one. Oh, the public hearing for bylaw 11 2020, bylaw 12 2020, and bylaw 13 2020 be closed. Thank you for that. Uh, any comments on that? No, I think that this is, uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> this has been a very thorough public hearing. Yeah. Anyone else? I'll just kind of repeat some of the things I said earlier. Uh, it was a very thorough public hearing with lots of good opinions and and uh, and very respectful. And I really appreciate that because this is a, an issue filled with a lot of emotions. Um, so thank you very much. Anything to close, Councillor Hughes? Call for the vote. That is unanimous. Okay. Public hearing is now closed. So we are on to bylaw 11, 2020, and we'll do them one at a time, I guess. But can we do them together, 11 and 12? They're, they're in the package together. Uh, Mayor, uh, you could do them together as, as per what's in the package. Given uh, the nature of the discussion, where things are going, it might be better to deal with 11 first. Though. I'll separate them, okay. I think so. All right. So just so everyone knows what 11 is. 11 is the uh, bylaw to change the area structure plan. Um, and then bylaw 12 is the redistricting. And then bylaw 13 is, sorry, sorry, bylaw 12 is land use bylaw, but it's the redistricting. And then bylaw 13 is also the land use bylaw, but it has the height schedule. So that's the text changes. So let's start with the area structure plan amendments. So I need a council member to put the motion on the floor. Oh my. Mr. LaFleur, if no one makes the motion, we're dead in the water right here today, right? If no one makes a motion for even second reading of even bylaw 11, 2020, I don't see any point in proceeding, no. Okay. So, um, then the applicant would, would uh, have to wait the six months to reapply. No, not necessarily. The applicant could make a different application under the DC zoning to go direct to council to have you deal with all okay. the granular details. And that could happen tomorrow. 
Great. Okay. Does anyone want to make a motion to do bylaw 11? And and the lack of a motion is is very telling in itself. Councilor Jolly. I, I mean, I don't know how I'm going to vote on this, but I, I would move it just to have the debate um, in public, so the developer kind of knows where where we're feeling. If if all right, can you read it into the record? That. Um, that bylaw 11 2020 being amendment four to the open Oakmont area structure plan 1297 redesignating the subject lands from commercial and low density residential to mixed use be read a first time a second time sorry a second time <laughs> <That's> okay <laughs> I have a question. We've, been here, we've been here for a little while <laughs> <laughs> okay before i accept that i see councillor hughes's hand going up yes so to administration um the current Botanica site is not considered mixed use, right? It's considered that R4 commercial or is on the ASP, is it considered mixed use because they're so close together? That would probably be a question for Suzanne or Adrian, but I yeah. don't. Um, sorry, through the chair to Councillor Hughes, could you repeat that question, please? So on the current ASP for the Botanica site, is it considered mixed use or is it considered R4 and commercial on the ASP site right now? Those are land use. Uh, I don't know if they're mentioned in the ASP. Well, I'm just saying, well, they were saying that the Oakmont Street ASP, we're changing it from commercial to mixed use. So I'm wondering just what the current, well, what's been approved in the past, what is that considered? Has that been considered mixed I use? I don't have the full ASP on my desk, but I believe the Botanica is separated between commercial and residential because okay. they are straight zonings rather than a mixed use zone. So it still has that differential. Okay, that's all I wanted to check. Thank you. Okay. Actually, right. that would definitely be the case because Mixed use does not currently exist in the Oakmont area structure plan. Okay, so it cannot be mixed use. Councillor Hansen, question. Um, as I read this, and I'm I'm looking at my notes. I'm not actually looking at the text, but basically, eleven is two amending motions, right? Because you're taking uh, two parcels, going from commercial to mixed use, and you're taking one parcel, which is going from LDR to mixed use. To make everything mixed use, um, does that all have to be done in one one motion, or could it be split? Uh, so the bylaw has two different pieces to it. You're right. So the way the bylaw is written right now is so that both of those amendments would happen at the same time. Okay. I think council would have to make a motion to amend the amending bylaw prior to carrying if that was the choice. But I don't think, uh, Councillor Hansen, do you want to split them or do you want to just take one of those No, out? I don't, I'm not even sure, but I, I just, I keep going back to the Botanica site, which is R4 and C2, and this is DCMU. And I don't know why there isn't a little bit more consistency on the whole area. So I don't even know how I'm going to vote. I just asked the question process why. So I'll have to okay. still keep mulling on it. Okay. Any more? Oh, Councillor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, probably through you to Mr. LaFleur. Um, there was some implication uh, during the public hearing that because this would be outside of the current MDP that we would be open to legal challenge. A, did I hear that correctly? And B, if I did, is that a risk that we face? Uh, through the chair, um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable getting into the, the details of this sort of thing, you know, in an open setting like this, because it is really legal advice to my client. That said, the, the, you know, a public hearing is, is by its nature open. So unless someone doesn't want me to do this, I'm going to give you an answer to that. Okay. And the answer is that the MGA states that to the extent that the a municipal development plan is in conflict with or inconsistent with a statutory plan, like in this case, the Oakmont Area Structure Plan, the MDP prevails. Now, very good question. What does that mean in practical terms? There is nothing in the MGA that says 
that if the municipal development plan is in conflict with the land use bylaw, that the MDP prevails. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's a, I guess I would say that there is definitely a risk that because the MDP doesn't line up perfectly with saying that this particular part of St. Albert should be appropriate for this kind of development, neither does it say it should not be. It just doesn't, it's just silent on the question of should it be, you know, should this kind of density of development be in this area? So is there a risk? Uh, and Mr. Barkley would say that there is. I don't disagree with him. I think it would be fair to say that I don't think the risk of a court overturning your decision is as great as he might argue for, but I do not disagree that there is some risk in going ahead and making this amendment to the area structure plan uh, and leaving it in a situation where it doesn't sit comfortably, I'd put it that way, it doesn't sit comfortably with the MDP and that does leave you at some risk of a court overturning your decision. Does that help? It does, thank you. Further comment? No, go. Do you have any more questions? Oh, Suzanne wants to jump in on that? Okay. Uh, yeah, just to go back to the comment that was given by Mr. Barclay, where he mentioned that it does not exactly align with the MDP. The map to future land use of the municipal development plan does not have a mixed use designation within it. This site is partly commercial and partly residential within that uh, future land use map of the MDP. However, the in the DCMU district, for example, the standard ratio of commercial to residential is 25% commercial minimum and about 75% residential, whereas the proposal, um, the text changes within the DCMU as proposed by the applicant, reduce that to 5% commercial to 95% residential. So we feel that would still align with the commercial and residential split designations within that MDP future land use. If I may add one more thing, I think it's important to bear in mind, uh, we're here because a particular landowner or developer has applied for amendments to certain bylaws. It was open to them to apply for an MDP amendment too. They did not. So the risk is as much, I would say, even more the developers than it is councils. Just, just pointing that out, they, if they thought there was a problem, they could have applied for an MDP amendment and they did not do so. Fair enough, thank you. All right. Okay, any more questions before I accept? Okay, Councillor Jolly, I'm going to accept your motion for second reading of bylaw 11. Go ahead. I didn't want to go first. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've had to really consciously remind myself that, that we are not talking about development, development permit or a particular project. And it really is just a re, um, kind of redesignation of a of land in terms of what is permitted and what is discretionary. Um, if this wasn't dealing with the one section right now that is exclusively um, residential, I think I would have a lot easier time, um, you know, to the, to the applicant, I, you know, for DCMU, I, I like the splits between residential and, um, and commercial. I think it's really exciting to have those mixed use areas, but in this particular location, um, I'm really hesitant to kind of have a, a carte blanche in terms of um, permitted and dis discretionary. Um, just because it is such a sensitive area. Um, and so that, that is why I'm leaning towards uh, voting against this, um, this amendment. That's all I have, thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Mackay and then Councillor Hughes. All right, jump in front of Councillor nope, Hughes. First mm -hmm. So it goes Mackay, Hughes, Broadhead right now. That's not the way the alphabet works. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, no, I'm not going to support this. Um, I'm not going to support this basically primarily on the fact that this goes in completely away from the original intent of the ASP. And I realize we've changed ASPs before, but um, going all the way back, if we move to a mixed use, you're looking at looking at the bylaw, <clears throat> you could have all sorts of diverse housing options. You could even have owner operated boutique shops, cafes, racks. You could have uh, office spaces. Um, we heard from a lot of residents this evening that said that they did their due diligence. They went through 
uh, the area structure plan when they were purchasing their property as far back as 1998. Um, and now you have new people moving into the area and uh, you even saw some with some tolerance that they would accept something different. But at the same time, this is, this is significant. And um, Councillor Jolly just said, you know, this is so close to the, to the river. I've got all sorts of environmental concerns um, outside of what the uh, original designation is. So I can't, I'll, I'll speak to some of the other aspects if we get that far, but um, for this one, for 11, 2020, I don't support changing the area structure plan, not at all. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. The concern I have with changing it, just even going forward to changing it to mixed use is basically you're, you're putting it towards the DCMU. And the DCMU, while it's certainly pragmatic, you can put more things in the smaller footprint, you're also increasing the density. When you increase the density, you're increasing the traffic. And even if we do reduce the height, it's not gonna reduce the number of people that'll be driving in and out. And that problem with the traffic is not gonna go away. So, and when I look at the right in, right out, that's basically just begging people to shortcut through Erin Ridge and El Dorado, which we've already done all these measures to try to discourage people from doing this. And then in de facto, it would actually encourage it. So the concern I have on top of the heights and the shadowing is the fact that even if we lower it, even if we just say it's DCMU and we're gonna use mixed use, if we have the same number of expected cars going through there, we have not solved one of the major problems that we have and, and AI lights is not going to address that. So um, in my opinion anyway, so that's my concern. So I won't be supporting this. And I think that the other thing we have is that we were talking about, well, why don't we change this and change that off, off the top of our, kind of on the, on the fly. And then basically council is also agreeing to something almost blind. We don't really know what would end up being the end result of what we're agreeing to. And if we are gonna change an ASP, I think that council should have a clear idea of at least the time of the approval of what we were expecting it to look like. And at this point, if the heights start changing, we don't even know what the end result would be looking at and where, where the shadows would be and, and what those effects would be. So um, I think that we need to see a clear picture of what we're doing, but ultimately, um, if we're doing mixed use, it's going to increase density. And if we're gonna increase density, we're never gonna actually address the traffic problems. And while this might be a wonderful addition to having it to Botanica per se, the location of it does not facilitate that level of increased traffic. And the traffic mitigations we've done to date, I think are only to deal with the problems that are currently existing, but really will not deal with the future problems that we would be expecting. So for that reason, I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Councillor Broadhead. <laughs> hey, I was kind of dreading this day coming because there's, I'm, I'm torn quite honestly, I'm torn between what, uh, uh, what plans were made many, many years ago, and what perhaps is best for the community today. And, and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of times, uh, plans that were made in the past uh, uh, don't fit for what is today. First off, though, I, I do want to commend the, uh, the Oakmont community for organizing the way that you did. Uh, um, I believe that those that were close to this uh, uh, development certainly came out in spades and you were articulate and you, um, you know, you were respectful and I appreciate all of that. And, uh, and I too don't like the idea of changing the designation of a particular piece of land once it's been planned. But times do change. And I'm not saying I'm going to support this change, but but the reality of it is is that St. Albert is is a is a community facing uh, change. It cannot be this the the St. Albert of 30 years ago or 40 years ago as much as we would like it to be. The matter is is that we're we're almost 70,000. We're going to 100,000, and um, you have to react appropriately. It was interesting that one presenter said today he was talking about uh, the frog ponds at uh, by Grandin. 
well, I happened to live right next to the frog ponds. And I remember walking through that area with my young son and we were looking at uh, all of those things and we were having such a good time. Fast forward to 2010 when I ran uh, for council, I was door knocking in Heritage Lakes and one individual there told me, we cannot grow anymore because St. Albert is big enough, all those whatevers, they can't come because St. Albert is big enough. Problem is St. Albert is an idea and it's a and it's a, it's a concept, it's a, it's a living organism that grows. What we try to foster is the St. Albert that meets our vision of what we all came here to be. And that's this community of people who come together because we love the community, we love the green space, we love the ideas of family and friends getting together. And, and we saw some wonderful videos of young kids driving down the street. That's what we want. We want to be able to raise our kids. We want to be able to uh, live in a community where we can walk to the store like we did 100 years ago. Things change. Change is hard. And, uh, and that's why this debate is so difficult. Because I understand buying next to a piece of property who you think is going to be uh, a single family dwelling and then a developer buys it and he says, no, I want a different vision for that land. But what's best for the community? We heard from, from Orchard Park. We heard from a couple people elsewhere, but as council, we represent all 67,000 people. And so sometimes it's a bigger question. I'll leave it at that. I'm not sure how I'm gonna vote yet, Madam Mayor. But that's why this is so hard for me. Councillor Hansen or Councillor Watkins, do you want to jump in before I make, go ahead? Um, well, I'm kind of with Councillor Broadhead, but I, I think, um, you know, I'd like to see, I would like to see development in this area. I, I think I, I really would. I am, um, after listening to uh, so many presenters today and not everybody from Oakmont, um, I'm more concerned around the 300 Orchard Court parcel. And I am not, I am just not sure in my mind or comfortable that mixed use uh, is absolutely right. I'm concerned about traffic congestion um, I, I'm concerned about safety. I'm concerned about emergency services. And, and I just, in my gut, my gut is telling me that um, I want to see change, but this isn't quite right. It's just not quite right right now. I would like to see something else brought forward. Um, so at this point in time, I feel like uh, I am not going to vote in favor of bylaw 11. I guess I'll wait for the closing arguments, but I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to, I'm listening to my heart and my logic and I'm just not quite there yet. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. Hey, um, we've, we've been here since, since 9 a.m. It's 7.30 at night. And we've heard a lot of people expressing expressing total opposition to the project. And I don't think I've really heard much of a suggestion from anybody in opposition about what should be there except the status quo. And uh, I kind of agree with Councillor Broadhead that, you know, times change and things change. And that's why there's a process to make an application to amend these bylaws because things change. And sometimes these plans are in effect over 30 years. So you can imagine what the difference was 30 years ago as compared to today in transportation technology and all sorts of things. And, and it's a bit of a shame to me that after all of this time that the residents couldn't come together with the developer and vice versa to come with some kind of a proposal that uh, everybody agreed upon. And um, I would really, it's kind of regrettable to me that we don't know the people's opinion on the reduction in the height of the story uh, to 79 meters. And we don't know their opinion on the reduction in the height uh, 
of the rest of the site to 25 meters, which is what the height is approved there now. And so um, we're kind of saying no based on um, not knowing what the people would say about the revised one. Now, I, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people who are still going to be against it, but there may be some people who may change their mind for it. So I'm kind of, I'm really struggling with this. And, you know, we have a lot of people come here. We said people say there's the, the petition is valid, the petition isn't valid. We've had people come here who write articles in the Gazette and say the Gazette's petition isn't valid. So where do we really sit on all this stuff? It's, it's rather, rather confusing to me. And I'm like Councillor Rudhead. Uh, we have a lot of residents who come and say we want to find ways to lower taxes. And then we find that this is a way to lower taxes here and that the cost, because all the internal servicing and roadways and everything are all done by the owners, there's not the same cost as developing 40 acres of, or four hectares of single family residential uh, to the city. It's more of a net gain to us. So uh, those same people who are who, who don't want their taxes to increase, you're going to have to accept your taxes the way they are in some cases, because this would be an opportunity if it was built out to help lower taxes to the general residents overall. But I'm fine with that. If the people uh, don't want this project here, I guess I was elected to do what the people want to say, and I'm, I'm kind of leaning that way. But the last thought on that is that, as uh, somebody else said, there's 67,000 people in St. Albert. And those are my comments. Thank you. I'll take an opportunity to jump in now because I, um, I don't even know if there will be an, another motion on the floor to debate. So I'm going to take my time to say some, my comments. So um, I, I, I consider myself a very decisive person. Generally, when I have these decisions in front of me, I, I know early on which way I'm, I'm, I'm leaning. Uh, but I got to say, um, driving, I got up really early this morning, I couldn't sleep. I, I, and I have a feeling many of us were not sleeping because this has been probably one of the hardest decisions I've, I've had in my 10 years on council. When, um, so I got up early and, you know, full disclosure, I live in Oakmont and most people know that. And I was in my slippers and I was standing on the road because um, it was a beautiful sun um, rise this morning and I was taking pictures of the pink sky. And that's to, to the, east of me, but then I, know I turned around and looked to the west and I actually thought, what would it look like if there was two towers there? Because I'd be able to see them from my house. I don't think I'd be in the shadows, but I'd be able to see them. Um, and then I went and, and, and I was driving in early this morning and I was driving down Bellrose Road and still really undecided. And, and so as I was sitting here for the last hour, many hours, I actually had these pieces of paper here and I'm like, if I vote in favor, what will I say? Because I honestly didn't know. And if I vote oppose, what will I say? So um, here's my comments for in favor. Um, and these are in no particular order because the first one I have is this huge financial benefit to the city. And I don't think this should be the most important one, but it was just the first that I wrote down. Um, so years ago, I read a study about how residential, commercial, and industrial development um, affects municipal dollars. So for every tax dollar we collect, what are we spending to support that kind of um, development? And for every tax dollar you, you collect on residential, it's always a net loss to, um, to the services you have to provide, which is why many municipalities really want to have non-res um, development because it, you, you have a net gain on that side. But when you get to these kind of densities, um, the servicing costs are much less. And this, so this, as it was demonstrated earlier, the, the net gain is, is very positive to the city and um, you know, could potentially lower our taxes. One of my other things um, in favor was, there was some comments made about, we need to, um, we need to listen to the residents of today. And, and while I agree with that, I also um, have to think of the residents of the future. And when, uh, you know, as I was reading some of the the emailed submissions, there were quite a few from from the botanica phases one and two, some in favor and some against. But what struck me, um, and Councillor Broadhead will remember, is we had a public hearing with people opposed to botanica two, but that council of the day um, made the decision, and now the people living in those buildings are the beneficiaries of that decision. And and so to hear opposition to this is just opposition to those future residents. So I, I really want to say that my decision will be about future residents as well as current residents. Um, my 
one of the reasons I like this development is that piece of land cannot and will not be a, a park. I mean, we did hear a few emails saying, um, just leave it as it is, it's beautiful, it's a park. But it, you know, somebody made some significant um, investment in that and there will be something built there. And so, so it won't be a park, but what I don't wanna see is single family homes. And so that's why the mixed use designation and a little bit higher density was very attractive to me. I don't wanna see more single family homes there. So, because you know, I just think we can do better. Um, and it, it, that goes to some of the comments that as we grow, we need to change in the single family homes of, of yesterday in St. Albert still exist, but we need to look for opportunities to do something a little bit um, different and appeal to um, a generation that might not want the single family home with the big backyard. Uh, I um, have been very vocal that I'm opposed to urban sprawl and uh, and I will continue that and because my biggest learnings um, through the EMRB growth plan development was um, how valuable um, the farmland around St. Albert is and we don't want to um, destroy that farmland. It could be uh, one of our greatest natural resources for Alberta and Canada in the future as, as a global population grows and we become one of the few countries in the world that has the capacity to grow and export food. Um, and, I, and I do believe that we can grow and mature and, and evolve, as Councillor Bratta was talking, while still allowing us to maintain a small town feel and protect the environment and preserve our botanical brand. I do believe that that possibility is out there. So again, I, that was kind of an in favor comment. And uh, I do know there's many in favor. So we did only have um, two verbals and I think the three uh, videos that were in favor, but you know, I've watched the online chatter on Facebook. I looked at the, the St. Albert Gazette put their story on and, and the comments underneath were very, very many of them were in favor. We've had a lot of emails that were in favor. Um, I don't remember how many were in our package, but even in January when this when this all started before the public hearing date was set, there was a lot of, of people in favor. And I, so I know that sentiment across St. Albert exists. Um, and I also know that the region is watching. You know, I've talked to uh, colleagues across the, the, the region and they uh, think this is a great proposal. And we're so lucky to have this in, and have this kind of interest from um, a landowner to, to make this kind of significant investment in St. Albert and they wish it would come to their municipality. So, you know, I, I have to listen to that too. But then I get to my comments um, that are opposed and they, they tend to outnumber. So while I was driving to work this morning, I was coming down Belrose and, you know, you all know I have a convertible and it's, it's, a, it's a wonder in St. Albert, whether you're coming down Belrose or whether you're coming into St. Albert on St. Albert Trail that you, just, you, you don't see rooftops, you see treetops. We have that to be proud of. And so that view is something that I, I really feel needs to be preserved as much as possible. Now in saying that, I did support the Amicon Towers, but as many of the public spoke today, and um, I, I can say now, I believe that that kind of development belongs in a downtown area. So, you know, they will take away from that treetop, but, um, that goes to the evolving um, community that we are. So it's a give and take. I really do worry about construction parking. I know there's a plan in place, uh, but after so many years of, of phase one and phase two and no resolution until this council was elected and, and we made those parking changes that um, I, I still you know, worry that there will be the odd um, construction parking in, in the residential neighborhoods. When it comes to traffic, I, I, I'm, ha I'm not quite satisfied that these intersection improvements will be enough. You know, and Mr. Schick stated that no matter what, it will be um, at a reduced service level. And, you know, he was talking about the AM peak was from six till eight. Well, as a mother dri driving my kids to Kinoshio school, I know those school buses are at 8.30 and there's a bus stop right across the street from uh, the shops of Boudreaux just coming out of the Ever Evergreens, did I get that right? Anyway, um, and those yellow buses then had to cut over three lanes of traffic to get into the left-hand turn lane to go to Kinoshio or Neil and Ross School. So um, the, the traffic, 
I'm, I don't know if any um, intersection improvements could accommodate this much. So the other thing I had talked about is this council, when we first uh, were elected, made some changes to the land use bylaw. And that was because we needed to bring in the missing middle um, housing type uh, into St. Albert to help us increase the density. We are under um, density targets by the Edmonton Region Growth Plan. And without those land use bylaw changes, we were faced with single family homes beside high rises. And I know we all remember this conversation about how we needed to have transition. And so this missing middle would provide that transition. And so this proposal um, is high rises right beside low density residential. And, and, and that was what we were trying to avoid. There is no, there's no transition. Um, so as I said, I think mixed use is appropriate, but the but these heights are not, and I think they're just too drastic. Uh, I did hear some co some comments over the past, and I just want to say, I heard lots of comments that this was a done deal. Uh, we we had emails that said councils already made up their mind. This is a done deal. Um, this is this was never a done deal. This went through the process that was prescribed by the provincial government to be in front of us. And I can honestly say that the seven members of this council have not discussed this ever. Um, I, I would have had no clue walking into this public hearing today, which way any one of you were leaning. Um, so, you know, I'm proud of the work that this council has done on this. I think we followed um, the procedures to the letter and, um, and, and came in here with an open mind. There was a comment that public hearings are always dominated by the vocal minority, and this this is very very true. I, I, from ten years, I, I, I shouldn't say minority. The negatives outweigh the positives generally on a public hearing, so I always listen to it, um, kind of with that in mind. But the fact that there were so few who took the time to register to speak in favor today spoke volumes to me. Um, this council has, has been very open to development. We, we did a, an, a project on Sturgeon Road shortly after we were elected. That was a, was a hard decision. Um, we proved that. We have just made some changes to Midtown. I would not, I would worry that um, if we were always turning these kind of proposals down, I would worry that we would get a reputation as not pro-development, but I don't, I don't think that exists anymore. I think we've been very open to um, proposals. And I honestly don't believe this is, an, is, this is a NIMBY uh, conversation. The, the comments that I heard today were not just, I don't want this in my backyard. The comments today were legitimate concerns that I, I happen to, to agree with many of them. So, um, you know, somebody mentioned skyline bylaws in other municipalities. Well, they bring in skyline bylaws for a reason, and that is to, pr to preserve the skyline the way it is. We don't have one. Um, but they are for a reason. So I'm just going to finish with when we had the river, Riverside uh, area structure plan amendments about two months ago or so. My comments were that once stat statutory plans should not be changed once development in that area begins, um, with at least not without the support of area residents. And this is um, an area that people have invested money in, they did their research, they see that there's supposed to be low, des low density in the area. And so I'm, I'm not gonna be able to support this today. I, I do wanna say that I would like to see a subsequent proposal that has some sort of mixed use. The Shops of Bujol combined with the Botanica development has been hugely popular and very much supported by um, St. Albert. So something more along like those lines, I think would be more palatable. And Councillor Watkins said a great comment about let's work with the community to find the right development that fits. So Councillor Jolly, uh, your closing comments. Thank you. You guys did a terrible job of convincing me to vote for this. <laughs> um, you know, I was at uh, the shops of Boudreaux earlier this week. Um, I shop there all the time and uh, it was a sunny day and it was, you know, Right now it probably shouldn't be packed with people, but all the outdoor spaces were full of families, you know, having their coffees, having their ice creams. Um, a lot of people had biked there, their bikes were parked there. It, you know, that type of development is, is um, wonderful in terms of community and building community. 
Um, and I would echo what um, Councillor Broadhead said about um, the fact that we are changing. We are not the community that you know I grew up in in, in the 80s. And, um, and I'm excited for some of the, the vibrant changes that we've seen in St. Albert. And, and even when I was running, people would ask me, well, why did you run? It's, well, I want to help develop the city that my kids are going to raise my grandkids in. Um, so certainly I, I am forward thinking um, for this kind of thing. Um, and, and like Councillor Hansen, um, I would also like to see, you know, and Mayor Heron, I would like to see development in this area, but the right development. And this is just not the right location for this, um, this kind of change. Um, to the developers, this is a beautiful concept. Um, if it was right next to a transit hub, uh, I, I would be so excited about this kind of proposal to have the kinds of mixed mix uses that, that you're proposing. Um, so um, I, I'm glad we had this discussion and um, I, I would echo what Mayor Heron said, I, I did not know how this vote was going to go at all beforehand. Um, so it's it's been valuable to have this conversation to get an idea of, of the what we see for this site. And that's all I have, thank you. All right, thank you everyone for your comments. Um, I'm gonna call for the vote. Those in favor? Sorry, Councillor Hughes, you put your hand up. <laughs> I'm just scratching. Those opposed, do the count. That is unanimously defeated. So we cannot go on to uh, bylaw 12 or 13 um, without the area structure plan amendments approved. So Mr. Scoble, I think we're done for the night. Do you have anything else to add to this? No, I, I, I think we're done. Okay. Council, this has been an 11 hour public hearing. I think you guys all did um, a fabulous job. Great questions, um, great debate, uh, and uh, I appreciate your time tonight. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Normally I would just declare, but let's have a motion. Councillor Broadhead. All those in favor, we are adjourned. Can you log me off? My I, my leave button is gone. <laughs>